Anduin is the central character in WoW, having previously been the Prince of Stormwind and now the King, although he appears to be taking a break after the events of Shadowlands. In the game, Anduin is named after the famous hero, Anduin Lothar. In reality, the name Anduin was likely lifted directly from Lord of the Rings. That's not to accuse Metzen of being unoriginal, since it is nearly impossible to avoid such a monolithic influence on all the fantasy genre, and it makes sense as a fitting tribute, since so much of WoW has been influenced by Lord of the Rings. But that's an entirely different video. In Middle-earth, the continent Lord of the Rings takes place on, one of the biggest and largest rivers is named Anduin. The main characters even take canoes down the river for a while, as Frodo goes on his journey to destroy the One Ring and Mount Doom and defeat Sauron. While this is a vast oversimplification, it is important to know that many, many places and characters in WoW have been directly influenced by Lord of the Rings, and that you'll see a lot of Lord of the Rings come up in several other different names in this video. Tolkien invented numerous languages for his epic fantasy world. One of them is Sindarian, which was one of the languages of the elves. Anduin is Sindarian for Great River, but it literally translates as a long river. Naming a character in WoW after River is a bit odd, so let's delve a little deeper into how this influences Anduin the character. Well, if we look at the name thematically, we can draw several conclusions. The biggest realization is that Anduin is a key character in the Warcraft narrative, just as the Anduin River is a key feature of the geography of Middle-earth. Thus, Anduin the character can be seen as the main plot and, quite literally, a big part of the flow of the story. Just as the Anduin River goes through many different kingdoms, lands, and geography, so does Anduin the king. Both are major influences upon things that surround them and shape the landscape of both the land and story. And wow, Anduin has helped other characters develop, whether directly or indirectly. Some of these characters include his father, Varian, of course, Bolvar, Velen, Gen, and most recently, Sylvanas. Another key feature along the Anduin River is two large sculptures of some of the early kings of Gondor, named the Argonath. The Anduin River itself flows near the capital city of the Kingdom of Gondor in the city of Minas Tirith where the throne of the king is. This further ties the connotations of both Anduins to one of regality and kingliness. Just as the Anduin River grows ever larger and stronger as it flows south, so too does Anduin grow stronger as a character and as a person in WoW as the meta story unfolds. There's a lot more to discuss here and we've only just touched the surface, but this is a video, not a literature class, so let's move on to some other words. Our second word is Argus. In World of Warcraft, Argus was the planet and original home of the Drenai until it was taken over by Sargeras and his Burning Legion. Players visited Argus and Legion during Patch 7.3, appropriately named Shadows of Argus. There are three reasons behind the name of this planet, all of which trace their origins from ancient Greece. Argus probably takes its name from Greek mythology, in which Argus was a giant with 100 eyes. This ties thematically to the Burning Legion, as the Legion and Sargeras are always on the lookout to capture and enslave more worlds. Kil'jaeden especially was always on vigil for getting back at Velen, in addition, Sargeras himself was enamored with Azeroth's world soul, and was constantly on the lookout trying to find a way to invade and capture the planet. The notion of an infinite army which can see all directions also makes sense when compared to Argus's hundred eyes, as the Burning Legion, quite literally, had eyes almost everywhere in the universe. Argus was also by some accounts the shipwright of the vessel Argos, which bore a slightly altered version of her name. Argos was the ship that Jason and the Argonauts set sail on to capture the Golden Fleece. Both Arguses, in this sense, can be seen as symbols of exploration and adventure into the unknown. The Burning Legion was always searching for new worlds and places in the Twisted Nether, and Argus was its command post, just as Argus the Sailor was the center of the expedition while Jason and the Argonauts were on their epic quests. Finally, Argos is an ancient city in Greece, and one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. This fits neatly into the idea of the Eridar being a very old and sage race of people. The third word on this list today is Azeroth. Azeroth is the main world most of Warcraft takes place in, and is, for all intents and purposes, the actual world of Warcraft. The most prominent work of fiction the name Azeroth appears in is from the 1979 science fiction novel called Fires of Azeroth by C.J. Cherry. This novel also involves portals between worlds, a corrupted person opening a portal to allow an invasion of a world to happen, and various political factions squabbling amongst themselves uniting against a larger existential threat. As such, it seems to have been a large influence on WoW's lore and story, but we can really only speculate based on what little information we have. In fact, there's even an achievement that shares the same name. The Fires of Azeroth achievement is awarded when players pay their respects at their faction's bonfires during the Burning Blossom Festival across the Cataclysm, Eastern Kingdoms, Kalimdor, Northrun, Outland, and Pandera zones. A very similar word named Azeroth is also the name of a minor goddess from C.S. Lewis's Hepatology, The Chronicles of Narnia. This goddess is briefly mentioned in the book, The Horse and His Boy and it's described as being a god of the Kaelerman Empire and part of the religion. Azaroth might be inspired by a Phoenician goddess known as Astarte, which, in turn, is probably a variant of the older Mesopotamian Ishtar. Azaroth's worship likely competed with early Judaism, and is the origin of several Abrahamic demons like Astareth. The next name is Azara. 
In WoW, Ajar is the queen of the Naga and used to be the queen of the Highborn. She and the Night Elves were turned into Naga by the old god Nazoth shortly after the Sundering. While there is no literal transcription of her name, three deities in particular from ancient Middle East and South Asia do resemble some of the aspects of Ajara. First, Ajara's name bears a striking similarity to the real world goddess named Asherah. Asherah was an ancient Semitic goddess that also appeared in the Sumar and Canaanite religions. In almost all of her iterations, she is one of the highest ranking gods and is the consort of the chief deity. This means she is roughly comparable to Hera of the Greek mythology. Second, another goddess which might also have an influence on Ajara's name is Ishara. Although this goddess is probably closer related to Ishtar, another ancient Sumerian goddess. However, she also shares similar traits with Ajara in that she is a powerful female associated with beauty and adoration. The final deity is technically a semi-deity named Asvatara from Hinduism and Buddhism. Asvatara is a Naga king in most traditions, and the Nagas of World of Warcraft take their name from the semi-divine Naga serpent people of South Asian mythologies. This link is further reinforced by the fact that there are several Ajara statues found throughout Azeroth, all of which look similar to statues of South Asian religions, which have multiple arms that are in circles around the deity. Now let's move on and talk about an old god. We've chosen Cthulhu for our first old god name, since it was the first old god introduced in World of Warcraft, all the way back in vanilla. Most old gods are heavily inspired by some of the elder horrors created by H.P. Lovecraft, and the name Cthulhu is no exception to this pattern. Cthulhu is likely an adaptation of the name Cthulhu. In Lovecraft mythos, Cthulhu is an eldritch being who lies in a death-like slumber beneath the Pacific Ocean in his sunken city of Relay. Both the names of Cthulhu and Cthulhu seem to be inspired by the Greek word for Cthonic. In Greek, Cthonic is a descriptive word for things related to the underworld. It can be used in the context of Cthonic gods, Cthonic rituals, Cthonic cults, and more. The idea of an evil subterranean god or being is very old, and can be traced back going thousands of years to Proto-Indo-European mythologies. Cthulhu's large eye is also somewhat reminiscent of the Eye of Sauron from The Lord of the Rings. The player even loots an item called the Eye of Cthulhu the first time they kill the old god. Several other comparisons Lord of the Rings should be mentioned, such as how the ancient men in Middle-earth erected towers to watch over Mordor should Sauron ever return, and how these defenses eventually failed. This can be seen as similar to the old gods breaking free of their prisons in WoW after the Titan Keepers had jailed them for so long. Additionally, both Cthulhu and Eye of Sauron are located in hard-to-get-to inhospitable deserts. The next word we'll be exploring is Draenor. In WoW's in-game lore, the word Draenor means Exile's Refuge in the Draenei language. The word Draenei itself means Exiled Ones in Draenei. This refers to Draenei led by Velen who left Argus after the Burning Legion invaded. The word Dran itself means Exile in Draenei. As far as entomology from World War languages go, in the two Celtic languages of Breton and Welsh, the word Dran means Thorn. The Draenei and Velen certainly were a thorn in the side for killed Jaden, Sargeras, and the Burning Legion. Additionally, the word thorn can be used more figuratively to mean a snag, hitch, or problem. There's not much else to say about the word Draenor, so here are two fun facts. First, if you ever wondered if the word Draenor or Draenei came first, it was Draenei. Second, the direct translation of Draenor as Exile's Refuge is quite similar to the starting zone added in Battle for Azeroth, which is called Exile's Reach. Whether these names are made similar intentionally or not is not known. Our next word is Kalimdor, which in game currently refers to the westernmost known continent of Azeroth. However, before the Sundering, Kalimdor was used to refer to the all-in-one main continent before the Sundering. In WoW's lore, Kalimdor means land of eternal starlight in both languages of the Titan and Darnassian. How and why Titans and our Titan Watchers decided to name the original continent Kalimdor is still not known. In the real world, Kalim means passage in Albanian, but this is probably more of a coincidence in the entomology for the name. The next name in our video is Lordaeron. The name Lordaeron has held several different meanings over the years in WoW, and we'll do our best to explain them all. First, however, is the in-game entomology for the name. Lordaeron is named after the renowned human general named Lordaeron. Lordaeron was one of the first warriors in the game's lore and served as a trusted general to the first human king, Thoradin, and Thoradin considered him a brother. Thoradin founded the kingdom of Arthor and built the city of Strom. Another trusted general of King Thorin was Igneus Trollbane, who was the ancestor of Danath Trollbane. The last known descendant of Lordaeron was Anduin Lothar. King Thoradin can be seen in the Legion Arms Warrior campaign to obtain the artifact Stromkar, which was Thoradin's weapon. General Lordain sacrificed himself in the Troll Wars. To honor him, many soldiers named their homeland Lordaeron after him. The name was later cemented when nobles from Strom fled north during the fracturing of Arathar and founded the city of Lordaeron. In the game currently, Lordaeron can refer to the ruined city, the land surrounding the city, Lordaeron Lake, and the Kingdom of Lordaeron, which spreads across most of the north and eastern kingdoms, including Tearsfall, the modern name Plaguelands, and Silverpine. The Kingdom of Lordaeron survived the first two wars, only to fall to Arthas and the Scourge in the Warcraft III Reign of Chaos. This is just a brief account of this part of WoW's lore. And needless to say, there's much more to the story and the lore here to discover that we don't have time to talk about in this video. Next we move on to the name of the character, Sylvanas. The name Sylvanas appears to be unique in Warcraft lore. Sylvanas is not named after any historical figures in our real world, 
However, Sylvanus means something close to forest in Latin. Sylvanus is also the name of a Roman god, and we'll talk more about him in a bit. The name Sylvanus fits very thematically with the former ranger general, Silvermoon. The ranger generals are at home in the forest and are very familiar with the land. Sylvanus' master of the woods and guerrilla tactics allowed her to make quick work of her enemies. Through this manner, Sylvanus was able to inflict large losses upon the Scourge when Arthas invaded Quel'Thas in the Third War. This is a large reason as to why Arthas hated her so much and turned her into a banshee out of spite. The Roman god Sylvanus was the god of forests and boundaries. His name from Latin literally translates as of the woods. In addition to the forest imagery, the boundary aspect of the god Sylvanus is also quite symbolic because Sylvanus quite literally helped defend the boundaries of Quel'Thalas. The magical rune stones at the borders of Quel'Thalas also suggested another connection here, since Sylvanus the god was also the god of field stones and markers. This was also proven again when Sylvanus broke the boundary between Azeroth and the Shadowlands. Regardless of Sylvanus' recent character development and recent expansions, the notion of quite literally not being able to see the forest or the trees does fit quite nicely with the several themes of Sylvanus as a character. Our final word from this video is Torrent. A lot of fantasy words in WoW come from Latin, and using Latin to build words is somewhat of a cliché in fantasy. The name Torrent is no exception to this fantasy Latin language rule, as Tauras is Latin for bull. Despite such a simple etymology for a name, the Torin have an extremely rich and unique lore and culture within the game. Physically, the Torin themselves are based on the Minotaur of ancient Greek mythology, but have a culture more similar to that of the various tribes of Native Americans. One of WoW's many strengths is that it has the ability to incorporate many different source materials, yet weave them into a very familiar fantasy story. Some people also like to point out that Torin is an anagram of nature, meaning you can rearrange the letters and get both words. Whether or not this was intended since early in WoW's development remains unknown, but Torin do seem to have a deeper connection to shamanism and druidism than many of the other races on Azeroth. During the first few weeks of Cataclysm, when they added the new fishing dailies for the brand new Orgrimmar, there was a small little bug associated to one of the items, which might possibly be one of the strongest items that has ever existed in the game's history. But not for the reasons you might think. The quest was called a Golden Opportunity, which is still in the game to this day, although of course the bug has been long since fixed. And basically, all you do for the quest is take a fillet knife and use it on one of the drowned lizards in the newly flooded Duratar in order to collect a drowned thunder lizard tail, which you would then use in order to collect some fish. As the drowned thunder lizard tail, on a 10 second cooldown, would let out a little electrical blast that would instantly kill all the nearby fish, which was necessary for completing the quest. Once you turned in the quest, the drowned lizard tail would not actually delete itself from your inventory because the quest item you received was the fillet knife, and the thunder lizard tail was something you got during the quest, making it not a gifted quest item. So, you basically got to keep the item, and it could be used anywhere in the world, not just the quest location. A simple little item which just put out a little thunder effect, but didn't actually do any damage. So, where is the harm in that? Well, it wasn't on the global cooldown. So you could technically just macro the item into one of your abilities in order to have a cool little thunder effect on your character every 10 seconds. However, there was a little bit of an exploit with this item. Well, in addition to the bug where it didn't delete itself from your inventory after you turned the quest. The item's exploit was that you could use the effect of the tail multiple times before it actually triggered its 10 second cooldown. And since it was off the global cooldown, what you could do was just macro the ability to use the item countless times before it triggered its 10 second cooldown. And every activation of the item would trigger the thunder special effect. So, if you took this item into the middle of Orgrimmar, and then used it hundreds of times a second, it would completely crash everyone's frames per second. And sometimes would even cause people's clients to crash as well. And since this item could be used anywhere in the world, some people actually took this into battlegrounds in order to lag out and disconnect the enemy team for easy wins. Because the player using it could purposefully set their in-game settings to the lowest possible ahead of time in order to avoid the effect, while the enemy players running their games at the highest settings they could would not be prepared for the CPU load that was about to hit them. And since this happened in 2010, the average computer at the time was not very good, so it was probably pretty easy to crash most people's clients with the item. After a couple of weeks, Blizzard eventually fixed the item to no longer trigger multiple times throughout a single macro, and also no longer be usable outside of Durotar and for good reasons too, as it's kind of the best crowd control item they've ever put in the game, and hence one of the strongest items they've ever added, as you can completely win any PvP encounter by just crashing your opponent's computer, or at the very least dropping their frames per second to one so they couldn't do anything. And now for some lost information about Vanilla WoW that weren't really major problems during Classic WoW. 
During Vanilla WoW, there was a very common bug involving the rogue skill called Vanish. Vanish is an ability that allows a rogue to stealth in combat, while giving them a little buff that makes it so they can't be de-stealthed due to certain abilities happening within a short window of usually less than 3 seconds. This would give the rogue some leeway to actually stay invisible if some kind of spell was mid-travel when they actually vanished. That way it wouldn't break immediately once it finally landed. But there was a bug, where sometimes Vanish would break randomly before the little 3 second window was over, and people for the longest time weren't sure why. But then, in preparation for Classic WoW, one of the original Vanilla WoW developers was asked about this bug, and basically what it was, was every single ability in the game needed to have an extra switch turned on that basically just said, don't break Vanish. And since this had to be manually turned on for every single ability in the game, some of the abilities just didn't have it because they forgot, or missed it. Or sometimes the flag would get turned off because of certain interactions between spell types, and it was as simple as that. Some abilities just wouldn't be flagged for not breaking Vanish, and some interactions would make it so that the flag never turned on. Even in 2019 Classic WoW, Vanish was bugged for a while, where it just would not turn on against certain bosses or occasionally in PvP. And they basically had to fix this bug for a second time. Or I guess the fix is kind of putting it lightly. Vanish still bugs out sometimes even in current WoW, but not as frequently as it used to. The ability to just instantly drop combat and then stay in a state, which is supposed to break on any form of damage, is just kind of ripe for all kinds of problems. Located in the Tanan jungle in Draenor is an NPC named Fel Rangari Anara. If you kill this NPC, she'll drop an item called the Vial of Fel Cleansing, which is necessary in order to tame one of the Fel Wolves in the area. And you only get one vial per kill, which allows you to tame one pet basically each time you use it. Now, what was interesting about this NPC back in Warlords of Draenor was that she was only attackable by hunters, that she would despawn if anyone else tried to pull her and she was actually a pretty difficult encounter that required you to use all of your hunter abilities. Periodically throughout the fight, she would put your pet to sleep, and you'd have to use Master's Call in order to wake it up. She would put a super buff on herself that you would need to tranquilize and shot in order to dispel. And she would occasionally go invisible where you had to use your flare in order to reveal her. Plus, she had a heal that she would cast at low health, which would put her all the way back to full health, which you simply had to interrupt, while dodging all of her AoE abilities that she was constantly putting out. It was an actual challenging encounter for hunters, very reminiscent of the hunter quest chain in Vanilla WoW for Rock Del R, which also comprised of very difficult solo challenges for hunters in order to obtain a powerful weapon. And it was also similar to a lot of the other challenge tames that was added in various other expansions, like the spirit beast tames of Cataclysm, or rare pets for the Magma Tortoise, or all the lava beasts in the Molten Front, or even the Mechano Spiders and Dogs from Alcatraz. And of course, if you go to this NPC today on a max level character, you can just kind of one-shot her pretty easily, so you don't really need to know her tactics anymore. Located in the Dalaran sewers of both versions of Dalaran is a sewer shark named Sega CD. This NPC is an obvious reference to the game station known as the Sega CD, because there was a game for that system called Sewer Shark. Sewer Shark was one of the more popular games in that system, and was one of the first ones to be released with it, and it was such a hit that they eventually ended up building the Sewer Shark game along with future Sega CD releases. So it makes sense why an NPC located in the sewers would be named Sega CD, since the game was so synonymous with the system. The game itself doesn't really have much to do with sharks, it is actually a railgun shooter game, so that's about where the references end. Not many know this NPC is just a reference or an easter egg. However, it is actually used in The Purge of Dalaran, where a high elf mage is holding one of the Sun Reaver citizens above the Sega CD shark, and then drops a citizen to the sharks when you engage the elf to try to stop him, which indicates that this shark is definitely a canon part of Dalaran, and actually is involved in the story of the world, which is pretty rare for a lot of these reference NPCs. And now for some information about the earliest versions of the game. In Vanilla WoW, they had a couple of class weapon quests, more famously the ones for priests and hunters that had them go out in the world and complete very difficult solo challenges in order to reward with a pretty decent weapon tailored specifically for their class. It was such a popular feature that they basically used this mechanic for all of the artifact weapons in the Legion expansion, and it was definitely a very loved part of the expansion. Although players always found it funny that they kind of stopped doing it after only a couple of classes, and in an interview with a WoW dev who worked on the game during Vanilla WoW in preparation for Classic WoW, they were asked about the class quests, 
and why there weren't more of them. And basically, what it boiled down to was they just took too much time to create. And after they did the first couple, they kind of stopped so that they could start working on the Burning Crusade, and be able to ship it in a timely manner. Although they did have plans to do more of them, they specifically cut the rest of them so that they could work on the Burning Crusade, and not because they thought they were an unpopular feature or anything. They just simply took too much time to make for how few people actually got to do them. Like how all classes were going to have race-specific abilities like Priest did, that was also cut for similar reasons. So they just weren't a huge priority, and were one of the first of many things that were cut in order to allocate resources to something more important. Telebim is an island which has basically been on the world map since the very beginning. However, most of its life in Warcraft has been as an unknown labeled island on the world map, and we've never actually been to the place, with there only being a few references to it in-game. The first reference is the Telebim Banana, which is a very common item sold by vendors which is just a low-level food item that basically exists as a way to feed fruit to your pet, back when that used to mean something for hunters. Now it's just kind of a useless food item that you can buy if you want a low-level food. And there's also a series of three damp diary pages that you can fish up in the open world if you're fishing in Azeroth. They depict the days 4, 87, and 512 of a person who was stranded on an island full of bananas. Diary, day 4. I have been stranded on this island now for four days, left alone with my thoughts. Bananas are pretty tasty, but what a long climb to reach them. When I'm not getting food or protecting myself from the periodic rain, all my thoughts are on rescue. I would not be so hopeful if it were not for the boxes of paper and bottles that washed up ashore with me. I laugh now to think of all the time I spent on that ship, cursing that I was stuck with a boatload of alchemists and scribes. The next entry is available for day 87, where it clearly depicts the writer of the diary is going mad, as he starts talking about how the bananas are after him, and how one screamed as he started eating it. Then on day 512, he talks about how the bananas have started talking to him, and he's stopped eating them, and that the banana civilization is actually quite a great one, and he feels sorry about destroying them in his early days. And then he goes on to note that he's finally running out of paper, so his diary will probably be ending soon. Now, we never actually figure out who the sender of these messages are, or even where they washed up from, but one can assume, based on his constant talking of bananas, and the very common Telebim banana in-game, he was probably stranded on the island of Telebim, which, in the upcoming Telebim Glory of the Banana King expansion, we might find a guy who's crazy and just washed up there. Although, joke aside, if we ever get the island, it will likely be as an easter egg, with maybe an island and banana trees that give you a being watched debuff, with a skeleton surrounded by bananas that could signify the author of the damn diary pages. Did you know that the undead were originally supposed to look more human-like? In an interview with the Vanilla WoW developer, they talk about how the undead were originally planned to basically decay over time. They were supposed to start off looking human, and then slowly as they progressed through the starting zone, they would lose their flesh, culminating at the end of the starting zone where the Forsaken would look like the ones we have today. But the reason they abandoned this feature was because they just did not have the tech to pull it off at the time. And also, the undead areas were the last ones to be added to the original game, so they definitely did not have time to flesh out the zone where they were really like their ambitious pre-planning stages. Although it would have been a neat feature to have lore-wise, to see the undead slowly decay as you come to terms with your character's new existence. And they kind of pulled this off with the Worgen starting zone, where you start off as a human and then slowly turn into a Worgen. Although the Worgen have the ability to swap between their human form anyway, and they already have human models in the game, so that one was a no-brainer to add to their starting zone. And also, did you know, if you leave the Worgen starting zone before you get bit by a Worgen, you just automatically learn how to turn into a Worgen once you enter combat for the first time. It used to be you could stay in human form forever if you managed to escape, but they fixed that after a couple of expansions. Located in the Death Knight starting zone are a series of skeleton NPCs known as the Scourge Sky Darkeners, whose only job is to rain arrows upon the nearby town the Death Knight are attacking. One of the skeletons will offer you a quest called Tonight We Dine in Havenshire, which has you go around the town in order to collect some of the Serenite arrows that they've been raining down because they're only found in Northrend and they're in limited supply. Now, this quest, as well as the NPCs, are all obvious references to the movie 300, as one of the lines in the movies is, Spartans, ready your breakfast and eat hearty, for tonight we dine in hell. And also, there's a scene in the movie where the Persian army threatens the Spartans by saying they have so many soldiers on their side their arrows will blot out the sun. 
to which they reply that they'll just fight in the shade then, hence the name of the Sky Darkeners of the Bowman Skeleton, which is just further reinforced by the name of the quest that they provide. In Alpha WoW, before they had talent trees which went live in the classic version of the game, all players had this talent point interface, which would allow you to spend your talent points in order to increase the power level of your character. Like if you wanted to increase the damage with two-handed axes specifically, you could spend 10 talent points to increase it by 1. If you wanted some fire resistance, you could spend 10 talent points to increase it by 4, increasing it as you bought more of the ranks. This system is also where you would get your professions, so you'd have to choose to give up player power in order to be able to craft items and consumables. Eventually, this system was scrapped, and then players were given the talent trees in beta, which stayed in the game all the way until Mist of Pandaria. Although this little window of purchasing specific skills wasn't entirely abandoned either, as the hunter class had a very similar window in order to train their pets. Whereas when your pet would level up, they would gain loyalty points, which you would then use to purchase their basic attacks, cooldowns, and all of their extra stats, like granting extra armor, health, and very specific resistances. So you could choose to give your pet a lot of fire resistance and have no frost resistance at all, for example. And the original pet training panel was incredibly unintuitive and would show you skills that you couldn't actually train your active pet and didn't have a way to sort the abilities at all. So just kind of a mess that was abandoned in Wrath of the Lich King. So they did kind of keep the old talent point system. It was just stripped of its previous functionalities and only applied to hunter pets. Located in Area 52, during the second to last quest of the quest chain provided by Dr. Vomisa PhD, is a quest known as You Robot, which has you test drive a robot against another one named Negatron. Now, during the quest chain, you've basically been helping this guy test drive his robots and gathering parts for him. So, during this final test drive of the robot, you're supposed to fight against a Fell Reaver who is an obvious reference to Megatron, the big bad evil guy of the Transformer series, which is a cartoon and movie franchise about robots that can transform into different things. During the Burning Crusade, this was a pretty difficult quest to solo, and was supposed to be helped along by the robot that was provided by you, which could be accidentally dismissed if you summoned another temporary pet as part of your class. Now, the enemy bad guy Negatron also has some dialogues which are very reminiscent of his Saturday morning cartoon villain status that it's based on, where he'll say things like, Ha ha ha, your feeble rocket is destroyed. I'll return later to finish off the rest of your puny town, but he says this in all caps, of course. And the quest it's associated to? is itself a reference to the short story and full-length movie, I, Robot, which doesn't really have anything to do with this quest or Transformers, other than the fact that they both have robots in them. In the game files, and even some of the promotional materials for early Vanilla WoW, there's a place known as the Dragon Isles, which was eventually cut from the game for a whole bunch of reasons. One of the biggest reasons that we found out, thanks to the WoW Diary book, is that the Dragon Isles didn't really make sense from a lore standpoint. In Warcraft lore, all of the dragons are good except for the black dragons, so they couldn't easily make a zone for adventurers to go into to kill stuff because there's so few variations of bad dragons, and there were already a couple of zones with black dragons in the game as enemies already. In fact, some of the developers asked Chris Metzen, the guy responsible for a lot of WoW's lore, to just let them make other colors of dragons' enemies. That way they could have more variation to their enemies, but he always just gave them a hard no, because that's not how his lore worked out. So every time you fight a dragon in-game that's not a black dragon, there's always some special reason they're an enemy, usually due to madness or mind control or something, and rarely because of something they did of their own volition. However, another reason the Dragon Isles was cut was because they were having a hard time just designing the place, and a lot of the neat, fancy ideas they had just didn't flow very well with character models that they were actually trying to put in them to test. And lastly, they found out they didn't actually need very many zones or dungeons, you see, what happened was they had planned for the Dragon Isles as well as the zones of Grim Patol, Tol Barad, and Karazhan to be in Vanilla WoW. And one of the things Vanilla WoW did that no other game did at the time was trying to navigate players through a zone by giving them breadcrumb quests that they could send them places. And during the Friends and Family Alpha, players really loved the quest and wanted more of them. So they added extra quests to have players do more things inside the zones rather than just send them to far reaches of the zone to explore and grind mindlessly. And as quoted by the WoW Diary book, the only way to keep players in an appropriate zone was by adding far more quests than originally planned. By creating so many quests, WoW had accidentally created compelling solo content, which arguably became the game's strongest ingredient for success with the broad market of casual players. Providing that much enjoyable solo content was never planned, budgeted, or even prioritized. It was stumbled upon. By trying to solve a navigation problem, we'd inadvertently engaged a larger audience, namely the solo players. 
So because of the game design of creating more quests to do in a zone, they didn't actually need to create as many zones as they thought they would. So they cut a couple of their planned zones so they could save them for later with Dragon Isles being the only one from that list that has still yet to make it to the game. And just for some context on how many quests Vanilla WoW had compared to its competitors, a single zone in World of Warcraft had more quests than the entire game of EverQuest. WoW has had many battlegrounds over the years. However, did you know there are three unused battlegrounds almost fully completed in the files? First off, we have Azhara's Crater. A battleground I'm sure some of you know of was originally planned for Vanilla WoW, and it was even given a location in Ajara, a large crater made into the map, with roads even put for Alliance and Horde to get there. But there was nothing ever done with this place. Also, sadly, as this map was removed, so we can't view it anymore, and its final complete state is not even visible in the map files, so we'll be using some footage from Haven Games for this section. The first real version of this map appears in 0.9 beta for WoW Vanilla, and appears to have some massive crater set in Ajara, with a Night Elva village and Orc town set within. On top of that, a couple of ruins, and that's about it. It was super basic, but quite large. Then comes 0.10, the map is completely changed, this version being three craters connected by gates between the cliffsides, with assumed a horde camp in the bottom left, and alliance camp in the north. This version is much more complete, although even then, the next update to the zone would come in patch 1.0. The alliance camp would be massively reverted, becoming far more basic, oddly enough, which will be followed up by the final version, a complete version that's map file has been all too hard to acquire, giving a full scale to the area, but has yet to be used. This zone is so complete, people have even been able to make a fan-made map of the area. The battleground is assumed to have worked in the same vein as Alteric Valley, with resources and capture points, pushing into your enemy's land and securing structures, although with only one faction camp each, it seems this may have been a bigger focus on capturing neutral objectives and gathering resources, to use to defeat your enemy, instead of them simply being buffs that you need to take out so you can defeat their enemy boss. This battleground is fully set up aesthetic-wise, so all the groundwork is done for Blizzard to finally give us this BG, although I guess the visuals are a bit outdated now. Next we have Defend of the Ale House, and this time a map files that are actually still in game. So this BG was added in patch 5.4.7, meaning at the end of Mist of Bandaria, and just sat untouched since. This map has a Horde and Alliance side, and the Horde a more autumn appearance and the Alliance a more spring. This map very much has a MOBA-like appearance, and may have been planned to be exactly that, as the name Defense of the Alehouse is a reference to the original MOBA Defense of the Ancients, and shares a lot of similarities. First off, with multiple lanes where NPCs would path down to fight each other, with players supporting them, while there is multiple side objectives, a Jade Tiger Shrine and Shaw Infested Outcrop on the east, and a ruined Tree Husk and Mogu Encampment to the west. This BG really does look well made, and with its somewhat up-to-date appearance, could be added if Blizzard figures out how to make a MOBA work in WoW. And our last of the three is simply called Warcraft Heroes. Added to the game files with the launch of Warlords of Draenor, this map very much also gives off the appearance of a MOBA. Seems at the end of MOB, Blizzard really wanted to try making a WoW MOBA battleground, as with how close these are together, I assume both were in the works at the same time. Especially as these two BGs came out around the same time as Heroes of the Storm which was a MOBA game that Blizzard had developed themselves. Maybe some practice for them, maybe a planned crossover, we may never know. But enough about all that. This zone has a very obvious Horde half and Alliance half. The zone is overall rather basic, with overall rather little work done, especially with the pathing and seemingly NPCs placed and planned, replaced by placeholder ogres. And with this, there seems to be camps of mobs near the edge, much like you would see in the MOBA's jungle, even including a boss ogre. So there is many things we can gather from this, and this very well could have simply been an extremely early concept of Ashran, as it does fit into the same style, but most likely this was another attempt at making a WoW MOBA battleground, simply to the fact that multiple lanes, and even there being jungle enemies, even harking back somewhat to Warcraft 3. All three of these maps are really well done, and it's a shame that at least for Ajar's Crater and Defense of the Yell House, they are pretty much entirely complete, but simply missing the mechanics required to play them. It would be nice to see them finally released in the game, although I'm sure Ajar's Crater would have to come in some time walking event or a classic plus. But let's hope these broken BGs get their time to shine. Maybe even in some kind of Warfront return, as the best way to make a WoW MOBA in the BG may be to amalgamize the Warfront system. Located in Fenris Keep in the Silver Pine Forest is a rare undead null mob named Snarlmane. The only thing notable about this NPC during its appearance in the pre-Cataclysm world is that it had a chance to drop an axe called the Flesh Carver. During Cataclysm, the NPC was removed from the game, 
so you can only see it if you go play on the classic WoW servers. Now, this NPC is actually from Warcraft 3, and was the Null General that Sylvanas mind controlled during her fight with Varimathras. When Sylvanas was fighting the Dreadlords in order to take control of the Undercity for the first time, she made very liberal use of mind control on leaders of various monsters in the area. That way, she could make use of their armies in order to fill her ranks more quickly. And Snarlmane was one of those monsters you took control of, where for the low, low price of only mind controlling a single leader, she gained a whole platoon of Null Warriors. Now, one can assume that he died fighting for Sylvanas, and then was raised as an undead and just ran off and joined the Rothide Knolls in Silverpine, but we don't actually know how he ended up in this location or why he's classified as undead. But that's a pretty fair speculation based on the lore in that time period. So even from the beginning, Sylvanas was not shy about using mind control to get what she wanted, just as long as that control is not directed at her specifically. Located throughout the Maw are a whole bunch of items you can find called Maw Lore Items. When you find one of these items, it simply gives you a quest to turn into Venari, and that's about it. Venari will sometimes note about the things you give to her, but for the most part there's not much more to these items, despite the fact that they do call themselves lore items. However, in the beta for Shadowlands, a lot of these items did have some lore associated to them, something which is even referenced by Venari with the Tormentor's note. When you turn this particular item into Venari, she'll remark, Quite the vivid description. I suggest you consider this a reminder of what will happen should you fail in your efforts against the Jailer. However, after you accept and turn the quest in, you don't actually get any description, and Venari is saying her lines as if you had read something. And in the beta, there was quite a vivid description attached to this, which was removed when the game went live. The description I'll be showing on screen, full of a lot of technical information, so I won't be reading it verbatim. However, what it does describe is the torture process of a Calderai female who wound up in the Maw with their test number one mentioning that the target was highly resistant to physical pain. With test number two, they tried to use sound in their experiments by exposing her to constant gnomish tavern jigs, and the notes that it was too painful for the guards administering the test so they gave up on it. Test number three was titled Force Visualizations, where it states that the test subject was forced to relive a specific moment in their life, and that this particular subject broke on their 115th viewing of the burning of Teldrassil. And then it ends off saying that they were able to extract 10 times the amount of anima through this process. Now, this particular piece of Maw lore is pretty dark, and there were other similar descriptions in some of the other Maw lore items, although all of them were scrapped from the game at launch. And the launch of Shadowlands had quite a bit of problems, as it was delayed a full month after the promised release date and the Maw wasn't even close to being finished when they got to that initial release date. So a lot of what ended up being in the Maw at launch was done during that last month grace period they gave themselves. And it's pretty obvious to anyone who played the game at launch that the Maw was obviously not finished, and it was a pretty barren wasteland and only subject to doing a couple of daily quests. So Blizzard could have removed these Maw lore pieces because they wanted to do something with them, but then scrapped whatever ideas they had and probably didn't have the other ones finished. Or it could have been scrapped because the pieces of information we did get in the beta were pretty dark, honestly. But it fits in with the lore of the zone of being a terrible place that you don't want to go to. Algalon the Observer is most likely named after Algol, the Demon Star, which was named such because it had an inconsistent brightness and people considered it an ill omen whenever they were able to see it. Modern astronomers were able to figure out why it had an inconsistent brightness, and it was basically because it was actually orbiting around another star, which would sometimes have it covered up and be less bright to the naked eye, which happened roughly once every two days. Algol is also an anagram for an early computer language, which could be why Algalon talks like he's a computer trying to reprogram something. So, when you add these two references together, you get the creature known as Algalon the Observer, a celestial made of stars that is also reminiscent of a robot with the way he speaks. Located in Revendreth at this spot on the map, just inside a building will be a couple of Revendreth citizens surrounding a cooking pot. And if you click on the cooking pot and have 30 infused rubies on you, a dredge will pop out, and you'll be awarded a toy item called the Muckpool Cook Pot. This toy item has a 5 minute cooldown and simply allows you to create a cooking fire, which functions exactly like a normal cooking fire you can create for free, except it has a different cosmetic appearance. 
Infused rubies can be obtained by just killing creatures in Revendreth, or through daily events if you're part of the Venthyr Covenant. And obtaining 30 rubies could take a while, but really should not be that difficult to obtain if all you're trying to do is get 30 of them for this one item. And now, for some information about the earliest versions of the game. Did you know there were plans to have another event similar to the opening of Gates of the AQ-40? According to a Blizzard developer who worked on the original Vanilla WoW, there were plans to have a huge quest chain where Warlock players were needed to perform a collection effort in order to rebuild Medivh's spellbook and performing a ritual to open the Dark Portal. And the players on the server would have to protect the Warlocks from enemy attacks that were coming through this portal. Just like the AQ-40 event, it would require the whole server to collect a whole bunch of resources, plus have a long quest chain in order to unlock the required item, and culminate with a day-long event centered around warlocks doing something useful while everyone else was playing second fiddle and had to help them out. And the event was supposed to herald the coming of either the Burning Crusade expansion, Naxxramas, or some unknown raid after Nax. The reason we don't know what it was really meant for was because the whole event was cancelled after they saw how the gates of the AQ-40 event went and how most of the realms were just unplayable during the day-long event because they didn't have the technology in order to hold that many people in one zone at a time. Even in Classic WoW, they had problems with this server lag during the recreation of the event, and this was after almost 20 years of technological advancements. So, it's pretty easy to see why they cancelled the second event and never tried another event like this again. The AQ-40 server-wide collection event was the first and last time they did something like this and they kept all other events similar really small in scale, like empowering one of three towers on the Broken Isle during Legion. In the beta version of World of Warcraft, before the auction house was implemented, there was a primitive auction house add-on called Auto Trade, which came bundled with a whole bunch of other add-ons as part of the Cosmo UI package, which was needed in order to have a second action bar before they made that a default feature. And basically, what the add-on did was allow you to post an item to the Auto Trade server. Then, other people who had the add-on could see the item you had posted and then choose to buy it. In which case, the add-on would notify you that a buyer was found, and it would designate a meeting place for you to get together in order to trade the item. As originally, the WoW team wanted World of Warcraft to have a completely face-to-face -face trading system, as that's what it was like in EverQuest, and they wanted the game to be a lot more social, and not allow people to just buy stuff from people who were offline. Although, since the add-on was so popular, the dev team kind of relented, as stated in the WoW Diary book. As according to John Stantz, one of the game designers of Original WoW, the development team was kind of split on whether they wanted person-to-person -person exchange of goods or an anonymous offline auction house. But the popularity of the add-on is what tipped the scales in favor of establishing the auction house eventually. And he also goes on to note that it was kind of disconcerting that they were changing the game because they couldn't prevent players from implementing their own systems to circumvent what they wanted players to do. So, if you enjoy not having to run to people in order to trade things manually for everything, you can thank the Cosmo team for implementing the auto trade add-on. First off, let's go over no murlocs on the Dragon Isles. One of the most iconic creatures in all of WoW are the murlocs. These fishy humanoids that are native to Azeroth have long been a fan favorite, and there are numerous pets, toys, costumes, and even mounts with murlocs in the game. Their cries of murgle murgle can often be heard in tons of zones, and they're usually a staple of questing. One part of the popularity is simply due to the fact that they can be found almost anywhere in WoW. In fact, they can be found on any continent on Azeroth, with the exception of the Dragon Isle. That's right, so far in Dragonflight, there has not been a single Murloc anywhere to be sighted on the Dragon Isles. There are many quests in the Eastern Kingdom, Kalimdor, Northrend, Kul'Tras, and Sandalar which focus on Murlocs. And even the Broken Isles had a few fell Murlocs in the Broken Shore. Pandaria technically does have murlocs since there are baby murlocs that can be found in the far east of the Crassering Wilds. Murlocs can even be found in Outland as well, even though they're not native there. While never explaining the game, it can be presumed that the Naga brought the murlocs to Outland with them when they traveled with Lady Vash under orders of Illidan. And of course there are no murlocs in alternate Draenor since murlocs not evolved there. While the Dragon Isles do have Gorlocks in the Waking Shore, the Unarred Plains, and the Azure Span, these slimy creatures are the predecessors to the murlocs and not actual murlocs themselves. Gorlocks do come with their own haunting sounds, and have so far only really been featured on the continent of Northrend. Both Murlocks and Gorlocks use the same language named Nurglish, which is further proof they're closely related. Another interesting fact is that the Makrura, which are the lobster and crayfish-like sea creatures, also share the same language of Nurglish. Jaina Proudmore is one of the central figures to Warcraft's lore and story, so it's no surprise that she would appear in dungeons and instances, 
either as a boss or NPC. But Jaina takes the cake at being in a total of 15 dungeons and raids, the most of any character in all of WoW. Out of these appearances, she only serves as a boss twice, and an NPC for the other 13 times. We'll go over these dungeons and raids per expansion and briefly mention her role in each of them. Jaina's first appearance in WoW is from the Battle for Mount Hyjal raid. In this raid from the Burning Crusade expansion, players go back in time to the events of the Third War in Warcraft 3. This raid is unique in the fact that there's no real reason as to why players are here, other than the use of bronze dragonflight time magic. The devs just wanted players to be able to roughly relive the Warcraft 3 end battle in WoW and loot, quote, fat purples. In the Battle for Mount Hyjal raid, Jaina serves as the central leader during the first six waves of the instances and the two bosses. Perhaps the Battle for Mount Hyjal is one of the least liked raids in the entire game due to its long and holdout nature, and the fact that defeating enemies in the raid is the only significant way to gain reputation with the Scale of the Sands. In fact, the Battle for Mount Hyjal actually made it onto our video of the top 10 least good raids in all of WoW. The next time Jaina makes an appearance in an instance is in the dungeon Colin of Stratholm. In this dungeon, players help the Bronze Dragonflight to restore the timeways which have been corrupted by the Infinite Dragonflight. Chronologically, this is the first time in Jaina's life story that she is featured in an instance, since the events of the Battle of Mount Hyjal are at the end of Warcraft 3, whereas the Colonist Stratholm is at the beginning of the game. Added in Wrath of Lich King's expansion, the Colonist Stratholm dungeon gives the players a first-hand view of the moment in history in which Arthas kills an entire city of innocent civilians out of mercy and to stop the contagion of the undeath from spreading further. Outside the city gates, Jaina says her infamous line, I'm sorry Arthas, I can't watch you do this, before she turns and leaves. This decision would later haunt her life, such as in the Realm of Torment cinematic from the Battle for Azeroth expansion, when she says, I should have stopped him, he never would have turned, he'd still be alive. Jaina's first true appearance in an instance in the game aside from the Bronze Dragonflight shenanigans is also in Wrath in the dungeon Trial the Champion and the raids Trial the Crusader and Trial the Grand Crusader. In this dungeon, Jaina can be seen alongside King Varian Rin in the stands surrounding the Argent Tournament as the forces of Azeroth prepare to march upon Icecrown Citadel and the seat of the Lich King's power. Although Jaina has no lines in any of the three instances, her NPC model is there, so we will count it. Jaina's next three appearances are in the dungeons leading up to ICC. The Forge of Souls, the Pit of Saren, and the Halls of Reflection all feature Alliance players searching and aiding Jaina as she tries to enter the Citadel by herself. For Horde players, Sylvanas instead of Jaina leads them through these three dungeons. Both characters have a heavy story involvement with Arthas, and these three dungeons help explain and develop their arcs. The Halls of Reflection dungeon is particularly notable because its final boss is not really a boss and more of a run away from Arthas before he kills you fight. This dungeon even makes an appearance in our video Top 10 Best Dungeons in WoW. Jaina's last appearance in Wrath is in the Ice Crown Citadel raid during the Sour Fang after fight RP scene. This makes Jaina have a total of 7 appearances in Wrath instances, although she only appears in 3 for Horde players, since Sylvanas takes her place in the Forge of Souls, Pit of Sauron, and Halls of Reflection, and Sour Fang takes her place in ICC. Jaina makes only 1 appearance as a boss in Cataclysm, and even then, this could be debated. In the End Time dungeon located in the Cavern of the Time, players defeat an Echo of Jaina in a warped and twisted future brought on by the evil dragon Murazon, who was Nas Dormu after he's fallen to the Old God's corruption. First, this is not technically Jaina, only a residual fragment of her left over in this post-apocalyptic world after the Hour of Twilight. All of this is to say that this version of Jaina does not actually exist in our timeline and is therefore not entirely real. Regardless, we'll still count her as a boss in this instance and add it to the running total. It is also worth noting this is the third time Jaina makes an appearance in a dungeon or raid because of Bronze Dragon time shenanigans. Now we move on to WoW's fourth expansion, Mist of Pandaria. In MOP, Jaina only makes an appearance in one instance, which is the Siege of Orgrimmar raid. Actually, Jaina makes two appearances in this famous raid. Her first appearance is after players defeat the Shah of Pride under the Veil of Eternal Blossoms, after which she opens a teleport to Orgrimmar for Alliance players. Jaina makes a second appearance again at the very end of the raid after Garrosh has been defeated and all the major faction leaders are standing around. This is right after the raid ending cinematic when Jaina tells Varian to, quote, dismantle the Horde. Jaina's next appearance in instance is not until after the Battle for Azeroth expansion in which she has three appearances in different instances. Her first appearance is in the Siege of Aralis dungeon in which she appears briefly at the end of the dungeon to teleport players out. The next two times Jaina makes appearances in BFA are in raids. Notably, Jaina serves as the final boss of the Battle for Dazara lore raid with a chance of dropping the Glacial Tidestorm out. This is arguably the second time Jaina has been a boss in the game, with her first appearance as a boss being an echo of herself in the End Time dungeon mentioned earlier. Jaina also plays a prominent role in the fight against Azhar in the Eternal Palace raid. Jaina continues to lend a helping hand to players twice in two different raids from the Shadowlands expansion. In both the Sang of Domination and the Sepulchre of the first ones, Jaina and Thrall serve as guiding NPCs as they help players overcome Sylvanas and the Jailer. So, there you have it. Jaina has been in a total of 15 instances so far in WoW, 
One appearance in TBC, seven in Wrath, one in Kata, one in Mop, three in BFA, and two in Shadowlands. Those numbers can be a bit altered if you count not seeing her as Horde in some Wrath instances, and whether or not it truly is Jaina as a boss in the end time. Additionally, Jaina will also probably have some roles in future raids and dungeons as well. For this next section, we want to go back to Cataclysm to talk about two very interesting taverns. The island, or islands if you want to be technical, of Tolbarad were added in Cataclysm as an open world battleground and daily questing hub. Tolbarad was originally intended to be a sort of Wintergrafts 2.0 but its design and placement quickly left many players feeling less than fond of it. Through daily quests and winning the Tolbarad Battleground, players can earn Tolbarad Commendations. Upon reaching honor with the player's respective faction and earning 40 Tolbarad Commendations, players could buy a special tavern. For Alliance, this meant reaching honor with the Baradins Wardens faction and purchasing the Baradin Warden Tavern from the Quartermaster Brazy. For Horde players, this meant being honored with the Hellscream's Reach faction, purchasing the Hellscream's Reach Tavern from the Quartermaster Pock. These tabards are useful because they teleport the player to Tolbarad, where there is a closed portal to their capital city. Since they are tabards, they can be equipped, transmogrified, and even placed in the player's action bar since it is a usable item. All this means that the Baradin's Warden's Tabard and the Hellscream's Reach Tabard are essentially teleports to capital cities. The only other similar items to have these are the three guild cloaks which teleport the player to Orgrimmar or Stormwind. In fact, there is only one other tabard in the entire game that teleports the player, and this tabard is the Tabard of the Argent Dawn. For more information on useful teleporting items, check out this video on this subject, which will be linked in the video description below. Did you know there are three achievements in the game called Death From Above? The first of these two achievements are from the patch 4.2, Rage of Firelands. During this achievement, players must bomb 10 different fire elementals during the daily quest, Fires in the Skies. Unfortunately, this achievement is not as easy as it may sound. Not only is this quest locked behind other dailies and requires some progression to the Firelands campaign, but only three of the Fire Lords spawn each day, and they spawn at random. This pesky achievement is a criteria for the meta achievement Veteran of the Molten Front, which awards the title The Flamebreaker. The next achievement entitled Death from Above, interestingly, comes from the Firelands Raid. This achievement is easy to solo now, since it just requires the player to kill some adds in a specific place during the Bethelak encounter. Bethelak is a giant fire spider, so if you have arachnophobia, you might want to skip this achievement. However, this achievement is required for the meta achievement, which rewards the epic Corruptic Firehawk mount. The third and final achievement is from PvP. Added at the end of Legion, this seething shore battleground has players battling for Azeroth off the coast of Feralis. In this battleground, players start off flying on gunships and parachute down to the battleground. To get this achievement, you have to slay an enemy within 30 seconds of landing. This achievement is part of the meta achievement Master of the Seething Shore, which awards the title The Prospector. In the early development of the Cataclysm expansion, Deathwing was actually supposed to physically erupt from the ground to actually create the Cataclysm. This was later changed to Deathwing emerging from the Maelstrom, but there are several remnants of this plan still visible. The area where he was supposed to erupt was planned to be south of Dunmoreau, north of Stormwind, and to the west of the Searing Gorge and the Burning Steps. In fact, there is even an early alpha map showing this new area. This area was going to become a new mini zone where the actual entrance of Deep Home will be located, directly where Notharion was hitting his head in the cinematic. This mini zone would have been called the Deathwing Scar, and the destruction of Deathwing would have been extended all the way to the Twilight Highlands. While most of this plan was abandoned early on, there is still quite a noticeable scar in the Badlands. In fact, this subzone is named the Scar of the Worldbreaker. So if you ever wondered why this scar was just limited to the Badlands, now you know. Following this course, it then makes sense that Deathwing would fly north over Loch Modan and fly over the Stone Rot Dam, breaking it in the process, which you can see in the Cataclysm intro cinematic. From Wetlands, Deathwing would enter the Twilight Highlands on his way to Grim Patol to capture Alexstrasza's eggs. In fact, he even bisects Grim Patol, which can be seen in the dungeon along the top of the map. The walkway throughout the dungeon is even called the Scar Terrence. So even though most of these things did not make it to the final version of the game, some early iterations and ideas can still be seen in several zones in the middle of the Eastern Kingdoms. There was a lot of cut content from Cataclysm, as you can see all in our previous video on the channel, which is linked to the video description going over it. There are many companions and battle pets in WoW, but among the rarest is the simple Firefly. This seems rather contradictory, and the story behind it is pretty fascinating. The Firefly pet is learned from an item named Captured Firefly, and this item has a small chance to drop from Bog Flare Needlers in the zone of Zangamarsh and Outland. Oh, and when I say small, I mean very, very small, at a rate of below 0.1%. It is one of the rarest pets to obtain in the entire game. This is reflected in its price in the Auction House, where in the NA Realms it hovers around 500,000 gold. In fact, there are only 25 Bog Flare Needlers in the entire zone, and they have a respawn timer of 5 minutes. All of this adds up to one of the worst grinds in the game if you want this rare and elusive pet. In fact, the item it drops from, the Captured Firefly item, had its quality changed from common to rare during the BFA expansion to better reflect the rarity of the drop. 
In the city of Orgrimmar, on the north side of the area called the Drag, you will find a shop named Doffers and Sons Salvit. In this shop, you'll find a father and son orc who don't sell anything. These characters and their shop are a direct nod to the 70s sitcom Stanford and Son. And while the orc father is older and named Drand Roffers, which is an anagram for Fred Sanford, the father of the show. Similarly, the son of the game is named Malton Droffers, which is an anagram for Lamont Sanford. Dran also refers to people as dummies, just like Fred does on the show. Perhaps the show is today most remembered for a running gag in the series, in which times during distress, Fred looks up, as to the heavens, with his hands across his chest, faking a heart attack and saying, This is the big one, Elizabeth. I'm coming to join you, honey. But Lamont knows that it's merely a dramatic ploy. The Droffers also have some other interesting tidbits in the game. Occasionally, they will sell their wares on the black market auction house, truly proving that one man's junk is another man's treasure. Both Doffers have cameos in the horrific visions of Orgrimmar, in which Molton is carrying around a tire for some reason as a shield in order to protect the shop as it's being used to create a teleporter. Let's travel to the northwest part of the Jade Forest. Here atop a hill, which is appropriately titled Shrine of Friendship, you will find a broken incense burner. Based on the surroundings and setting, it can be assumed this is the same incense burner that had seen the Mist of Pandaria expansion cinematic trailer. In this cinematic, an orc rips the incense burner off to use as a weapon against a human after they're both shipwrecked. As they fight, the Pandaren monk Chan Stormstout easily takes the incense burner back from the orc and places it back on its pedestal and slightly corrects its positioning with the bamboo pole. In game, the player can right click on the incense burner to correctly straighten it. This is a nice little easter egg as it's the first time to date the player has been able to interact with something directly from a cinematic trailer. Upon straining the incense burner, the player will earn the achievement Restore Balance. The achievement's description reads, Visit the Shrine of Fellowship in the Jade Forest and follow in the footsteps of Chen Stormstout. The burner eventually resets itself to a broken state, so you can wait around to click it again if you want to for some reason. It'd be awesome if Blizzard can make the mob cinematic play every time you click the incense burner. Clicking on objects to have them play a cinematic is much more interesting and engaging than choosing from a list of dialogue options for some random NPC after the end of an expansion. In the Calling of Stratholme dungeon, added in the Burning Crusade, towards the middle of the dungeon after defeating the third boss, Arthas will open up a secret passageway to allow the group to progress to the last boss of the dungeon, which is Malganus. The line Arthas says is, I'm relieved to see this old passageway still works. While certainly the Prince of Lordaeron would know several secrets about the kingdom, it is never stated how Arthas knew of this passageway. Did someone tell him? Did he find it out on his own? Did he already know about it for good reasons or nefarious reasons? However he came to know about it, it's a nice touch that keeps Arthas as a character just a bit more mysterious. The next item on our list is a quest reward from Classic called Dartle's Rod of Transformation. This item was added in patch 1.13 and became somewhat famous in vanilla. Unfortunately, Dartle's Rod of Transformation could only be obtained by Alliance players. Later on, the wand was removed entirely from the game Cataclysm because of the zone revamp. Dartle's Rod of Transformation is from a quest called Reen's Cleansing in Ashenvale. This questline has the player help a dryad named Sheldrin who is trying to remove some of the corruption from the local fur bogs. What makes this wand so unique is, as the name implies, it can transform the player into a fur bog for three minutes. Originally, the wand had a limit of five charges, but this was changed to infinite uses later. The cast time is only two seconds long and it had a one minute cooldown, meaning you could effectively constantly keep your form as a fur bog, provided you did not mount or shapeshift or were in combat. With this wand on your hotbar, you could go around the entire zone of Ashenvale as a fur bog. Unfortunately, the wand only worked in Ashenvale for some reason, although we do not know if this was done intentionally or if it was caused by restrictions from the game's engine. At the end of the questline, Dartle's water transformation gets removed from the player's inventory. To circumvent this, many players started the quest but never completed it in order to use the wand whenever they liked. Due to its popularity, this can be considered somewhat of a prototype toy compared to the more modern uses of toys in WoW. This item was so popular, in fact, that Blizzard in essence re-added it as a toy in Cataclysm called the Stave of Fur and Claw. This actual toy, which is still in the game, pretty much does the same thing as the wand. The toy requires the player to be exalted to Timberball Hold and can be bought from the Quartermaster named Meliosh. The toy version of Dartol's Rod of Transformation has three major downsides. First, the rep grind of Timberball Hold can be a challenge. Second, taking any damage after you use the toy will cancel the effect. Finally, the toy has a cooldown of one hour, which is way longer than the one minute cooldown in vanilla. The only silver lining with this toy compared to the old Dartol's Rod of Transformation is the Horde players could now buy the toy and use it too. The only similarities between the Stab of Fur and Claw and the Dartol's Rod of Transformation is that the Furball costumes still last for 3 minutes and they both take 2 seconds to cast. The Stave of Fur and Claw has only been altered once since the toy was added to the game in Cataclysm. At the beginning of Warlords of Draenor, the item was turned into a rare item and was added to the toy box, which was a new collection tab for toys that went live with WAD's release. The Stab of Fur and Claw currently remains much further behind than its vanilla counterpart in terms of fun and how long it lets you be a Furbog for. Of course, one way to solve this furry dilemma would be to add fur bogs as an allied race. 
This would give us the ability to play as Furbogs without need for a cooldown. Would you play as a Furbog? To be honest, I know I'd probably play as one if they were added as a race. Now that we're done with Furbogs, let's move on to our next item in the video. Added in Cataclysm, the Crystalline tier of loyalty is 100% drop from several rare elites. Only 35 rare elites in the entire game drop this trash item. It can be sold to a vendor for 25 gold. While listing all 35 would be a bit too much, it is rather interesting that most of the rare mobs that drop the Crystalline tier of loyalties can be found in Mount Hyjal, the Molten Front, and the Twilight Highlands. Almost all of these mobs that drop the Crystalline tier are from the 5 new zones in Cataclysm, with only a handful in old, revamped zones. The Crystalline Tier of Loyalty is one of the few pieces of trash items in the game with a detailed description. The text reads, The desire to serve as a loyal companion coalesced into a single priceless crystal. While happiness as a mechanic was removed from pets in Cataclysm, this happened at a late patch and the Crystalline Tiers had been in since Cataclysm's launch. This means it is highly unlikely the reference to happiness being removed from the game. Blizzard devs foresaw that hunters would want to tame these special unique rare mobs, so it makes sense to feel bad when you kill a rare elite with a hunter while trying to tame it. Unfortunately, this didn't really stop anyone from killing these rares. While these rare mobs do not drop any loot, getting 25 gold for just killing a rare mob isn't something that's going to deter players from killing it. Seeing as how nothing quite like this has ever been implemented in the game again, it's no stretch to think that this little experiment failed in its goal. After all, that would also require the average WoW player to ever look at the trash item and, even worse, read the flavor text on a crystalline tier of loyalty. Now, let's head to Nagrand and Outland. Here above Sky Song Lake, on the northwestern part of the zone map, you can find one particular floating rock with a secret. On this floating island, you will see a tree with a skeleton sitting at its base, leading up against the trunk. The skeleton has a shield on one side of him and an axe through his skull and the ground around him is littered with apples, presumably from the tree above. This is likely a reference to Isaac Newton, a famous scientist from the 17th century. While Newton contributed a lot to the fields of mathematics and science, one of the things he's best well known for is a story that says he supposedly first started thinking about the idea of gravity after an apple fell on his head while he was sitting under an apple tree. With all the floating islands and rocks in the Grand, it's clear that the Newtonian gravitational physics do not apply to the Grand. Newton's view of gravity would later be replaced by Einstein's theory of relativity, but WoW is a video game with magic and time travel, so it doesn't really matter anyway. So, if you ever wondered why there's floating rocks in the Grand, this little easter egg is trying to explain why. Quite cheekily, Blizzard killed the man who first thought of gravity as a force in order to allow the zone to have such a unique visual aesthetic. Of course, this also might be a mistake since Zerathmortis is the first ever zone with floating trees and islands, as we all know from the development preview video of Zerathmortis, which also included such exciting other things like water that you're able to walk on. Our next item is the Lorewalker's Lodestone. This item was added in the Pandaria expansion and is tied to the archaeology profession. The archaeology profession got a rework in MOP, and one of the major changes to the profession was the items created through pieces of artifacts could be turned into restored artifacts which are used as a currency. The player needs to be exalted with the Lord Walkers and have one restored artifact to buy a Lord Walker's Lodestone from Tan Shin Tayo in the Seed of Knowledge in the Veil of Eternal Blossoms. Now, what's so special about this item is that it allows the player to teleport to any active archaeology dig site in Pandaria. This is quite handy for getting around the continent, especially when you're farming restored artifacts. The Lord Walker's Lodestone potentially saves the trouble of having to fly across the whole continent to get to the other side where other active dig sites are. Pandaria is a big continent and takes over 10 minutes to fly from one end of the zone to the other. Like with most teleportation items, Blizzard hates fun and there are several restrictions on the Lord Walker's Lodestone. First, the cooldown Lodestone is 30 minutes. While that might not seem too bad, it usually takes less than 5 minutes to complete one dig site. So its usefulness is immediately decreased since you still have to fly to the next dig site while the Lodestone is on cooldown. Second, the Lodestone is only usable in the content of Pandaria. Finally, the Lodestone says in its description that it teleports the player to a random dig site, not one in particular. So the dig site you teleport to could be anywhere in any zone as long as it's up. This means you could use a Lodestone to end up in the same zone near where you were if there was already an active dig site there. Another aspect of the random dig site is that you cannot focus on any particular archaeology fragment type, although this can sometimes be changed using Lord Walker's map and the Manted Artifact Sonic Locator. Both of these two items are in a chest called the Manted Artifact Hunter's Kit, which costs two restored artifacts. This kit is available for purchase from the same vendor you can get the Lodestone from. The Lord Walker's map randomizes your active dig sites, so you have a chance of getting a new dig site for the culture or zone you want. The Manted Artifact Sonic Locator turns all of your new active dig sites into Manted ones. It is a little strange you can only make one more of a type of dig site instead of all of them. For example, there is no equivalent for Pandaren or Mogu Artifact Sonic Locators. Additionally, the Manted Artifact Sonic Locator only lasts for 24 hours in the player's inventory. Finally, if you have more than one Lore Walker Lodestone in your inventory, they share a cooldown. The one upside to both the Lore Walker's Lodestone and the Lore Walker's map is that they both have 20 uses. This means you only need to spend one restored artifact to get 20 uses out of the item. 
Aside from the nitpicking, this item is very unique and it's a shame more people don't know about it. Archaeology is by far the least done secondary profession to the point where it's even just abandoned in Shadowlands. Hopefully with the revamps of Professions in Dragonflight, they might finally try something new with archaeology. Next up, we have a toy called the Summer Cranial Skillet. When used, this toy puts a large bronze skillet on the player's head. The skillet acts as a campfire, meaning other players can now cook atop your head. The toy's description reads, kneel down and allow others to cook over you. The buff the players receive is called Cranial Cooktop and lasts for 5 minutes. There are two major downsides to this toy, however. First, the player is briefly stunned when they initially use a Summer Cranial Skillet. Second, moving or taking any action cancels the toy's effect. Because it cancels upon any player action, you cannot actually cook on yourself, which is a bit disappointing. Luckily, the toy also only has a cooldown of 10 seconds, meaning you can use it again pretty quickly. The toy was added to the game in patch 9.1.5, but didn't become available until 9.2.5, because it could only be bought during the Midsummer Fire Festival. The Summer Cranial Skillet can be bought from any Midsummer Festival for 150 Burning Blossoms. Burning Blossoms can be acquired by doing quick little quests, honoring your respective faction's bonfire in the zone, and extinguishing the opposite faction's bonfire if your zone is contested. Each bonfire gives 5 Burning Blossoms, so you need to honor or extinguish at least 30 bonfires to get 150 Burning Blossoms for the Summer Cranial Skillet. This is roughly all of the zones in the Eastern Kingdoms or in Kalimdor, so it might take a while to do, but not nearly as long as doing every bonfire in the game to earn the achievement of the Fires of Azeroth. The second, more unknown summer-related toy is called the Hosen Beach Ball. The rare mob this toy drops from is not Gokluck, however, but rather a Hosen named Ikik -Ik the Nimble. Ikik -Ik lies sleeping in a cave in the middle of the southern part of the zone, and he has a roughly 15% chance to drop the toy. There are several reasons why this toy is so unique and special. First is the effect itself. When the player uses the toy, they gain a buff called Beach Bum, with its text description reading, Ready for fun in the sun. This effect turns the player's weapon into a shovel, places a little bucket in the other hand, and adds a tank top and beach pants to the character. Second is the toy's buff, which actually acts as a costume, not a shapeshift or other toy effect. The beach bum buff lasts 10 minutes, and during the entire time you can still mount, engage in combat, and do most other things while using the toy. It even persists through druid transformations and shapeshifts. There is another toy that drops from a rare in the Dread Waste, called Gawklock Shell, but this toy was already covered in an unknown side of WoW video previously. We're only bringing it up here because it can be used in combination with the Hose and Beach Ball. If you use the Hose and Beach Ball, then Gawklock Shell, and then cancel Gawklock Shell, there used to be a minor bug where your character would still have the shovel and bucket, but without the armor changes. So if you ever wanted to make sand castles while waiting for a raid pool, you now know what toy to use. Most players will be familiar with the Black Dragon Rathion and Ebonhorn, since we've seen a lot of them in recent expansions. As such, we only have one other dragon to discuss from the Black Dragon flight. The Black Dragon is named Sibelian, and he's located in Outland, specifically in the zone of the Blade Edge Mountain. Sibelian made his first appearance in WoW in the Burning Crusade, where he can be seen under the guise of his human form named Baron Selblemy. What makes Sibelian so interesting is that he was once the Prime Lieutenant of Deathwing. He followed Deathwing to Draenor before it was destroyed and became Outland. However, Deathwing made it back to Azeroth, whereas Sibelian did not. Since then, he has been in a war against Gruul and the Grand for killing so many of his fellow Black Dragons. Sibelian is the presumed Lord of the Black Dragonflight in the Outland. Sibelian even reveals himself as a Black Dragon if you're an Alliance player questing through Bladehead's Mountains. He transforms into a Black Dragon to help the players kill Gok, a giant Grand that is one of Gruul's seven sons. In the Burning Crusade, players even learn Sibelian is rearing new Black Dragon Weblings, and even uses them as messengers. It seems both Sibelian and Rathion have plans for the Black Dragonflight. But all of this leads to a glaring issue. Does Rathion know about Sibelian? In the Exploring Azeroth novel, even Matthias Shaw, the head of the SI7 security for the Alliance, knows about Sibelian, but says he's not a threat. And if Shaw knows this, then Rathion would probably know Sibelian's existence as well, since his Black Talon agents are very good at their jobs of gathering information and secrets for him. All of this begs the question, why hasn't Rathion tried to kill Sibelian yet? Rathion has killed almost every other Black Dragon that was corrupted, as seen in the Cataclysm Dagger Legendary Quest Chain for the Fangs of the Father. This all points to the possibility for contention over who could be the next leader of the Black Dragon flight if these two Black Dragons should be one another. While Sibelian was Deathwing's chief lieutenant, that was before Deathwing went completely bonkers and Sibelian himself doesn't appear to be evil and seems kind of chill, other than the whole genocide and Grons thing. In fact, Sibelian even became friends with Rexar in the Burning Crusade, although he never revealed his true nature to him. With Rexar recently having played a small part in the Battle for Azeroth expansion, it would be interesting to see if these two characters meet again. On a possibly related note, there's also the Worm Cult, which is a cult who worships Black Dragons of the Blade Jets Mountain. 
It is unknown if they have any direct connection to Sibelian, but it certainly is potential fodder for plot material, and Blizzard knows it. Here's hoping Sibelian and Rathion get along fine if they do meet one another. The next Dragonflight is the Blue Dragonflight, which is currently led by Caligos. There are several Blue Dragons worth mentioning, but we have eight main ones. First up is Azuragos. Azuragos is a crazy, wild, and humorous old blue dragon. Most players will probably know him as being the world boss in Ajara from Vanilla, and in recent years he's returned for the WoW Anniversary event as well. In fact, he was one of the first world bosses ever introduced to the game, alongside Lord Kazak. Azuragos also plays a role in obtaining the Scepter of the Shifting Sands. He was entrusted with keeping a piece of the Scepter, and so he did, by hiding it in a fish. A minnow, to be exact. Aziragos made a brief return in Cataclysm, where he can be found questing in Ajara. There is also a short quest chain that sees players finding out he has been hiding in a spirit world from assassins sent by Deathwing, and has fallen in love with a spirit healer. Aziragos returns in Legion, where he is a brief part of the Mage Order Hall. A sassy old blue dragon up to some wacky hijinks is something we may just have to deal with in the future. The second blue dragon is Kirigosa. While she has no appearances in WoW yet, she has been featured in two Warcraft novels, Twilight of the Aspects and Tides of War. Kirigosa is worth mentioning for several reasons. First, she is a daughter of Malagos, and therefore does have some legitimacy to contest in Caligos as leader of the Blue Dragonflight. Second, she was almost forced to mate with Chromatis meaning she may know something about the abominable five-headed dragon. Third, it is stated in the Tides of War that there were other blues that believed that Kirigosa and Caligos would be ideal mates for each other, but the two have always just been friends. And such, this leaves room for a possible blue dragon power couple. Kirigosa's former mate, Jaragos, was killed in Cataclysm, and Caligos is no longer seeing Jaina. Her return is easily possible, since at the end of Tides of War, Kirigosa is living quietly in Stranglethorn, enjoying a permanent summer. The next blue dragon is Hale. Malagos was the original blue dragon aspect and had four known dragon consorts, one of them being the famous Indragosa, the dragon Arthas resurrected in his famous cinematic. And all of them are dead except for one named Hale, who currently resides in Winterspring with her son named Nim, which is a reference to a parody singer and machinimator. Anyway, Hale is worth mentioning simply because she is the last living consort of Malagos, and also, interesting enough, the only consort to outlive their dragon aspect, and as such would have considerable sway in the Blue Dragonflight. She does have a handful of quests in Winterspring, but they aren't too terribly important in the grand scheme of things. Next, we have a trio of three Blue Dragons from Legion. Any player who has quested through Azuna will probably remember Senegos and his daughter Stelagosa. They are the leaders of the Azure Wing Dragons and play a major role in the zone's lore and story. It would be nice to catch up with these two, although Senegos was very old and weak in Legion, and it would be good to see him still doing well in his old age. On a brighter note, there's also the great 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 granddaughter of Senegos, Emigosa, which was just a pet whelping last time we saw her. The next blue dragon on this list is Tiragosa. She was once the former intended mate of Caligos, and raised several interesting questions. Caligos had even nicknamed her Tiri. While Tiragosa does do a lot in the WoW comics, these are not canon anymore, sadly. Tiragosa has only been seen by WoW players twice. The first time is in Netherstorm, where she is investigating other dragons. She also briefly makes an appearance in Dragon Soul as an NPC, with only one or two lines of dialogue. Tiragosa could definitely be an interesting character to watch out for, as a possibly returning love interest for Kallik, since him and Jaina did not work out. And Tiragosa's connections with the Nether Dragons could be some interesting plot threads in the Dragon Isles. Reno Jackson of the Explorers League, world-renowned archaeologist, explorer, and treasure hunter, he was always seen as a troublemaker, having sticky fingers, even if his heart is in the right place, impulsive, obsessed with magic and treasure, while being hard to control. He commonly led the charge and the retreat. Although he is stupid, as he is powerful, wielding a Gatling wand magic minigun causes mass armies to simply vanish, and the awesome power to explode his foes with a simple flex, something normal humans cannot do. So why is Reno able to do it? Well, it's because it's revealed through the Galakron's Awakening storyline Hearthstone that the amazing Reno is an orphaned blue dragon who spent his entire life in his humanoid form, unknowing that he was a blue dragon. Although at the end of the campaign, he returns to his human form instantly forgetting that he is a dragon. While he originates from Hearthstone, like Elsie Starseeker, and someone far more known, Silfrindly Merkleton, who has appeared many times since Legion, Reno Jackson has only appeared in two areas so far, Mechagon and Uldum during an Old God invasion, 
leading him to be far less known, especially since the knowledge of his true identity is only revealed if you played Hearthstone, or have watched our past videos on him. I would say he is likely the least known dragon in this video. The Dragonflight expansion sees us going to the Dragon Isles of the League of Explorers, and with them leading the charge, Rio Jackson is sure to show up, and very likely to become at least somewhat more important character and maybe flex on some enemies. As you can tell, there are a lot of blue dragons that are worth keeping tabs on. This is not to mention that all of the dragons on this list besides Delagoso have possible legitimate claims to be the aspect of magic and lead the blue dragonflight. Moving on to the bronze dragonflight, we have four bronze dragons to discuss. These four dragons are all family members of Nazdormu, the dragon aspect of time. First, we have Sorodormi, who is Nazdormu's prime consort. It is quite shocking how little Sorodormi is actually in game, especially considering how she is the last living prime consort that we know of. In the War of the Ancients novel, it was said that Cyridormi herself was the one who carried Broxigar into battle against the forces of the Burning Legion and the Highborn. Broxigar would shortly thereafter become one of the two Normortals to have fought and wound Sargeras himself. Players can also see Sorodormi in the Cataclysm Dungeon, The Well of Eternity. It is Cyridormi, Ysera, and Alexstrasza who are attempting to purify the Dragon Soul after the players defeat Queen Ajara. Aside from this, Sorodormi is only encountered by players one other time in WoW. This appearance is from the Burning Crusade, where she oversees the defense of the timeline in the battle for Mount Hyjal. She is the head of the faction associated with the raid, called the Scales of the Sands. Sorodormi is sorely missed in the game, and she certainly deserves more screen time for being such an important character. Next up is Anachronos. This is the eldest son of Nazdormu, and thus the heir of the Bronze Dragonflight. His mother is presumably Sorodormi, but really he could be the son of any of Nazdormu's consorts as it's not often specified which consort is the parent of which child. He can be found in the Caverns of Time and is the head of the faction called Blood of Nazdormu. Anachronos has a ton of lore and events associated with him, so he's pretty important to pay attention to, and we'll try to give you a very brief history of him. Long before the events of WoW, during the War of the Shifting Sands, it was Anachronos who convinced all the other dragons to help aid the Night Elves in their fight against the Karaji. In fact, it was Anachronos himself who made the Scepter and the Gong that were used to seal and later reopen on Karaj. It makes sense, then, when players first meet him in Vanilla, Anachronos is heavily involved in obtaining the Scepter of the Shin Sands for the opening of the Gates of the Yon Karaj event, since he is the one who made it and gave out the four pieces. Anachronos can be found inside the Temple of Ankaraj, where he's a quest giver and loot dispenser. Spellcasters who can wield a staff cross paths with them once again when obtaining the legendary staff called Dragonrath Terragos's Rest and Cataclysm. Most recently, Anachronos made an appearance in Battle for Azeroth as the main quest giver in the Maghar Orc Allied Recruitment Quest. This scenario has a ton of interesting lore information about the light and how super duper evil and stuff. But more importantly, most people forget that the Makar Ort recruitment scenario ends with some Botani and Severon escaping off into the Barrens, which likely would have led into the Barrens Warfront if not for it and all future Warfronts being cancelled after Darkshore due to people's hate for them. Finally, we have two Bronze Dragons that are also children of Nazdormu. Their names are Andormu and Nozari, and unsurprisingly, they can both be found in the Caverns of Time. Andormu and Nozari lead the factions of the Keepers of Time. And Dormu can be found in several TBC dungeons in the Cavern of Time, where he serves as a guide and a quest giver. The two dungeons he appears in are the Black Morass and Old Hillsbrad, so it's no surprise many players don't know him, since those are some of the most unpopular dungeons in the entire game. These two dungeons can be long and arduous, but are some of the most unique dungeons in the entire game, as they send players back in time. The Black Morass sees players defending Medivh as he opens the Dark Portal and escape from Darkhold Keep, sees players protecting Thrall as the Infinite Dragonfly try to mess about with the timeline. Now that we know these four family members of Nazdormu, it raises some interesting questions. Anachronos is the only known heir to the Dragonflight, but it makes sense since Nazdormu knows one day he'll become Mirazond and wants to make sure they will know who will take charge when he is lost. The biggest question for all four of these bronze dragons is do they know that Nazdormu will become Mirazond? They probably do, but still, how would you feel if you knew that your husband or father will eventually go insane and try to destroy the universe? Would they try to stop it? Would that be what makes Nazdormu go insane in the first place? Hopefully, Dragonflight can answer some of these questions. Next is the Green Dragonflight. Players should be familiar with Merithra, the daughter and current de facto leader of the Green Dragonflight since Ysera died. Merithra also has appeared in several recent expansions. However, there is one other Green Dragon who has done quite a lot in lore, and should not be forgotten about, as his name is Itharius. Itharius is an important member of the Green Dragonflight, but has kind of been doing nothing since Cataclysm. He was a very old friend of Aranicus, who was Ysera's only known consort. They were such good friends, in fact, that Itharius only woke up from sleeping in the Emerald Dream after Aranicus went insane to try and save him. 
Arenicus went insane when he entered the temple of Atal Hakar, which Ysera had charged him to govern over. Arenicus eventually sacrificed himself to help Mount Fear in Stormrange and Tyrande Whisperwind in the war against the Nightmare, redeeming himself in death. However, it is not hard to imagine that Etharius may hold a bit of a grudge against Ysera for being somewhat responsible for his best friend's death. This will be an interesting point of contention that could be expanded upon in Dragonflight, perhaps even making him a villain. Lord Etharius has made several appearances in WoW, so we'll give a brief history for him. He first appears in Vanilla, where he's a quest giver in the Swamp of Sorrows. You help him clear the temple of Atal Hakar and kill some of his fellow green dragons who have been corrupted. Etharius later appears as the Lord Etharius in Wrath of the Lich King. Here he can be found atop of the Wormless Temple, where he serves as the Green Dragonflight's ambassador. In Cataclysm, Etharius returned to the Temple of Atal Hakar, where he serves as the main quest giver in the updated dungeon. Following the final defeat of Deathwing in the Maelstrom, Etharius now resides in the Horde capital of Orgrimmar and allows members of the Horde to witness the events that transpired at the end of the Dragon Soul raid if spoken to. He next makes a brief appearance in the Deaths of Chromie scenario from Legion. In BFA, when the Void invaded the Emerald Dream, Etharius appeared with Marathra in the Emerald Dreamway. He later assisted in empowering the reforged Emerald Essence for the Heart of Azeroth. Etharius seems almost to be babysitting a flock of rather cantankerous green whelps in the classic Swamp of Sorrows. These whelps can now be found in Feralis. This pet has a 1 1000 chance of dropping from noxious whelplings, and in its description reads, Once bred and raised by the green dragon Etharius, this unique breed has settled in the jungles of Feralis. Finally, we turn our attention to the fifth and last dragonflight, the Red Dragonflight. Andre Strauss can be found in a cave off the coast of Ankaraj, the Fallen Kingdom. He was added in patch 5.3, and to date, no one has figured out why he is there. When found, he is always sleeping, and he has been that way since he was added in Mist of Bandaria. It's kind of suspicious he's still sleeping even after Sargeras' sword caused an atomic blast at the end of the Legion expansion. And that's not even to mention his proximity to the old god C'Thun. Besides, it's the Green Dragonflight's job to do the sleeping, not the Reds. There was some speculation this dragon could have been homage to one of the children of the employees at Blizzard, but this has never been confirmed. While not very important in lore, it would be interesting to finally know more about this mysterious red dragon and why he's still sleeping. Blizzard may have already set him up to do something because he makes an appearance in the book exploring Kalimdor. In the book, Zakan and Rexar meet the dragon, who insists that they call him Andre. At the end of their meeting, Zakan promises the dragon he will visit him again. This could be useful for bringing him into the plot for later. There are some other important things to point out that players have found out about this dragon. Using the Wisp in the Bottle toy and the Yellow Conservatory Scroll toy, both of which are toys from Legion, will cause Andre Strauss to stand up, however, still with a ZZZ anime. These might be bugs, or just some developers trolling the players. Andre Strauss appears again in Shadowlands. If a player with the Experimental Anima Cell toy randomly rolls and then chooses an anima power called Portal to the Unknown, they will be teleported to a random location around the universe. However, they will sometimes be teleported to him. We're sure to find out plenty of secrets about the Red Dragonflight and the Dragonflight expansion, but it would be nice if Blizzard finally addressed who exactly this dragon is. After all, as Bran Bronzebeard said, inquiring minds just got to know. World of Warcraft has countless raids, ranging from the smallest single boss raids to the biggest scene across the WoW universe. And while Wrath of Lich King is well known for its many small raids, like Eye of Eternity, Onyxia's Lair, Vault of Archivon, Obsidian Sanctum, Trial of the Crusader, and the Ruby Sanctum, it is more well known for its largest raids, which is also the largest raid in the game, and seen by a large portion of the community as the best raid in the game's history, Ulduar. Ulduar is a massive Titan facility kept guard by the various Titan Keepers in order to keep track of the planet's corruption and to contain the old god yogg -Saron. And because of this, the raid would have to be huge to compensate for the building-sized denizens towering above you like the ant you are. And while it would be easy to say Ulduar is huge because it needs huge rooms for huge bosses, which to be fair is partially true, there is a few other things that lead to the raid's overall size. Mimiron, while the smallest of the Titan Keepers, smallest of all the bosses in the raid, and possibly the smallest boss in any raid, he is not to be messed with using his giant can opening device, he summons various parts of his Voltron in order to fight you, instead of taking you on himself. And while his area is a decent size, it is not the area itself that takes up so much room, but the massive cosmic train you ride to get to his arena. Straight out of Stormwind and Ironforge, this tram covers massive distances very quickly, and unlike those trams, this one actually has you in full control when it leaves and arrives, no worry of it leaving just before you get on, unless your raid members are very funny people. This tram acts how you're supposed to get to this far remote facility, and while this section is large, it is nothing compared to the other path. 
that being the Expedition Base Camp, Iron Concourse, and Formation Grounds. This area alone is as big as many multi-boss raids, and yet this entire area is just for one boss. Starting off with you gathering your allies into various vehicles and sieging countless Iron Dwarves, Golems, and Giants, even taking on various mega-sized mechs, all leading to the eventual fight against the super tank Flame Leviathan, in a massive vehicular base siege on the gates of Ulduar. And while we could go into much more detail about this amazing boss fight, you should go to our Top 10 Fights with Vehicle Mechanics video for more in-depth details on it. The size of Ulduar is amazing to say the least, especially as many of the other large raids are full of dead zones. Locations that have nothing to do there, no trash, nothing. For example, here is the full map for the battle for Mount Hyjal. As you can see, the map is huge, and while I'm sure anyone who has done it before know the bottom half cannot be accessed, you would think at least the top half is accessible, usable, and it has some purpose to it being there, maybe some mobs and stuff, and no, not really at all. And while there is the odd mining node here and there, otherwise the rest of the raid is left just empty, with the entire raid really only taking place in a couple key locations. And really, looking back to the Wrath of Lich King raids, it really is a mix box. Naxxramas and Anxia's Lair, Recycles, Eye of Eternity, Obsidian Sanctum, and Ruby Sanctum, all just one room, Trial the Crusader, just one room, except the last boss, and the Vault of Archivon, one room per patch, all the same, just connected together. Although I guess put in with all these mediocre raids is more than enough worth it for the amazing raids that came alongside them of Old War and Ice Crown Citadel. A pair of raids that if you did not experience while they were current content, you would be doing yourself a disservice not to do it in WoW Classic. Northrend was once intended to be an entirely frozen wasteland, choosing to not give us Snow Zone 1, Snow Zone 2, Snow Zone 3, based on only the very north and south glaciers, they instead chose to also include some great north climate-like regions, like from Canada and Greenland, leading to wonderful landscapes like Boren Tundra, Howling Fjord, and the ever-amazing Grizzly Hills, the number one zone and ambience for most players. Except Shulzar Basin, which is just its own thing. But those were just the launch zones. Every expansion has their launch zones, and then their eventual post-launch zones, introduced to add new stories and content that could not be done in prior existing areas. The Burning Crusade added the Isle of Kuldanus, the Cataclysm introduced the Molten Front, Pandera the Isle of Giants, Thunder Isles, and the Timeless Isles. Warlord of Draenor added the Tanan Jungle, although that was intended to be at launch, it was added post-launch. Legion added the Broken Isles and the Three Argus Zones. Battle for Azeroth added Megagon and Ashtar, Shadowlands added Corthia and Xerath Mortis. You may have noticed I missed one expansion there. Yes, Wrath of the Lich King, the one and only expansion to have not added a new zone. An expansion so front-loaded it was able to keep people invested and preoccupied with the world without ever adding a new zone to explore. And even without any post-launch zones, it is still known for its amazing lore and zones. A favorite expansion by many players, especially with the wonderful leveling and questing experience. Wine is well known around the globe, a fermented alcoholic drink made usually of grapes that is aged for years, sometimes decades, getting better and better with the years. And at least for Christy Stockton of One More Glass with Dalaran, a city of snobby mages, the perfect place for wine snobs. Christy sells Dalaran Red, both in bottle and cast form, each with a flavor text of Improves with Age, and a duration of 365 days. These white quality drinks will actually age in your inventory, and after having purchased either the bottle or cask of Dollar and Red, and waiting an entire real year, you receive a bottle or cask of aged Dollar and Red, now green quality. And while these items are also available on the vendor, aging them yourselves, you save five times the gold. So if you really wish to get some aged Dollar and Red and are fine waiting a year, you can save a lot of gold. However, this is not all. While the vendor only sells these two versions of the drinks, you will notice the green quality versions still have a duration and flavor text. So holding on to them yet again for another year will yield you another bottle or cask of peaked dollar and red, a blue quality item that finally has its duration removed, and the flavor text, aged to perfection. And while these items have literally no actual use, they do at least let you enjoy a nice drink, either alone or with up to 24 other raid members. So, if you're entering the Frozen North and wish to have a cask of perfect wine, you may wish to buy it as soon as you have the gold. That way, the day you kill the Lich King, you have the perfect drink to celebrate with your fellow raid members. Something extremely special, proof of time. Although the fact there's no purple and then orange quality wine that ended up taking 3-4 to four years is kind of sad, really. Legendary wine is something we desperately need these days. Wrath of the Lich King had many cut features. 
the most well-known being the infamous Dance Studio, something that has become a joke in the community and even Blizzard themselves with a garrison mission referencing it. But there was many other things cut from the expansion, two of which we feel the most notable are the rune crafting system and aerial PvP combat. Wrath of the Lich King made vehicles much more of an actual mechanic on its own, with many raid fights, dungeon fights, and quests utilizing the vehicle system, so it's obvious to see why they would want to make a PvP use of it too, and while they did with the Isle of Conquest and Wintergrass for ground-based vehicles, they also planned to do so with air-based vehicles. However, for one reason or another, it was cut, seemingly pretty late into development too, as it actually made it onto the Wrath of the Lich King box art. The only time the expansion box has shown a right out lie advertising something that is not in the game, even to this very day. Although there is some argument for the Demon Hunter and the Vanilla Wall box art, that was more so just a character and not an advertised feature though. Now onto something much less known, the Death Knight rune crafting system. Originally announced at BlizzCon, the Death Knight would actually be able to customize the runes on their weapon, and not in the way you may think. As of launch, Death Knights got their own class specific enchants to add to their weapons and rune forges. However, originally it was planned to work far differently. The original Death Knight runeforging system had you, upon collecting a new weapon, go to a runeforge to transform it into a rune blade, allowing you to carve runes into it and then outside of combat be able to enchant runes into the blade. Like live, you would be given 6 rune slots with the blood, unholy, frost, and death runes. However, unlike the Death Knight we got, you would actually be able to choose whatever runes you wish to inscribe and add special enchantments to them to make them recharge faster, empower the spells consuming them, or transform into death runes, even increasing with use much like the original rogue's lockpicking skill, allowing for more and more powerful runes, meaning if you wish, you could have 6 blood runes. However, with Blizzard's goal to try and de-incentivize people choosing all of one type, they seemingly just could not make it work, and locked it to 2 of each type, putting the special effects onto the rune forging system as special weapon enchants, which overall is a good thing. While it sounds interesting, in practice it feels like it would be an absolute nightmare. Although, what would be a better fit for the relentless undead juggernauts that was the most broken class at its launch, the Death Knight? Speaking of the hero class Death Knights, they were called hero classes for a reason. A callback to the MMOs of old, a good example being the Jedi in Star Wars Galaxy, the original Star Wars MMO. This Jedi class was obscenely difficult and time consuming to obtain. Having the class originally proved you went through an insane amount of time, effort, and resources, and as a reward you gained this extremely powerful class which easily outperformed all the other classes, making you a god amongst peasants. While this worked in its time period, it's easy to see the major flaws of this. Although at the time, that was the Wrath of the Lich King's development, they decided they wanted to do this for the Death Knights as well. Originally planned, you would need to wait until Wrath of the Lich King's launch and level from 70 to 80. Upon doing so, you would then betray humanity itself and pledge allegiance to the Lich King himself. In order to do so, you'd be given a long and difficult questline in order to earn his trust and doing so you would then unlock the Death Knight hero class. And a hero class it was, as with the launch of the expansion, the Death Knight was so overpowered they could quite easily outperform an entire party with their huge defensive, damage, and self-healing capabilities. And while Blizzard quickly realized their mistake, as making a Death Knight only require this hilariously easy task of reaching level 55, and making a class that was better than the rest of them in every way, it took them quite a while to bring the class in line with all the others, nerfing them again and again before finally getting them somewhat in line with the rest of the classes. The idea of a class being overpowered as a reward for completing a difficult and time-consuming task may have worked out one time, these days, with how modern games don't like to waste your time as much as they used to, and with the internet being so easy to access, search, and compile compared to the old days of random message board rumors, it's hard to keep anything truly a secret when it's just going to be made into a step-by-step -step guide two months before release. Lastly, with the mindset growing within the community around any and every power benefit, it no longer became something you made the choice to work towards, but something that was now required, and so it had to be changed or else everyone who was not a healer would be forced to unlock and play Death Knight. In the beginning days of WoW, there was not a specific role for each spec, examples being the Feral Druid, which while sharing the same tree could be a tank or a DPS, meaning a druid saying they were Feral would not tell you what they actually were. Same for Paladins, as for a lot of early WoW, most of their time in tank spec was actually with mostly holy talents. Death Knights were the final experience of this, however, as with the very next expansion Cataclysm, they redid talents, forcing you to choose a tree to specialize into, with each of them having an assigned role, requiring you to then fill these trees to a specific point before then being able to put points into any of the other trees. So what made the Death Knight so special then? Well, the fact all three of their specs could be DPS, which is pretty common for the DPS-only classes like Rogue, Hunter, Mage, and Warlock. 
However, these three specs could also all tank, each spec having their own style of tanking and DPS. Frost focused on using the frigid winds of Northrend to slow the attack speeds of your enemies, while increasing your own, bolstering your armor with ice while slowing your enemies as well, making kiting easy, even more so with dual wielding blades and ranged casts. Blood focused on dodging and parrying attacks, and while failing to do so meant taking heavy damage, you made your health pool a resource, sacrificing health to gain resources, while also countless abilities to feed your own health pool, sacrificing your own blood to steal the blood of your opponent's lives, literally using your defense as a weapon, swarming blood worms to let your opponents dry and refill your own. And lastly, Unholy, which focused on plaguing your enemies with sickness and disease, summoning undead ghouls and gargoyles to decimate your enemies, enhancing your allies with forsaken magics, defying magic itself with barriers of anti-magic, and shields of enraged plague and bone. With each spec having its own style for not only DPS but also tanking, this meant each spec had its own niche of boss fights it was best suited for. Unholy, for its anti-magic capabilities, dealt with tanking mage-based boss fights that dealt lots of magic damage. Frost was great at dealing with physical bosses, who usually cleave through the average tank's armor. Now glanced from their tainted armor, sedated by the swirling colds. And Blood, with its ability to sustain itself when healers had issues, able to act well as an off-tank tanking constant low damage. Sometimes able to go entire fights without needing any focused healing at all, allowing for more healing to go elsewhere. Although suffering if Blood too deep. And while they all had their use as DPS as well with Frost's rapid attacks and ranged attacks and Unholy's undead and decay, Blood was the weakest of the three for DPS. Having a few good times here and there, it acted more as the best solo content spec, especially for leveling. And to end off the video on a quick fact, something few remember, but the actual Cataclysm expansion was announced at BlizzCon 2009, three and a half months before the release of Ice Crown Citadel, and then another four months until the Wrath of the Lich King's death. A major part of that being the obscenely long time getting of Ice Crown Citadel, taking three whole months from the raid's launch, for the heroic version of the raid to open. This caused quite some oddities at said BlizzCon, an example being many people asking about not the upcoming expansion, but the upcoming raid against Blizzard's most famous villain. No, not Illidan in Star Rage, he's not a villain, he's an anti-hero. The Lich King. A good example of this being that during the Cataclysm itemization panel, while speaking about changing how stats worked and what stats appeared on what gear, for example, removing mana per 5, replacing it with spirit, decided to randomly announce Shadowmourne, again in the middle of a Cataclysm itemization panel. Something that is just obscenely odd to me, really. They didn't even speak about its stats or anything to have it mesh with the panel, they just sort of announced a new legendary out of nowhere, showing just its name and appearance. Although they did later make an official preview showing the special effect it had, while explaining a general idea of the process of obtaining it through going to the raid to gather resources in order to craft it. They weirdly again did not share its stats, so just kind of odd. There are two specific NPCs that were added to WoW from Hearthstone that players have interacted with so far, and these two characters are Sky Captain Crag and Sir Fingley Murgleton. Sky Captain Crag is the first boss in the BFA Dungeon Freehold. Before his canonical introduction in Battle for Azeroth, Sky Captain Crag was a then unnamed Parrot Mount, which was first introduced as a card in the Grand Tournament, the second expansion for Hearthstone. Sky Captain Crag is a neutral legendary card with the base mana cost of 7, 4 attack, and 6 health. The Parrot he was riding on the card was later named Sharkbait and has a chance to drop his amount from the last boss of Freehold, Hardland Sweetie. Sky Captain Crag would reappear in Hearthstone expansion Galakrond's Awakening as Sky General Crag, in which he is much weaker, costing only 4 mana and having 2 attack and 3 HP. However, he can summon Sharkbait as a legendary token minion, where Sharkbait was also featured as a boss card in Galakrond's Awakening adventure campaign. Sir Finley Murgleton is the second character from Hearthstone to become canonized in WoW. In Hearthstone lore, he is a sophisticated gentleman and an accomplished scholar, who also happens to be a murloc. Sir Finley Muggleton has been involved in numerous Hearthstone expansions, but he first appeared as a major supporting character in the League of Explorers adventure, which is the third expansion for Hearthstone. He is a legendary neutral minion card that costs one mana to summon, and the battle cry allows the player to discover a new hero power. Sir Finley Muggleton later reappears in Hearthstone in the Saviors of Uldum expansion, alongside the rest of the League of Explorers to save Uldum from the League of Evil. Sir Finley is also present in both Galakrond's Awakening expansion and in the Voyage to the Sunken City expansion. He can also be found in several tavern brawls and as a battleground hero in Hearthstone. Sir Finley Murgleton's first canonical appearance in WoW is in the Legion Zone of Stormheim, where he gets caught up in some Vykral vampire pirate shenanigans as the player is leveling. He returns in the next expansion, Battle for Azeroth, as a quest giver alongside his fellow members of the Explorers League, including Elsa Starseeker, Reno Jackson, an amnesiac blue dragon, and acts as a companion in Mechagon in patch 8.2. And all of them can be seen again together during an Uldum assault in patch 8.3 
Lastly, he can be found in Vashir, where he sells a red monocle, which is needed in order to obtain the secret hive mind mount, which was also added in BFA. Hearthstone has also updated some of the actual world in World of Warcraft. Although Gadgetzan remains the same in Game Sims Cataclysm, Hearthstone has updated the desert goblin city significantly since then, and this is canonical in lore. Gadgetzan is a setting for the fifth expansion in Hearthstone, Mean Streets of Gadgetzan. In the expansion, Gadgetzan is described as having massively expanded from a small desert town to a large, bustling port city following the flooding of Tanaris during the Cataclysm. Three major crime families rule the back alleys of the newly expanded Gadgetzan, including the Grimy Goons, a mafia-style gang who control the streets, the Jade Lotus, an assassin and spy organization, and the Cabal, a Cabal which controls the ins and outs of the Mega Market. The novel Traveler, The Spiral Path, similarly reflects Gadgetzan's larger size and winding streets though none of the other new aspects portrayed in the Hearthstone expansion are present. Unfortunately, we are still stuck with a Cataclysm version of Gadgetzan, but perhaps, hopefully, that will change in the future with a new expansion focusing on a revamped Azeroth. Hearthstone has introduced one race which was later than canonically added to the game. This race is the Tortolan from WoW's seventh expansion, Battle for Azeroth. In WoW, Tortolans are a race of turtle-like humanoids native to Zandalar. However, in Hearthstone, they live in Ungoro Crater. Tortolans are from Hearthstone's fifth expansion, Journey to Ungoro, which was released in 2017. A common misconception is that Fungarians, the little mushroom people from BFA, were also introduced into Well from Hearthstone, since a number of cards introduced in the seventh Hearthstone expansion named Cobalts and Cataclombs depict an unnamed race of fungus people that resemble the Fungarians. However, statements by Blizzard employees indicate that these creatures and the Fungarians were created independently from one another, with the Fungarians being invented and named by World of Warcraft artist Christopher Hayes, as a personal passion project, whereas the Hearthstone Mushroom people were apparently created by Hearthstone concept artists when doing the initial exploration and style guide for the Hearthstone expansion, Cobalts and Catacombs. Finally, the most important piece of lore that WoW has obtained from Hearthstone has been the appearance of not one, but two old gods, Nizoth and Yasharaj. First, we'll focus on Yasharaj, the most fearsome and powerful of the old gods. He was so powerful, Amon Thul plucked him out of Azeroth and yeeted him into the Twisted Nether, creating the Well of Eternity. Yasharaj has never been directly depicted within WoW, although he is often said to have seven heads. Although long dead, when players first heard of him in the Pandaria expansion, his remnants alone caused great chaos and destruction. In the climax of Mr. Pandaria, Garrosh takes the Old God's heart and players see how insidious the dead Old God can be at the end of the Siege of Orgrimmar raid. Yasharash appears as a legendary card in the third expansion, Whispers of the Old Gods. The full card name is Yasharaz Rage Unbound, which is a 10 mana 10 10. His appearance on this card has been confirmed as canon, although the card only shows one head of him, and we do not know what his body looks like or if he has other heads. This card would later reappear in Hearthstone's 16th expansion, Madness at the Darkmoon Fair as Yasharaz a Defiler. Yasharaj is seen in several other cards for Priest and Druid cards in the Whispers of the Old God set, as well as being associated with Garrosh in the Book of Heroes. The final Old God in WoW, Nizoth, was first mentioned in Cataclysm, but it was not until BFA when players finally saw him and defeated him in the Nihilotha raid. Nizoth was chiefly responsible for corrupting Deathwing, and therefore it was he who caused the Cataclysm. Nizoth the Corrupter appears as a legendary card in the Whispers of the Old God expansion, which was the first time the Old God had been depicted in any meat. He was a 10 mana 7 4, and his flavor text reads, has not been able to get under the sea out of his head for 5,000 years. The inspirations of Nizoth's appearance in WoW came directly from this card, and the actual end boss in Isle of the Raid actually has the exact same name as the card, Nizoth the Corruptor. Similarly to Yasharaj, Nizoth reappears in the Madness of the Darkmoon Fair expansion as Nizoth, God of the Deep, but with significantly different stats. Where this time around it's a 9 mana 5 7. Nizoth has several minion cards that are related to him from the Whispers of the Old God expansion, but it would be too long and boring to list them all here. Finally, players who pre order the Mega Bundle for Madness of the Darkmoon Fair also receive Nizoth as an alternative warlock hero, whose flavor text reads When someone asks if you're an old god, you can now say yes. There are two promotions in WoW that came from Hearthstone, both of which give a mount to the player. The first mount is called the Hearthsteed, which is awarded in WoW after the player wins three games of Hearthstone in either play or arena mode. In WoW, the player will receive a mail message containing the mount from May Francis, the exotic mount dealer of Dalaran. Once the player learns the mount, they will get the special feat of strength achievement, Hearthstone. The Hearthsteed was added in Mr. Pandaria in patch 5.4, as it was around this time that Hearthstone launched. The second promotional mount crossover from Hearthstone is the flying rat mount named Sarge. Sarge is the pet mouse of Hearthstone Brew, the owner of the inn in which Hearthstone takes place. 
The mount becomes available to WoW players after they complete the Hearthstone introductory quest for the Mercenary mode. Similarly to the Hearthsteed, once WoW players learn the mount, they will get a special feat of strength achievement called Sarge's Tail. Not including Collector Edition card backs, there is also a Hearthstone promotion for playing WoW. Upon reaching 20 in WoW for the first time, a player will earn the feat of strength achievement called Fledgling Hero of Warcraft. This will unlock Lady Liadrin as a hero in Hearthstone. The achievement was added in World of Draenor and can still be obtained to this day. Character boosts do not count for this achievement, but the achievement is also earned even if the player does not have an active WoW subscription. The most obvious reference of Hearthstone and WoW are a ton of Hearthstone game boards scattered throughout Azeroth and beyond. For example, there is even a Hearthstone game board in one of the tables in the Goldshire Inn. However, seeing this game board may be a problem since there are often other things in the way, usually scantily clad things on certain servers. Other Hearthstone game boards can be found in the game in the Grimrel Depot dungeon and in the Draenor garrisons. Most Hearthstone's game boards in WoW can be found in Mr. Pandaria and the World of Drainsers expansion since that's when the game was first released. There are two Hearthstone game boards in the Vale of Eternal Blossoms, one in each faction hub, the Shrine of Seven Stars for Alliance, and the Shrine of Two Moons for Horde. At each shrine, NPCs can be seen playing Hearthstone with game boards that represent their factions. Two NPCs play, while some other NPCs are gathered around to gesture and offer advice. Periodically, there will be an arcane explosion animation signaling the end of the game. The final influence of Hearthstone and WoW is a set of four toys. These toys are the Hearth Station, the autographed Hearthstone card, the Hearthstone board, and the winning hand. The first toy is the Hearth Station toy, which when used spawns a cute little Hearthstone board in front of the player, but it also has a very long cooldown of one hour. It is one of the few toys in the game that has a different version for the Alliance and Horde. The Hearth Station toy can only be obtained during the Feast of Wintervale from underneath the Wintervale tree in the Gently Shanken Gift. The Alliance Hearth Station description reads, A gnome-improved Hearthstone experience with auto-building decks, always legendary card packs, and rounds that are over in one move. It's Hearth Station by Gnome Phone Do. While the Horde's toy description is the same, except it's a goblin-improved one and was created by Gob Fundu instead of Gnome Fundu. The Hearth Station toy was added in Legion in patch 7.3, and as a side note, this toy has suffered from a handful of bugs. When the toy was first introduced in 2017, the quest for the Gently Shaken Present had not been reset from the year prior, meaning players could not open the gift. A year later in 2018, the toy was available to players in the loot table. It wasn't until Winterville 2019 that all the bugs were finally ironed out and the toy began to drop like it was supposed to. The next Hearthstone toy is the autographed Hearthstone card. When a player uses the toy, they get an emote saying what card they received. The toy has 10 second cooldown and according to the toy's description, was signed by Trump and Wreckful, not too shabby. Which is a reference to two popular Hearthstone streamers. The autographed Hearthstone card was added in the World of the Draenor expansion and can be obtained from a special garrison mission quest called Hearthstone Tournament. Successful completions of this mission awarded the toy the Hearthstone Strategy Guide, which can be used to reroll a garrison follower's mission traits to the Hearthstone Pro trait, which increases party members' experience gained by 35%. The final two Hearthstone toys are also from World of the Draenor and can be bought from Benjamin Brode. This human NPC is named after Hearthstone's ex-senior game designer, and he wanders around your garrison. In the Horde garrison, he can be seen trying to blend in by wearing a cartoonish orc mask and talking excitedly. The Hearthstone board toy costs 1,000 gold, and the winning hand toy costs 100. Using the Hearthstone board creates the Hearthstone game board at the feet of the player, and causes the emote, throws down a Hearthstone board, who's ready to play. As a short sample, the Hearthstone's introductory music is played. The board will fade after one minute, and any player can right-click on the board to flip it, with the pieces scattering and the Hearthstone logo revealed on the board's underside. The toy uses the same model as the Hearthstone boards found in the Faction Shrine in the Vale of Eternal Blossoms. Jaina is in a strong position against Garrosh, with what appear to be two Murlocs in play and three cards still in hand. The fourth and final Hearthstone-themed toy is the Winning Hand toy. Using the toy causes a trio of fireworks to be launched over the head of the player as the victory music from Hearthstone is played. The player also performs the slash cheer emote before beginning to dance. The emote, player's name just won a game of Hearthstone, is also produced. Before we end off, there's one final thing to note. Added to the files in 8.2.5 was a map called the Hearthstone Tavern. This tavern is a replica of this one shown in the Hearth and Home cinematic and the Win or Lose cinematic short. The tavern is fully modeled and set up in game, however it is inaccessible. Even having a secondary room, a more private side to the tavern, likely for the more noble guests, as well as a massive library, filled with various books and Hearthstone collections. This tavern contains countless assets from around Azeroth to portray a tavern for adventurers from all around, while even including some unused assets, like a wonderful portrait of an archmage Antonitis. Did you know that Flask and Vanilla WoW were incredibly overpowered? 
Most people know what a flask is, as it's still one of the few consumables that is widely used in endgame content. You use one and then you get a buff of your choice that lasts for an hour, even through death, longer if you're an alchemist. And in Vanilla WoW, the process of obtaining a flask was just way more convoluted and difficult that they probably made it more powerful to compensate. Flasks required Black Lotus in order to make, which were on strict shared zone cooldowns, so there was a limited amount that you could even farm on a server per hour. You also could only craft a flask at an alchemist table, which could only be found inside Skolomance or Blackwing Lair, which required you to run a raid or dungeon in order to even get to them. And even worse, before 1.7, if you spent all this time to get a flask and used it, and then died, it would go away. As flasks would not persist on death until patch 1.7 fixed this abysmal idea. So because the design philosophy behind flasks, whether they were enormously expensive buff that not everybody could use, the stats on them were definitely worth all the effort. The flask of supreme power from Vanilla WoW gave a plus 150 spell power bonus for 2 hours. To put how huge of a bonus this is into perspective, in the next expansion of the Burning Crusade, the flask which gave spell power only gave a plus 80, and only worked for specific schools of magic. If you wanted the flask that worked for all spell power, that was only a plus 70. And even in Wrath of the Lich King, the spell power flask only gave a plus 125. And Wrath was also when they reduced the base duration of flask to 1 hour, down from 2 hours. And since this was before there were stat squishes every other expansion, this did mean that a flask from Vanilla WoW was actually better than an endgame flask from Wrath of the Lich King, two expansions and power creep worth of gear later. Although this does not mean there were people using a vanilla flask in Wrath of the Lich King, because Blizzard nerfed the vanilla flask during Burning Crusades patch 2.1 to only provide a plus 70 spell power bonus. That way they wouldn't be better than the Burning Crusade flask. So if the bonus of the flask from Vanilla WoW was actually higher than the flask from Wrath of the Lich King, that should tell you how powerful the original vanilla flask was and why guilds were able to blow through content in Classic WoW when they were going into these raids and dungeons with full world buffs and full consumables like the old school flask. Next up, let's go over a fun little fact about how stats are distributed. When it comes to a piece of equipment, some of them have a lot more stats than the other ones, but it's kind of surprising just how much better some pieces of equipment are. When it comes to items that have the most amount of stats, we have the helmet, chest, legs, which come in second behind the necklaces and rings. Ever since Legion, Blizzard has done this thing with necklaces and rings, where they just put a whole bunch of secondary stats on them, in lieu of primary stats. Generally, a primary stat is more valuable per point than any secondary stat, but over the years the primary stats have gone down in value when compared to the secondaries. So, if you take the primary stat on a helmet, add all of its secondary stats, and then compare it to the secondary stats of a ring, it actually has 10% less stats overall. Although if you add stamina into the mix, then it kind of balances out when it comes to the stat distribution. And outside of the five power items which have the most stats, second place is the shoulders, gloves, belts, and boots. These four items have 25% less stats on them total than the previous ones. And then we have the capes and bracers, which have the least amount of stats out of everything, having almost 45% less stats than the helmet, chest, and legs. And then when it comes to weapons, a main hand plus offhand combo has about the same amount of stats as a two-handed weapon, which has about three times as much stats as a helmet, chest, or leg. Definitely making your two-handed weapon the highest stat stick you can obtain, which is why getting a better weapon is usually a huge upgrade, and why they tried to limit Fury Warriors so much because they can use two of them. So if you're crafting specific pieces of gear to fit a specific slot, like say a Shadowlands Legendary, and want to get the biggest upgrade of stats, just remember the helmet, chest, and legs technically have the most amount of stats. The rings and necklaces are just about the same, but are heavily inflated in secondary stats. Then you have the shoulders, gloves, belts, and boots, which are 25% below the previous five, and at the very bottom you have capes and bracers, which is 45% below the higher slots, making them the lowest amount of upgrades you can get, where you would need five bracers to match the stats of a two-handed weapon. And just a side note, seeing how random this information is, you can definitely see why it belongs in a video like the unknown side of WoW, and would probably never come up in a more conventional video. In Boralis, there's a group of cadets under a building playing a game of D&D. The four characters are standing around the table with one of them having a big screen in front of them, 
obviously making that person the Game Master, and they have quite a bit of unique dialogues, all of which are references to Dungeons & Dragons. Like the Game Master having to tell them that Bard isn't a class, as pretty much every other main class from Dungeons & Dragons is also in World of Warcraft, except for the Bard and Artificer classes. Bards, of course, being a spellcaster who uses music and talking as part of their weapon arsenal, as well as other normal magic and other normal melee abilities, while Artificer is basically just a tinker. Although, there are many other dialogues that just reference common D&D things, like the quote, Stop antagonizing the quest giver, is a reference to D&D murder hobos, a term for players who constantly kill everything they come into contact with, including the game's versions of quest givers. Because in D&D, you can do basically whatever you want, and sometimes what players want to do is kill everything they come into contact with. But that usually involves antagonizing the quest giver first, so that they have a reason to kill them. It's generally a frowned upon term, but happens enough where it has its own term, the murder hobo. There is also a line, can the guard see me looting this body? Because in D&D, looting has a little bit more consequences than it does in WoW. As if you start looting the bodies of dead villagers in front of guards, there's a good chance they won't let you do that and might attack you or put you in jail. But players who are used to playing video games are generally stereotyped into wanting to loot everything they come across, which is what this line is referencing. The line, I cast Frostbolt into the darkness, is a reference to the famous I attack the darkness D&D meme, popularized by a machinima created by people who created the game Summoner, in which it depicts a sketch of four people playing D&D, with two of the people being new players and confused by the rules, with one of them stating that he wants to use one of his magical abilities to attack the darkness, which is a nonsense thing to attack. I I'm attacking the darkness! <laughs> <laughs> There's also another reference in WoW, a quest that takes place in the Blood Mist Isle called I Shoot Magic Into the Darkness, where you run around and kill void creatures. And also, by the way, I actually have a D&D &D channel if you ever want to watch some D&D &D videos. I'm sure most people know that a lot of spells and buffs used to have reagents attached to them, where you need specific items in your bag in order to use them. Usually, they were only required for buffs that affected a large amount of people, like a Gift of the Wild, for example, which used to give everyone in your raid the Mark of the Wild buff. And usually, only the mass AoE buffs required a reagent, as I guess it was a way to make it so that you would actually prefer to use some of the normal target single buffs on yourself, and not just use the AoE buff for everything. And nowadays, if a class does have any kind of buff they can give another player, it's automatically an AoE buff when they use it. However, for a very short time in Vanilla WoW, Blizzard tried adding reagents to a lot of single target major buffs in the game, more specifically the final ranks of Mark of the Wild, Arcane Intellect, and Power Word Fortitude. In patch 1.1, Blizzard added reagent requirements to these three spells, as lots of spells of Vanilla WoW had reagents, so it kind of made sense. Although immediately in the very next minor patch, in patch 1.1.1, they removed the reagent requirements from these three spells because people were used to being able to use them whenever they wanted and didn't like having to spend a whole bunch of reagents on the single target versions of their spells. And this is something that a lot of people probably don't even know about, since this was only in the game for a very short while. And the 2019 Classic WoW never had any reagents on their max level versions of spells, since it was kind of a bad idea that was reversed pretty quickly. In Vanilla WoW, there's a secret quest chain that you can acquire randomly by collecting various messages and bottles along the shore of Stranglethorn. Normally, these lost messages might have random junk inside of them. Sometimes they have letters detailing the captivity of a princess stuck on an island, and one of those will give you a quest called Message in a Bottle. When you finally obtain the quest, you get a message which reads, The note reads in fairly good handwriting. To any that can aid me, please, my need for help is dire. A great sky main holds me captive on an island in the South Seas. The stars at night are foreign to me and obscured by the jungle trees. But on the clearest days, I see wild shore to the northwest, and what seem to be large sailing ships to the southwest. I beg of you, my would-be savior, please help me. If you swim over to Jaguro Isle, you'll eventually be able to find the person who wrote the note, who was a female torn princess. It will tell you that she has been imprisoned by the great sky main King Mukla and that he commands all of the beasts of the island, and that if you are to free her, you need to defeat King Mukla and get the key to her chains. However, King Mukla was a level 51 elite, whereas the quest itself only requires level 45 to accept it. So you definitely needed to group up in order to defeat the giant ape, because of both the 6th level difference and the elite status. Once you manage to defeat King Mukla, you'll be awarded with a ring that has a whole bunch of stamina on it, and she'll thank you for freeing her. This short quest chain isn't really necessary to complete if you're questing through the zone, 
And in fact, I'm sure a lot of classic WoW guides will tell you to avoid the quest line because it's so difficult. So, I'm sure there's many people who've never actually completed it. In Cataclysm, when they updated the zone, they actually kept the quest chain in, and just extended it by adding a couple of other side quests to the main one, where you go and defeat some of the creatures on the island, as well as get back some of the princess's items. Paired with the fact that King Mukla is no longer a much higher level creature, as early WoW used to like to balance the hard NPCs by just making them a higher level than everything else. With the update, it's now an appropriate level as everything else, and no longer an elite. So, much easier to kill by yourself. Also, one last thing. This quest chain is most likely a reference to King Kong, since it's a giant gorilla who has a captive princess. During the Sanctum of Domination main questline for Shadowlands, you have a quest which will send you into Torghast in order to collect Uther's soul. However, when you go into the room which houses Uther's soul fragment, there are a whole bunch of other soul fragments right next to it that don't have any specific names on them, but instead have almost poetic nicknames. And based on the lore of where you're at, it's possible to guess exactly who each of these soul fragments belonged to when they were stolen by the Frostmourne. So, with the context of it being things that Arthas probably killed himself, and all of them being major lore characters, it's not that hard to figure them out, as players did immediately after this quest went live. The Archmagus Mentor is most likely a reference to Antonidas, who was the leader of Dalaran and killed by Arthas when he sacked the city in order to get the Book of Medivh needed to summon Archimon. The Betrayed Father is obviously Arthas' father, Terranus Minethel II, who he succeeded in a very famous cinematic in Warcraft 3. The Blood Queen is obviously Blood Queen Lanethel, who was one of the bosses in ICC, and was killed by Arthas during his Northrend excursion when he was fighting against Illidan's forces, including Kel'Thuzad's Blood Elves, then transforming them into the vampire-like Sandlion we see within the raid. The Champion of Peace is most likely the character Gavinrad, who was one of the original first five paladins created during the Second War, and was the one who gave Arthas his hammer known as the Lights of Vengeance, and was then killed by Arthas when he was defending the buried remains of Kel'Thuzad. The first paladin is obviously Uther the Lightbringer, the main reason you're on this quest. The Golden King is Anastarian Sunstrider, who was Kel'Thas' dad and was killed by Arthas personally after he dared wounded Invincible while the undead sacked Silvermoon. The Grand Magister is another blood elf, this time Belovir Solinar. Belover was the Grand Magister prior to Romoth, and took charge of defending Silvermoon after Sylvanas was killed, who was then slain by Arthas shortly after teleporting Lady Leodrin to safety. The Guardian of Naxxramas is Sapphirion, who was the dragon boss of Naxxramas, and in life was an ancient blue dragon, who was one of the oldest of the blue dragon flight alongside Malagos. He was killed by Arthas and Anubarak when they wanted his magical artifacts and raided his lair. And finally, there's the Holy Lifebringer, which most likely belongs to Halak, who was a human paladin that led the Circle of Holy Light, a resistance force that tried to cleanse the ruins of Lord Aran of Undead and reclaim the city until he was killed by Arthas and Sylvanas, and then his soul tortured eternally within the blade until his will broke, and he cursed the light, abandoning it. He is also seen again in a questline for the Frost Death Knight, who, alongside his brothers and sisters of the Circle Hand, try in their cursed undeath to stop you from reforging Frostmourne. So there are a lot of pretty important people housed here, and it's just kind of a backdropping to a quest that many people probably didn't even notice. You don't even actually need to interact with any of them, which makes it a really nice lore easter egg to people who were probably able to guess all of them. As personally, I could only guess about 75% of them when I first did the quest, so kudos to the people who figured out the rest of them later. The Filthy Slime is a hidden battle pet that was added in BFA that came from Tol de Gore, and is only available in Mythic Difficulty. After entering the dungeon and defeating the first boss, keep going and clear out all the trash leading up to the first floor. While going there, you need to keep an eye out for a discarded key, which spawns in random locations and are quite easy to miss, but this step can actually be skipped if your group contains a rogue, or someone with a profession who can open locks. Then, using your party member or key on a special cell it will unlock, and after going through a hole in the wall, you'll arrive in a room that has a bucket. It'll spawn an elemental named Golthan the Maladorus, and after killing it, the pet has a chance to drop. It is personal loot like everything else and is not guaranteed to drop, as it's only roughly around an 11% chance. But it can be bought on the auction house if you don't want to farm it, or if you just get really unlucky. And now, let's go over a small but worthwhile lore character named Warbrave Oro. Aura was an NPC that was very popular in Legion, as he was one of the NPCs that arrived in Dalaran to ask for help with the High Mountain tribe. When the Riverbend is under attack by the Drogbar, Aura arrives in time to defend the village along with the player. But Dargrul uses the Hammer of Kazgaroth and destroys most of the Riverbend, 
with Oro getting stuck inside a stone fist that he needs help being broken out of. Oro tries to get revenge and kill Dargol, so with the help of a small group of other war braves and the player, he confronts Dargol inside the Bite Stone Enclave. But Dargol uses the hammer once more and instantly kills the entire group, except for you, by impaling all of them in earthen spikes. Oro had a family that lived at a place called Oro's Overlook, and after his death, Oro's wife, Kura, said that she knows that he wouldn't want her to lose herself in sadness. And it's speculated that Oro's youngest son doesn't actually know his dad had died fighting. As a special tribute to him, a memorial note can be found at a shrine in the Snowblind Mesa, which reads, Dearest Oro, husband, father, and loyal servant of the River Main and High Mountain tribes, you shall always be remembered and loved. In Shadowlands, Oro actually traveled to Bastion, and his spirit can be found in the Aspirant's Crucible. If you decide to speak to him, he says how he hopes that his family is doing well, and he's basically moved on from the fact that he died. While most players probably forgot Warbrave Oro even existed, Legion was an expansion that was very heavy on storytelling, with a lot of tragedy to Azeroth and the heroes of it, with Warbrave Oro being one of the many who died during the expansion. The Zellywag ATV is a unique mount that was added in BFA that requires two parts in order to craft. The first being the supercharged engine, which is crafted from a schematic that has a chance to drop from the boss named Kujo in Operation Mechagon. And the second being the monolite reinforced chassis, which is crafted by blacksmiths. The unique effect with this mount is the fact that you can actually change the color of it. Very similar to the X995 Mechanicat, the player can obtain bottles that cover Mechagon, called Nuclear Red, Goblin Green, and Electric Blue, all changing color to their respective names. With Nuclear Red coming from certain lockboxes in the western spray area of Mechagon, Goblin Green coming from random chests in Mechagon, and Electric Blue, which has a chance to be inside the small metal box, which also comes from a chest. And as a note as well, Zillywag is just Gallywick spelled backwards. And even though this mount has two seats, for some reason it's a single person mount. Possibly an oversight by Blizzard, but I guess we'll never know. Although, some theories, as it uses the same skeleton as the airship mounts, which are two person mounts, it may have originally planned to have been the same thing. Although there is the Dreadwake which uses the same skeleton as well, and it is also a one person mount, but at least that one only has one seat. The mount special animation also has it firing non-existent cannons like the others as well. Now, for a small little easter egg dimension. This one in Warlords of Draenor's Grimrail Depot dungeon. And here, there's an invisible wall along the rafters which you can jump over to get onto a lower beam. Then, when you get near the ending of the beam, there's a cart stuck in the wall along with a few other things like a cage, a wizard's hat, an open trunk, and a white owl flying. With it being platform 9 fourths, with the inclusion of a sign along with all the other things behind it, this has been confirmed to be a reference to the Harry Potter series, in which the students would approach platform 9 fourths through a wall that appears solid but turns out to be illusionary, with the White Owl as a pretty obvious reference to Hedwing from the series as well. It's quite popular for players to do certain emotes at NPCs, specifically city guards, and watch the reactions with emotes like slash wave, slash rude, or slash salute for example. But this actually doesn't apply to all guards, such as the Darnassus Sentinels. See, when they were actually alive, they didn't respond to players doing any emotes, and even if you used emotes on the same guard over and over, they wouldn't do anything back to the player no matter what the emote was. However, if you asked one of the Darnassa Sentinels where you could find the Enchanting Trainer, it was possible for her to respond with a hidden dialogue as if you said she was enchanting. As a fun note, if a Blood Elf uses slash I on a Silver Moon City Guardian, they will bow in response, although they will kneel if you were on a Paladin, and if you slash salute, they will do so back. They will also flex if you use slash shy on them, and if you slash kiss them, they will bow as well and if you slash flap or slash chicken, they will point at you in judgment. And now, for an enemy. If you type slash dance on the regular ghost in Stratholm, they'll start to dance too, even if you're attacking them. Even after attacking them, slash dance will make them dance with you and stop attacking. Slash bowing will concede your combat and cause them to evade and disengage from combat as well. You can also slash root on them, although they simply just do it back to you. Two unique hidden items that can only be obtained in Pandaria are known as the Ancient Pandaren Fishing Charm and the Ancient Pandaren Mining Pick. The Ancient Pandaren Fishing Charm is an item that you can get by speaking to a rare mob in the Valley of the Four Winds called the Ghostly Pandaren Fisherman. After speaking to him but not killing him and selecting all the dialogue options, 
he'll reward you with a charm. The charm grants you an additional chance to get more fish from pools in Pandaria and lasts for one hour. The unique part about this is you will always get fishes from pools as the fishing skill isn't important anymore, along with this charm having an unlimited amount of charges, giving it infinite usage by the person who wants it. And the ancient Pandaren mining pick is another hidden item in Pandaria, and unlike other pickaxes which only grant you plus 10 to mining, this one also gives you a chance to find gems while mining on top of the plus 10, even while not equipped making it quite the powerful mining pick. However, there's an invisible flag that's done by Blizzard that makes it so once you pick up the pickaxe, you can never pick it up on any character again, ever. But that's not a big deal, seeing as it's buying on account item, allowing you to send it to any of your other characters. So if you accidentally sold it, you could collect another and send it to your miner. StarCraft, another one of Blizzard's franchises, is quite famous. And so, of course, it has many references to it in WoW. First off, it has a fair few battle pets from StarCraft. Zeradar, the Archon. An Archon being a being that's created by combining High and Dark Templars. His name is a being combination of Tassadar and Zeratul, two of the most well-known Protoss Templars. And this is obtained from the Legacy of the Void Collector's Edition. Next is Grunty, a murloc baby with a marine suit and a Goss rifle, who came from BlizzCon 2009, to those who attended in person, or got the DirecTV pay-per-view of it. The Zergling pet is a very disgustingly horrible rendition of what the Zergling look like in StarCraft, coming as one of the pets from Vanilla WoW's Collector's Edition. Next is the Baneling, which is a much better looking version of a Zerg unit, and funny enough, one that evolves from the Zergling. This comes from StarCraft II Heart of the Swarm's Collector's Edition, and the last pet reference is the Mini Thor, which comes from StarCraft II's Base Games Collector's Edition. Now, before we move on, a couple more minor references. Lord Marshal Raynor, who took part in the opening of the Dark Portal event when Vanilla moved to TBC, is a reference to Marshal Jim Raynor, one of the major main characters in the franchise. Next, we have Pro Toss, an achievement given to raid groups who killed Shadowlands Iskar and Hellfire Citadel without anyone holding the eye of Anzu for more than five seconds in a row. This being an obvious reference to the Protoss race. And while speaking of Protoss, we have a famous voice line as a quest, we must construct additional pylons. A famous line said by Protoss narrator when you try to create a unit without having enough supply. As to increase your max unit count, you must construct additional pylons. Funny enough, becoming so mainstream and even made it into the card game Cards Against Humanity. And lastly, the Sky Golem. As well as most striders used by goblins have a computer screen. One of which has the face of Sarah Kerrigan, the Queen of Blades on it. The face of Starcraft's Brood War expansion. And really, as this is rather out in the open, it seems almost too easy to see and too obviously out of place to be an easter egg. Located on a small tip of land just east of the Firewing Point in the Terracar Forest is an NPC named David Wayne. Unless you have the quest chain which would send you to him, then he simply has a couple of dialogue options which basically state that he was part of the Sons of Lothar, and then decided to head on his own as he thought he should be part of something larger. If you do his quest chain, it's a very long series of events which send you into four separate dungeons to collect items, which will eventually culminate in creating a weapon that has a lot of extra attack power when fighting against demons. And the stats on the weapon are about equivalent to an epic quality item when fighting demons, despite the fact that all of the weapons are of blue quality. Although, with how many dungeons you have to run in order to forge the weapon, there's a good chance you would have found a better weapon by the time you've completed the quest chain, so it was never a necessary thing to do or even really that good once you got to the content that involved killing demons in the Burning Crusade. And there's a Hearthstone card called the Master Swordsmith, which shows David Wayne crafting the demonic blade in its artwork. Now, here's what's notable about this NPC. He was theorized to be the second son of Alexandros Morgrain. In Vanilla WoW, there were some pieces of lore that stated that the second son of Alexandros was living in the Outland, and would be able to reform the Ashbringer. Because remember, they had originally planned on giving players the Ashbringer and Vanilla WoW before changing their mind. So, there was a lot of groundwork laid for the eventual reveal of the Ashbringer that they eventually abandoned and never did anything with until Legion. So, players speculated that this master blacksmith, who helped to create weapons that are really good against demons, was the most likely candidate to be the second son of the previous wielder of the Ashbringer, based on those rumors. However, once Wrath of Lich King came out, it was revealed that Darian Morgrain was actually the second son, and we meet him immediately upon doing the Death Knight intro scenario. 
Now, let's look over the hidden story of Caretaker Delandris. Located near Honor Hold is an NPC who tends the gravestones, which many Alliance players will be familiar with if they've ever died in the Outlands. There are no quests that send you to Caretaker Delandris, and there's no special lore associated to him either. He just simply walks around the gravestones, and occasionally will place flowers on top of them. If you go up and talk to him, he'll tell you that he was actually born in Outlands, and as a boy, he always dreamed about going back to his homeland of Azeroth, and had heard all kinds of stories about how much nicer it was, with actual grass, oceans, and big blue skies. Unfortunately, both of his parents passed away when he was young, and as he grew up, he joined the Sons of Lothar, and took it upon himself to take care of his parents' gravestones, as well as all the others from the family members lost at Honor Hole. And he laments that he no longer wishes to leave this place, as it's his duty to take care of this one little job, as there's even piles of gravestones nearby waiting to be used, as Outlands is a pretty dangerous place. Now, there's nothing really else known about Caretanger Delandris. There's not even really a reason to talk to him. He was basically put in by Blizzard in order to fill out the world more. And there's lots of NPCs like this, which is one of the joys at looking at the unknown side of WoW. And now for some information about the earliest versions of the game. Did you know Paladins did not have a taunt in Vanilla WoW at all? And the reason they didn't have a taunt is actually kind of funny. Some Blizzard class designers from the time said they intended for the Protection Paladin to have the ability to tank, but they were afraid that it would be too powerful. You see, Paladins were kind of rushed out in WoW's launch, as they had a whole bunch of reworks right as the game went live and they had no time to actually test any of them. So Paladins were kind of infamous for being incredibly weak on the damage front. But even with this, they thought Paladins were going to be too strong because they could heal themselves. And they said that the biggest reason they didn't give them a taunt is because they thought a Paladin would just tank everything and then heal themselves up and they would be too overpowered. Once they saw players in raids though, they knew this wasn't actually a concern at all. That's why the Burning Crusade, they gave them the ever so important taunt abilities and even allowed them to have the niche of being the AoE tank, which made Paladins one of the best tanks to have for dungeon runs. It's kind of funny that they thought having the ability to heal would make them too good as a tank. But really, that cast time on healing made it not really a viable thing to do at all, and a paladin wouldn't heal themselves unless it was an instant cast, or they had some way to bubble or literally crowd control an entire group of mobs first, as you can't use any of your passive mitigation while casting either, which means you take extra damage while channeling or casting abilities because you can't dodge, parry, or block. And now, let's take a look at a forgotten and named NPC. Located in the southern portion of the Hellfire Peninsula, walking back and forth on a broken bridge segment that is not accessible until you get a flying mount, is an NPC named Warboss Necrog. It's just a lone fell orc that walks back and forth, doesn't have any dialogues or quests associated to him, his name isn't a reference to anything, and he's not important to lore. However, he did have a quest associated to him in the Burning Crusades beta. There was actually a whole quest chain surrounding this area, and a couple of the quests in that 10 quest long chain directly involved interacting with war boss Necrog. Basically, he was a leader of some of the fell orcs in the area, and had taken a scout captive. So what you were supposed to do was build a bomb and use it in order to get his attention, which would cause him to climb down from the bridge in order to investigate, which then would allow you to attack him in order to recover the key necessary to free the scout. And seeing as there were Horde and Alliance versions of this quest chain, it's kind of a wonder why they removed it from the live version of the game. It could be because the lore is kind of spotty. Warboss Necrog is said to be a commander of some of the fell orcs in the area, even though they all work under the Shattered Hand Clan in Kargath Bladefist. Or it could be because the quest was kind of complicated. In order to obtain the quest line, you had to find a random item and then use a bomb when the NPC was close to the area, since it did patrol back and forth which maybe caused some pathing issues with having to climb down from an inaccessible vantage point from really high up. He's like 50 yards in the air. Or it could be any number of reasons. We don't actually know why it was removed. Just that when it was removed, they left the named NPC in the game, still walking in his pathing location. It probably even still has the programming from the quest on the NPC. But since there's no way to trigger it, it's relegated to lost and forgotten status kind of out of the way too for people to even notice him, and not an NPC you can even fight until higher levels when you unlock flying when he's no longer even a challenge. And now for the hidden side of WoW. Located on the southern edge of the Hellfire Peninsula is an object called the Jar of Ashes right in front of a skeleton. The skeleton is commonly called the Hellfire Peon in the WoW community, 
And if you click on the jar of ashes in front of him, you'll get a bit of flavor text, which reads, Here is a jar of ashes. These are the ashes of my sanity, my passion, and my drive. All utterly destroyed by themselves. May all those who look upon these desolated lands of Hellfire remember this fallen peon. He shed blood for the Alliance and sacrificed for the Horde, only to be driven utterly mad by the wicked and soulless ones who devoured what he held most dear. As they feast from his toils, may they suffer his wrath. Maybe not in this world, but in every world hereafter. It is my declaration, my solemn oath, and my everlasting promise. I will avenge my suffering. Now, this little piece of flavor text doesn't really relate to anything specific in lore. And it's just another piece of flavor added to give more personality to the zone that you can discover. As this little jar is located way out of the way, and while it is accessible to players without flying mounts, it's hard pressed to actually go to this location accidentally. So it's just a nice little easter egg of someone in Hellfire Peninsula who probably died in some terrible way that made him just hate the world and write a very lengthy, passionate letter. There is some speculation about what this could be relating to though. Shortly before the Burning Crusade launched, a CM on the WoW forums left the company after going on a bit of a rant. You see, in the era of the end of Classic and the hype for the new first expansion, the Burning Crusade, World of Warcraft was receiving a lot of attention. Way more than the WoW development team probably expected they would ever get. As it just continuously got bigger every month and wouldn't stop growing until Cataclysm when it hit its peak. And so during the early transition period, when they were having a huge wave of people hitting the forums before they'd hired the appropriate amount of staff to deal with them, the people who were there before weren't really expecting to have to deal with a massive amount of trolls. And so it caused a couple of incidents with some of the CMs, and the CM Tesserek in particular wrote out the following in response to people calling him a douchebag in a way that circumvented the profanity filter, and he lashed out at that person. When some of the other people in the forums then started making fun of him for defending himself, this was his response. Can't help it. Posted impassionately, they say you don't care. Posted nothing, they say you ignore. Posting with passion, you incite trolls. Posting fluff, you say nonsense. Post with facts you have, they whittled down with rationale. There is no win. There is only slow degradation. Take note. It is the first and only time you'll see someone in my position make that position. You can be me when I'm gone. And then after this, he was called out for being unprofessional. And this was his response to those lines of messages. When you can understand how a group of belligerent and angry posters can drive away people from this game with an uncrafted and improvisational campaign of misery and spin doctoring, then perhaps you can understand the decisions I make. Until you face mobs of psychology, you will not see my side. Until you see some bright-eyed player coming into the forums wanting to know what they should spec as this class, and see them shat on and driven away by petty and selfish people who are simply leveraging for game buffs, you will not understand. You will not understand until you see it daily, for years. Until you understand that many people will trot over you to get where they're going, or to get what they want. Until you understand that so many people will agree completely, 100% with a loud, vulgar, and assertive individual, not because he is right, but because he is taking a stand against the man. To take no critical thought in what they say, but simply to hop on board. Until you actually try to acknowledge those who do not speak on the forums, for whatever reason they have, you will not understand. If you think an archaic business formula like the customer is always right works, you fail to understand customers, not a customer. It is a collective. No one person, even myself, is truly above the whole. I simply have the unfortunate quality of being easily singled out. Now, while nothing he said is quoted directly in the flavor text, it is pretty easy to see where the parallels come with people thinking this line of flavor text is in response to Tesseric. As it's really easy to associate the wickedness and soulless ones who devoured what they held most dear to just be a parallel to the trolls on the WoW forums. And the second line about how they destroyed his sanity and passion is also pretty similar to his post about passion. And seeing as the Burning Crusade launched shortly after Tesseric left the company, it could be easy to assume that this was put in game by a fellow game developer who agreed with the things he said in the WoW forums. It's doubtful that ASEUM had the power to put this in the game himself before leaving, which is what a lot of people theorize, and we also don't know if he was fired or left on his own terms. 
but it is a popular theory that this is in reference to Tesseract and his rant on the forums, and it's pretty easy to see the parallels after reading all of his dialogues, of which I only posted a small handful. And what's also pretty hilarious about this rant is how much it relates to World of Warcraft even in the modern day. If you heard someone say what he said today, it wouldn't seem out of place at all, which is kind of funny that even in the golden era of WoW, people were very angry about the game all the time, and the constant toxic posts in the WoW forums drove the CMs crazy. We all know kobolds, and we all know their famous line, you know take candle. But do you know why they are so protective of their candles? Well, it first requires me going over quickly a little theoretical experiment called the Five Monkeys Experiment. Five monkeys are put into an enclosure with a ladder in the center and bananas hanging over it. If any monkey was trying to go to the top, they would all be sprayed with cold water. Because of this, the monkeys learned that no one is allowed to go up because bad stuff will happen. Then the researchers would replace the monkeys one at a time. If any of the new monkeys tried to go up, the others would then stop them, warning of the dangers if they tried to climb the ladder and just kind of pull them down. And the researchers kept replacing them one by one until all of the monkeys who were present know to never go up the ladder and that it is dangerous. Even though at this point, none of the monkeys know what happens if you go up the ladder, and the water has long since been turned off. They still prevent others from performing the same action. Now, how does this relate to the kobolds? Well, during Legion, players were able to do a side quest within High Mountain, and this quest line had us dealing with the blue wax kobolds. And just like the kobolds we know, they have an obsession with their candles. But these kobolds have good reason, for within the cave you find an altar of the candles, and if you dare blow them out, a large void-like being called the Devourer Darkness appears from within the shadows and attacks you. We learn more about this from Kit Brightwick, a kobold within the cave. I know stop candle making, unless you want a story? Kobolds live here a long time, make home in nooks, catch rats, sometimes eat them, dig for treasures, trade with harpies. They like shinies, we like wax, fresh from ear is best. One day Drogbar come in, say cave is theirs. They smash and scare, we take candles and hide. Drogbar big and stupid, they have cave but no have candle. Darkness finds them, darkness follows them, darkness swallows them whole. We come back, we have candles, cave ours again, candles keep us safe. This lines up well with a few other creatures of the old gods, being that of Ulganeth, a minion sent by the Old Gods to capture High Mountain, trapped there with wards by Hul High Mountain, eventually breaking free as the wards weaken, but was beaten by the Horde in the High Mountain recruitment quest, and even more so by the Darkness in Hearthstone, a card that when summoned slumbers as candles keep it at bay. But if all three candles are drawn and extinguished, it is then summoned, a massive destructive beast that can tear through enemies. So what does it have to do with the five monkeys? Well, while the Blue Wax Kobolds still have to worry about the impending Void Beast because of the unique situation of High Mountain, its caves apparently filled with the beans of the Old Gods. The rest of Azeroth does not. People are mostly free to wander caves without worry of being attacked by the Void, something that was likely not as common during the Black Empire's reign or for a while afterwards. And the Kobolds are an ancient race, so they still pass down the requirement to wear candles within their caves, fearing the dangers that lurk in the shadows ready to tear their minds and souls to shreds knowing that if I take off my candle, I die. Even if the danger is no longer there anymore, the kobolds in other parts of the world still keep with the tradition, even if they don't actually know why they do it. We all know the old gods of Azeroth, Cthulhu the Eye, yogg the Maw, Yasharaj the Head, and Nizoth the Tendril. However, there has always been hints at a hidden fifth old god within Azeroth, including Zalateth or better known as Naifu by the community, possibly having been one as well. However, come Chronicles Volume 3, we were given a rather amazing looking page showing some rather simple and yet wonderful artwork of the Old Gods. In the bottom right, you can see Nizoth, his tendrils leading into a watery detail, then connecting to a massive pillar of various Old God structures, including many insects and Karaji, eventually leading to Cthulhu within the center. Returning back down the left side, it leads to a mass of rock and cliffs, and jagged stone, maybe even ice, until we reach Yogg-Saron. Going up from it, we get more insects and twisted buildings before reaching Yasharaj, and its massive serpent-like body crawling all the way up to the page. But then the real big thing is in the top right. First off, we start with a massive Cthulhu-like head, straight out of H.P. Lovecraft. 
a pair of wings, and massive amounts of tendrils. Until you look closer, these are not tendrils, and actually vines. Covered in leaves, these tendrils are surrounding piles upon piles of skeletons. What could this mean? Well, it could mean there might be a hidden old god, one that has powers over both life, represented by nature, and death, represented by the skulls. And while this is just a minor detail in one page of Chronicles, meaning it could just be a mistake, or mean nothing, it does seem odd that they would add this detail when they could have added literally anything else. A tiny detail that many have missed, but could lead to a massive revelation within the Old God's lore on Azeroth. Next, we'll talk about the continents of Azeroth. Originally, Azeroth had one massive continent. This continent included all of the land masses of Azeroth we know today, although it is confirmed that while there were more land masses, this one was the largest. During the War of the Ancients, the Well of Eternity in the center, a hole filled with the planet's blood that was created when the Titans tore Yashiraj out of the crust, was destroyed. This massive world-shattering explosion is what created the Azeroth we know of today. Huge amounts of land was destroyed, pushed below the sea, and yet somehow the land does not make sense. The shapes of the land seem far too oddly shaped. Chunks of land that should not have collapsed seemingly did, and weird parts of chunks of land, islands near the center that somehow survived. Well, these landscapes surviving are likely thanks to the old gods. See, the old gods are like trees. Their main bodies sit at the center, but their tendrils, their roots, they seep deep into the planet, and very far too. The Emerald Nightmare, for example, exists because of these tendrils. Yagsaran, all the way in the north of Olduar, was able to reach the newly created world tree within Grizzly Hills, and because of this, it was granted away into the Emerald Dream. And all the old gods have these roots. We have this nice map from Chronicles that details the territories that each old god controlled. This map giving us some insight into where the old god's roots may have been able to expand. And they are awfully close to the general shape of the different continents. Especially since this map is the visual before the old gods were able to be captured and contain the elemental lords. Allowing them to expand into their territory. And these roots may have been the main reason, or at least helped, in holding the continents we know together. Which, funny enough, the dead old god Yashiraj had the territory that lost the most amount of land. While the living old god's roots were able to hold together most if not all the territory, the dead old god Yashiraj's roots were only able to hold together small pieces of land. While this is not confirmed, it seems pretty likely this is one of the reasons why the land still exists. There is four known old gods in Azeroth. Cthune, who was revealed and fought in Vanilla, and Yaxaran, who was revealed and then fought within Wrath of the Lich King. However, the same cannot be said for the other two, as they have a much more troubled history. Nizoth was introduced to us in Cataclysm as the big bad behind a ton of stuff in Azeroth, like the Naga and Deathwing. We actually would not get to see it until four expansions later with the final patch of BFA in 8.3, finally revealing the Old God's appearance to players. Outside, of course, the tiny border art that we mentioned before within the Chronicles only a year before. However, we did get to see it non-canonically beforehand, with it having appeared in Hearthstone's Whisper of the Old Gods expansion in 2016. While not official at the time, as even Ben Brode himself said, we collaborated a lot. One of the lead artists on WoW actually did the illustrations for the Hearthstone card. Hard to say what Nizoth would look like if it ever appears in WoW, but it's intended to be a canonical image of it, yes. It seems the WoW team loved how they made it look so much they decided to stick with Hearthstone's artwork making it official and years later chose to make Nizoth look that way in WoW. And yet even worse in the final old god Yashiraj. Revealed in the expansion Mista Pandaria, however, already dead when he was revealed, killed by the Titans eons ago. Outside of the tiny bit of artwork from the border of the Chronicles page, we actually have no canonical appearance for this old god. Nothing. We heard about it, but we're never shown an appearance. Although there is a mural within the Heart of Fear some theorize was supposed to be Yashiraj, it looks too much like a generic Naraki, like the one seen in Darkshore, to be that of an old god, confirmed later when it got the exact same treatment as Nezoth. In 2016, the Whispers of the Old God expansion is released, and with it, the four old gods got their own cards, Yashiraj giving it a full appearance, and while we never got an official model in-game to confirm this being its appearance, we do have a little art from Chronicles which seemingly confirms this is the appearance they're sticking with. Confirming that the mural in the Heart of Fear, or the mural in the secret Kalaxi Cave, is not in fact Yashiraj, or the stained glass within Ulduar. 
even more so when he would appear again in Hearthstone's second Old God expansion, Madness at the Darkmoon Fair. For reference, Hearthstone, while based in the Warcraft universe, anything within the game is non-canon by default. But some things do come over to WoW anyway, such as the Tortolan, the new members of the Explorers League, and Patches the Pirate. Although the teams do apparently talk to each other and collaborate in order to bring exciting things into the world of Warcraft, a good example being the Mean Streets of Gadgetan expansion, which is canonically how this city looks now. However, we simply can't see that in game, as the Azeroth we have is still stuck in the Cataclysm era. During the rise of the Horde, the Arakoa deviated from the path of their devotion to the gods Rukmar, Anzu, and Seath that were set for them, unable to defend themselves from the Sethic cult gained power, bringing their people into a twisted dark race. It came to them in their dreams, promising them powers beyond the cosmos, an old god, who then they came to worship, with them even thinking the summit of Murmur to be the doing of their old god master. However, this ended up being their downfall. Coming out of the shadows, they attacked the Horde. Seeing the power it was gaining, and with this threat, Gul'dan destroyed their camps and corrupted their people. Now, mad with corruption, they sought to summon their god, using a mix of fell magics of Shadowmoon and their own dark power. They seek to summon into the world, which, if successful, would have led to the destruction on all life in the Outland. Until a random nobody leveling stops the entire operation, banishing the old god back to where it came. Rather uneventful, right? While this is seemingly the only appearance of an old god on Draenor, one that is summoned and not there naturally, there is a possibility at Draenor having had an old god. Within Shadowmoon Valley, you can find an ooze called the Black Blood of Draenor. These blobs can fuse into much larger Draenor blood terrors. But the important part is the name, Black Blood of Draenor, very similar to the Black Blood of yogg Saron, which is Serenite, the blood of the old god yogg Saron. Is it possible Draenor once had an old god within Shadowmoon Valley? And before we go, there's one final thing to mention. The possible return of the old gods. While the old gods we know of so far have all died, the devs themselves have been vague about their actual death or not, since they've gone back and forth saying if they are permanently dead or not, with even saying they are outside of the cycle of death. They are thought manifested, and you can't kill thoughts. We even see with Yasharash, its influence living for eons after its death, with Yaxaran still able to influence and even take control of those within Ulduar after its death, and Cthun, who was to be resurrected come Cataclysm. And then there is Nazoth, who was killed, but many things hint at the old god having planned his death from the start. Too much stuff lines up, and comes off as too suspicious. Two, leaving the dagger that could lead to his death purposefully with his enemies, Seemingly, its only use being to kill him. It's almost too perfect. Now, the question is, is this on purpose for a possible return of the Black Empire? Or was this just horrible writing of a case of the devs needing a deus ex machina in order to kill him? Honestly, it could go either way. But the precedent is set, and speculations are not baseless. Of course, alternatively, if they want to explore old gods more without bringing them back to life, we could always go to another black empire, as we've seen worlds taken by the corruption of the old gods, like the ones Sargeras destroyed, and the ones we see during the Star Arger fight within the Nighthold. An epic scene that may hint at possible future expansions, a good way to let us experience an old god-ruled world without having to do time shenanigans again, or destroy Azeroth. Located just outside the village of Zabrajin in Zangamarsh is an NPC named Mac Diver, the Master Engineer. Mac Diver has a quest available to engineers that has you go out and collect a whole bunch of spare parts where he can teach you how to create a moat extractor. And this NPC is most likely a reference to the TV show MacGyver, which is quite infamous because one of its characters would build crazy inventions out of seemingly random stuff. As when you complete the quest for MacDiver, he has dialogues which states, Alright, now if we only had a stretchy loop, a parchment clamp, a guzzle tube and some sticky duck ribbon. Then we could really make something. Which just further enforces the reference as MacGyver, as in the TV show, some of the items he would carry around with him at all times were a Swiss army knife, duct tape, matches, a few paper clips, chewing gum, and a flashlight. Which is kind of similar to the stuff MacDiver was mentioning. Over on the Alliance side, there's also an engineer trainer called Kaylee Smallfry, which is a reference to Kay Winnetilly Fry from the TV series Firefly. In the TV show, Kaylee is depicted as a good-natured, optimistic mechanic who was able to fix any problems the ship might have, 
So, having her reference be a gnome character, who are regularly optimistic and good-natured characters, seems pretty fitting. There's also an item you can fish out of Steam Plump Flotsam in Zangermarsh called the Strange Engine Part, which has the flavor text, it reads like Capsin 38 on the bottom. When you accept the quest, it sends you over to Kaylee Smallfry, who remarks that the item looks like it fell out of the sky, and she'll pay you for your troubles. The flavor text and dialogues in the quest are references to the Firefly movie Serenity, where in the movie, there's a scene where the mechanic she's based on says, and don't fly in anything with a Capsian 38 engine, they fall right out of the sky. Also, funny enough, the quest item can be looted by Horde players, but they're not actually able to receive any quest from it. In Warlords of Draenor, the entire expansion is basically an isekai anime, where your characters go to another dimension which takes place about 30 years in the past in Draenor, which is the planet where Outlands and Zangermarsh are located. And if all of the seven original zones from Outlands, only five of them are represented within Warlords of Draenor as a place you can actually go to. Zangermarsh was just a fully underwater zone that had maybe one or two quests that would send you there, but otherwise was completely unused. The other zone was the Netherstorm, which Blizzard talked about a lot in BlizzCon panels as being Farallon, and the zone was cut late in development, so there was a lot of promotional material about it, and it even had a budget for it on the world map, although there weren't really any plans for the Zangar Sea in Warlords of Draenor, other than maybe giving it a fungal whale world boss. Though if you do ever explore underwater, you can see all the mushrooms which are very reminiscent of the Outlands version of it even if a lot of these mushrooms and spores are supposed to be highly toxic and dangerous. In lore, Zangermarsh is an absolutely terrible place to be in, as we get a nice description of it from the Illidan novel from Maiev's point of view, where she says, Zangermarsh was a monstrous place, a boggy fell lint filled with alien horrors, and then goes on to say in a different part of the book, She had thought Hellfire Peninsula was a terrible place, but this was far worse. The entranceway to Outland was a desert hell filled with fell orcs and hideous creatures, but Zangermarsh was something darker and stranger. It was hot and humid and dank. Huge mushroom trees, larger than the towering oaks of Ashenvale, blocked out the sun. Manta-like flyers flitted through their shadows, and things part jellyfish, part alien monster floated through the air. True, there were fewer orcs, but there were other menaces. After smashing through the host of Ravagers, the Watchers had been attacked by a giant ambulatory fungus. They had been ambushed by ogres and sworn by huge stinging insects. She had lost Colia to tiny grubs that had emerged from her flesh after she had been stung, the vermin eating her eyes and her brain, another death that ultimately could be laid at the feet of Illidan. There's also some other parts where she mentions that the spores in the air constantly grow fungus on their skin, and that only carefully cleaning and the use of healing magic could take it off. As in-game, Zangermarsh is just a neat-looking leveling zone, and doesn't feel anywhere near as dangerous as it's described in the book. So it was actually kind of a shock to read this segment, to see how dangerous it's supposed to be. In three different spots in Zangermarsh, there are three NPCs which are references to tissue paper and blowing your nose. As spores in the air are responsible for a lot of allergies, so it's appropriate that a lot of the spore-like creatures in the zone have parody names based on these things. More specifically, the NPCs, Gesundheit, which sounds like Gesundheit, which is a polite thing you can say to someone after they sneeze. There's also Kaninix, which sounds like Kleenex, a popular brand of tissue paper. And finally, Tishu, which literally just sounds like tissue. Speaking of Tishu, currently this NPC offers a quest called Bring Me a Shrubbery, and has another quest called Bring Me Another Shrubbery. Both of these are references to the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail, in which the characters are asked by the Knights of Knee in order to go out and fetch a shrubbery for them as part of a quest. Located just to the east of the spawning glen is an NPC sporling named Fossen. This NPC is most likely a reference to the spawn of Fashan, which is a tabletop RPG that was released in 1981, which is infamous for being absolutely terrible. As the sporling Fossen has a quest related to spawning glen, in which you have to go help the sporling spawns, and seeing as the NPC's name is very similar to Fashan, and heavily involved with spawns, it's a pretty easy relation to make. The RPG it references is best described by a quote from Lauren Stick's review of it in 1982's edition of Dragon. Hilariously bad fantasy system, legendary amongst RP game designers as the epitome of cliché amateurist FRP games. Some maintain that it's so bad it must be a hoax. The rulebook indicates a bizarrely complex character creation system, painfully cumbersome combat rules, and monster descriptions with names like 
Makel, Fochtlum, Finkroar, and Raltmulrut. Seeing as the names of the monsters in the spawn of Fashan were so weird and random, it definitely fits the spoiling Fussin and most of their naming conventions. The Captured Gnome is an NPC located in the Horde-controlled village of Zabrajin. The NPC will offer repair services for Horde players and even sell a couple of engineering items. And while the gnome is going about its business, banging on the anvil, he will occasionally be taunted by some of the passing by guards, telling him to work faster, to which he'll reply in common. Although, Horde players won't be able to understand what he's saying. If an Alliance player is nearby and spying on the village, they will be able to see the gnome is saying, please don't kill me. There's also some dialogue where a guard will tell him that if he's no good at fixing things, then he'll be good for eating. To which he'll also reply, either, I don't understand you, or, please don't beat me. Now, the captured gnome in this village could be a reference to how gnomes are treated in WoW Machinima, where there was a large emphasis in early WoW Machinimas to always punt gnomes, or use them as the butt of many jokes. Although if it's not a reference, then it's just a pretty dark scene of a captured gnome who's just scared for his life. Located in the Ledgerman Lounge in Legion Dalaran, while you're playing a rogue who's doing the rogue order hall missions from Legion, there's a section which will send you to investigate and look for the dead body of Amber Kernan, another uncrowned member who went missing. Once you get to the upstairs room and activate stealth, there will be two SI7 agents named Agent Smith and Agent Jones who will walk around the room and talk about how it's totally crazy that the leader of the SI7 himself told them to kill one of their best agents which eventually leads the rogue to finding out why this happened, and basically the whole story of the Rogue Order Hall campaign. Amber is holding a decoded message, which eventually you have to deliver to the Uncrowned, where you find out that Matthias Shaw has been taken captive and you have to go free him eventually. Now, the two NPCs in this particular part of the quest chain are obvious reference to the two agents in the Men in Black movies, as the real-life actors who play the two Men in Black are named Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. Hence the names Agent Smith and Jones. And also, during the Shadowlands, you can actually meet Amber and Maldraxxus. And if you're playing a rogue who went through the quest chains, you can actually tell her the message successfully went through, to which she'll remark that it's a good thing her last efforts weren't in vain. If you are an alchemist, there is a pattern you can get with a little bit of work which allows you to create a cosmetic head item that places a red candle on top of your head, called the Red Noggin Candle. In order to obtain the pattern, what you need to do is collect 10 infused rubies, which drop from random NPCs around the zone of Revendreth or from Venthyr reputation boxes. Then you need some atonement crypt keys so that you can open up some of the crypts in this location on the map, where the bored dredger NPC has a chance to spawn every time you open up one of the crypts. It's RNG how long it will actually take to find the NPC you need, but if you have 20 extra infused rubies, you can head over to this waypoint on the map where there's a bell that you can ring which increases the drop rate of atonement keys for 20 minutes. Then, once the NPC spawns, you have about 30 seconds to buy the pattern you want, as eventually he'll just run off. So you have to be quick and make sure you have the required amount of rubies and empty backspace to actually purchase the item. It is a pretty unique transmog though, and I was able to get the NPC to spawn after opening only a single crypt. Although, I probably just got lucky, as I saw a lot of reports of people taking at least a few hours to get the NPC to spawn. And in today's segment of Lore Reader Tales, we will be going over Leonid Bartholomew, an undead warrior who plays a role in a whole bunch of different expansions, even if only a pretty minor one. Before his undead state, Leonid used to be a paladin before he was later killed and resurrected by the Lich King into a mindless undead. He was later freed by the Banshee Queen, but is loyal to the Argent Dawn. Leonid sees being an undead as a mere malady, or an illness which merely requires a treatment in order to cure. He doesn't see it as much of a curse that they're forced to live with as all the others, and thinks that one day he'll probably find a way to just make it better. During Vanilla WoW, he appears in the Light Hopes Chapel in the Eastern Plainlands, and will send adventurers of both the Alliance and Horde to kill Ras Frostwhisper, who is the Lich located in Skolomance. In Wrath of the Lich King, Leonid appears during the attack in the Light Hopes Chapel in the Death Knight Starting Zone, right before the arrival of Tyrion Fordring. In the Cataclysm, with the revamp of the zones in the Argent Crusade and a whole bunch of new quests, Leonid will send adventurers to help out with the Brotherhood of the Light, which is a splinter group of the Argent Crusade who are kind of like a less extreme version of the Scarlet Crusade. They don't like the rules and regulations of the Argent Dawn, but they still want to fight the dark forces of the world. And in Warlords of Draenor, Leonid appears in the Lunarfall Inn in the Frostwall Tavern for Horde and Alliance players, and will ask adventurers to go into Auchendoom in order to find the Soulweave vessels, 
which he believes can help aid in the Argent Dawn investigation into the world of the transition from life to death. And he thinks it's key in discovering the truth behind the bridge between both worlds, and perhaps a reason why the Scourge do not fully make that transition. So, he's still on the lookout for Akira as late as World of the Draenor, although as of making this video, he still hasn't really shown up again. Leonid Bartholomew is notable for being one of the few good aligned undead in the world, and whenever lore aficionados like to bring up good factions of undead, Bartholomew would usually come up in that conversation as a possible leader of this good aligned undead faction. That and Lillian Voss. And after the events of BFA, we know which one of these two Blizzard eventually went with. Well, until Kalia takes over more officially anyway. And now some information about the earliest versions of the game. Did you know the earliest design of druids was for them to constantly switch forms during battle? They wanted them to be in bear form if they were taking damage, going into kitty form to deal more damage, and going to caster form in order to use their mana from range, while also giving their innervate to the healers. So they had a lot of talents and abilities that synergized with them swapping forms, and even the capstone talent for the feral tree was a mana reduction to their shapeshifting. But there were a few problems with this design. The biggest was that shapeshifting cost so much mana that it literally disincentivized players from wanting to shapeshift during battle at all. The capstone ability for Feral Druids was supposed to offset this, but even with a 25% mana reduction, it was still too expensive to constantly swap forms. And they didn't really pull competitive damage doing it anyway. You're best off just sticking to one form and not swapping during battle. It wasn't really until later on in WoW that they finally got this intended design philosophy down, or at least in PvP. In PvP, Druids shapeshift to different forms all the time, and they've been doing that for many years. But in PvE, they finally got Druids to shapeshift mid-battle with one of their talents called Affinity. Druids have four specs, and they're able to pick one of their affinities that gives them traits and features from one of the other four specs. So, a Resto Druid who takes Feral Affinity, for example, is much more effective when they're in cat form, and is actually a completely viable option to take when running Mythic Plus dungeons as druids are able to pull some of the highest healer damage by just going into cat form. Now, whether druids want to constantly swap forms all the time in a raid, though, is another issue. But outside of raiding environments, there's lots of incentives for druids to shapeshift constantly that wasn't there in vanilla WoW at all. So it seems they kept this design philosophy throughout the years, and didn't really nail it into much later on in WoW's lifetime. And now, for a piece of WoW history. According to a leaked alpha build of WoW, which came out a year before Vanilla WoW, when you created a new undead character, you'd actually get a letter in your inventory. The letter would basically just give you a very quick rundown of your situation, depending on what class you were, and then tell you if you want to grow stronger to just visit your class trainer of choice. So every class would get a different letter. The note for the warrior basically just told you who your enemies were, i.e. humans in the Scarlet Crusade, and who you'd have to fight. The letter for the mage explained more about what happened to your character, and how they were raised as an undead and what they should expect from their new life, before directing them to a mage trainer. The warlock note would basically just tell you to burn everything, while giving you some light guidance to maybe use your burning powers on the burning legion and not the horde. Having a note in your inventory which explains your character's new undead status seems like an excellent piece of flavorful lore, which might better explain why you're playing a random zombie, especially if you're not familiar with the Warcraft universe, or just want to be more immersed in your character. The letters were removed from all starting undead bags by beta, and were definitely not in the vanilla version of the game. Instead, all undeads were basically given the same intro experience, where they're told to go kill some mindless ghouls or something. Located in the Shadowpan Monastery is a secret area, where there's a shrine that gives you a buff called the Unseen Force. In order to get to this area, you have to go out of your way off the map in the dungeon, and then getting up to the location that doesn't seem possible in game without using some kind of wall climbing tool. I was only able to get to this location thanks to the Venthyr Teleport, and it's kind of a surprise it's so hard to get to, considering the buff it gives you is incredibly helpful for completing the achievement in the dungeon. You see, when you click on the buff, it gives you an increased 90% chance to hit for 15 minutes, and in order to get the achievement from the last boss, you have to defeat him while you have a whole bunch of the debuffs on you which reduce your chance to hit. And it can be easily surmised that you're supposed to come over here in order to get this buff in order to complete that achievement. But it's not in an obvious location, and it's kind of hard to get to. It's also surrounded by a whole bunch of tombstones and two stealth NPCs who are only visible when you get close to them. If you talk to either of them, they only tell you one line of dialogue about honoring their family and nothing else. So it seems to be a neat little hidden place, which I don't think they probably meant to make it as hidden as it ended up being, considering the useful buff it provides. But 
This is a place that I'm sure very few people have known about or even been to, and definitely fits the whole hidden place in World of Warcraft vibe, which is perfect for this video. Starting off, let's go over a hidden easter egg located inside of two of the lost relics you can recover. The Book of Binding, the Tormented Sorcerer, and the Book of Binding, the Mad Witch. Both require you to complete a little quest before you're able to turn them in, which simply has you go around and collect some of the pages of their books. When you first collect the book, you'll be given some lines that basically tell you the book is talking to you and telling you that you need to recover all of its pages. After you collect all the pages and turn them into the researchers, he'll tell you that it seems as if the pages were removed intentionally, and that just to be safe, he'll return all but one of the pages back to the book before returning it to the archive. Then, while both of the books are in the archive, you can click on them in order to get a little bit of dialogue from these talking books. If you click on the Book of the Tormented Sorcerer, it'll ask you to return its last page, and additionally to not return any of the Crimson pages to its book, because that book speaks nothing but lies and is trying to trick you. If you speak to the Crimson book, it will tell you basically the same thing but for the Azura pages, where it says to return the final Crimson page, and that you should not return any of the Azura pages because that book speaks nothing but lies and is trying to trick you. Both of these books are references to the 1993 video game Myst. In this game, there's a plot point where a speaking book will talk to you and ask you to return all of its blue pages and then tell you to absolutely not return any of the red pages to its appropriate book. And if you talk to the red book, it will basically tell you the same thing. Don't trust the blue pages and return my red pages instead. And each time you do return one of the pages, you'll get a statically little message which will give you a tiny bit of insight about who's trapped inside this book. If you do manage to return all the pages to either book, then the person occupying the book will be freed from their prison and trap you in their place, which basically triggers one of the bad ends as the books were actually prisons that were holding two brothers that were psychopathic maniacs, and they were trapped inside these books by their father. And also in the game, during part of the quest, there'll be a little bit of flavor text that says you hear a little bit of static coming from one of the books, which is another more direct reference to the Mist books. So the researcher was pretty right to not return the final page to either of them. That would have meant someone would be trapped in their place. Now let's go over a couple of hidden mounts. Corthia has three mounts you can obtain through completing a series of steps that you kind of have to figure out yourself. First up, we have Miley the Wanderer. This is a unicorn that likes to hang out on cliffs at one of these locations shown on the map, almost each day at random. And nearly all of her spawn locations are located in somewhat hard to get to spots, so you have to do a little bit of climbing and jumping. Once you find her, she'll go back to her home base next to the Night Fate Tiny Bell. And once you do this six times on different days, Tiny Bill will give you a short quest which just gives you the mount. Although Miley is not available every single day, so you can always talk to Tiny Bill in order to see if she's out and about or just ask in general chat as she only stays at one location for the entire day if she's up. Next we have Dark Maul, the bear-like creature. This creature is simply located at this spot on the map sleeping and all you have to do is just feed it 10 tasty mushrooms. Tasty mushrooms are available from invasive mushrooms that are basically a rare treasure you have to find in hard to get locations. But the tasty mushrooms do not drop every single time you loot an invasive mushroom treasure. So you might have to find a lot of them. But once you feed Dark Maul 10 mushrooms, then he'll award himself as a mount. And lastly, there's the Dark Light Razor Wing, whose nest is located at this area on the map. In order to obtain this mount, all you have to do is bring her 10 lost Razor Wing eggs, which drop randomly from Devour mobs in Corthia. And once you return 10 eggs to the nest, then she'll award herself as a mount. Next up, we'll be looking at a little bit of flavor text. You see, whenever you kill rares or loot treasures, you have a chance to get items which simply exist. That way you can submit them to the archivist in order to get cataloged research. And all of the pieces that give cataloged research have a little bit of flavor text on them. And one of them of note is called the core of an unknown titan, which reads, a titan core that has been taken apart multiple times for study. Now, the flavor text on this leads to all kinds of lore implications. Currently, we are under the impression that titans have hearts, so what could even be a core of a titan? Do titans actually have cores and not body parts like we've been led to believe, with Azerite being blood? Also, can titans die and go to the Shadowlands? And if they can, how were the archivists able to get a hold of their core and then research it? And also, also, how did a titan die without the other titans knowing about it? Is it actually one of the cores of one of the titans that Sargeras killed? 
Was it just a nameless titan who died a long time ago before the Pantheon was aware of it? Maybe it was one of the void planets that Sargeras destroyed? I'm pretty sure it wasn't supposed to raise all of these questions, and was just a fun bit of flavor text. But if we do take it seriously, this one little item, which is meant to just hold currency, probably unintentionally is super lore relevant. And it's not just the core of an unknown titan. There is also a relic that you have to uncover, which are much more important than these cataloged research items, which coincidentally are also called Corthian relics, called the Unstable Explosive Orb. When you turn in the orb, the archivist will tell you how it's fascinating this thing didn't detonate when Corthia was invaded. And if you click on the orb inside the storage, it will say that it's contained the energy inside of it for unknown eons, and that surely the archivist would be certain that it wouldn't blow up, since they thought it's safe to put in storage, or at least that's what you hope. There's also another Corthian relic item, which you can trade in for 100 catalog research, that has the flavor text of Tattered plans for weapons that the Primus has decreed to be too destructive for creation. This could imply that the unstable explosive orb was created by the Primus, and that he knows how to create a whole bunch of other incredibly powerful weapons, which of course we know is true based on the weapons he's already created that have been incredibly destructive, like the Frostmourne for example. Now let's take a look at a relic which offers you a toy item. The Guise of the Changeling grants you the toy item of the same name, which allows you to take on the appearance of an attendant of Corthia, and also annoyingly slows down your movement speed by quite a bit. If you click on the relic inside the storage room, it has a little bit of text which states that it seems to have been created by the Shaldurai, but was altered with a whole bunch of magic that you don't recognize, and then ends off its little flavor text with a line, one can only guess at what the illusion must be hiding. Now, for anyone who's played through Legion, it's pretty obvious what this is referencing. When you're running through the Nightborn city, you put on an illusion so the other Nightborn become friendly to you and don't attack. And there were occasionally sentries who would try to dispel your illusion with the famous line, an illusion, what are you hiding? Which has become so well known throughout the WoW community that it even bleeds into other games, with even League of Legends referencing it in one of their patch notes. And what's notable about this is that the Nightborn were kind of a closed off city for 10,000 years in the Broken Isle, and were just known as the Night Elves before that, so how they got specifically a Nightborn relic in the afterlife is kind of a mystery, unless you don't think too hard about it and just accept it for the reference they were trying to make for fun. Next up we have a secret daily quest that is only available if you enter a rift portal and go into the other zone. Now, as of making this video, we're still not 100% sure what the prerequisites are for being able to do this daily quest, but one can assume you need to have a high reputation with Venari, as what you do is enter any rift using a rift keystone, and then once you're inside the Shadow Realm, you have 15 minutes before it kicks you out. And what you do is just go to the Maw and look at one of these locations on the map for a huge chest called the Zoval's Vault. If you click on the chest, then it will give you little chains that will allow you to drag the chest, and all you have to do is drag this chest very slowly to the bridge that's right next to Venari's lair, who thankfully is waiting for you at the bridge so you don't have to drag the chest all the way into the den. Venari, while in the Shadow Realm, will then have a daily quest available for you to find the chest, which you should probably pick up before you go out and look for the chest, as when I was getting footage for this, they didn't actually give me credit for clicking on the chest, even though they did give me credit for turning it in. Now, this little hidden quest is just an excellent idea, as there isn't really anything that tells you to go out and do this as generally going into the rift is only for stuff located in Corthia. So kudos to the first person who decided to explore the Maw in the rift zone, and then found this daily quest, and thought to spend 5 minutes dragging the chest over to Venari. And lastly, let's look at another relic with some interesting hidden secrets. For a city that's called the City of Hidden Secrets, there's actually very few secrets to discover in Corthia, but that doesn't mean there's none of them. The Everliving Statuette is an item which drops from one of the rare elites, and while you have this item on you, which gives you a quest to turn into storage, the item will actually send your character whispers, saying things like, A city of secrets, a history of lies. How many voices do you heed? How many are real? Hope, betrayal, sacrifice. Faces change, the tale does not. Hidden from daylight, a sleeping flame rests atop the sixth tree. The seventh covets what the sixth holds fast. The full crumb wavers, all will be undone. So many secrets, so little time left to share them. Now these cryptic secrets seems like we have another puzzle box of Yogg-Saron on our hands, where the puzzle box of Yogg-Saron was pretty famous for giving a whole bunch of random whispers that ended up being lore important later on. However, once you've actually turned the relic, and you click on the item in storage, you learn the item just really likes to lie, 
and that any wisdom it might share is almost certainly riddled with deceit. And one of the lines that it utters is actually a reference to a famous false hint from the game Castlevania II Simon's Quest, where the game would tell you a flame is on top of the sixth tree in Dennis Woods. But there was actually nothing there which is very similar to the whisper from the statue, hidden from daylight, a sleeping flame rests atop the sixth tree. So because it references a famous false hint, it's pretty safe that you can just ignore the rest of them, unless it happens to actually turn out to be accurate later on, of course. Which is unlikely, you actually only get the whispers while you're on the quest, and you can't get them anymore after you turn it in. Located in the Apothecarium section in the Undercity is an alchemy vendor named Algernon. The NPC is one of the mindless ghoul variants of Undead, which is notable because one of the key distinctions of the Forsaken is the fact that they are free will and mostly fully functional Undead, and generally, the mindless ghouls do not make their way into their ranks. Algernon doesn't have any dialogue options and only has one arm, and clutched in its one arm are a couple of flowers. Now, all of this is a pretty obvious reference to the short story, Flowers for Algernon. You see, in this story, a pair of scientists develop a way to vastly increase the intelligence of a rat named Algernon, and they believe they can replicate this procedure in humans. So they get their janitor as a test subject, who is stated to have an IQ of 68, which is rather low for an adult. The procedure is a success, and the janitor, whose name is actually Charlie, becomes much smarter, a genius even, as his IQ approaches 200. And with his newfound intelligence, he realizes that everyone around him has always been treating him rather poorly, so he chooses to distance himself in order to work on his own research, and takes the rat Algernon with him. And during his research on the rat, he finds that the procedure is temporary, as the rat eventually loses its newfound intelligence, becomes erratic, and then eventually dies. Charlie realizes that he's starting to lose his newfound intelligence as well, and decides to leave his hometown to an unknown destination and the last thing he tells anyone before he takes off is to leave some flowers on Algernon's grave. Hence the name of Flowers for Algernon. Now, with the mindless ghoul variant in Undercity, that could just be Charlie after his intelligence boost wore off as well, with, of course, the flowers in his hand ready to put on Algernon's grave. And in today's episode of The Lore Reader Tells, we will be going over the story of a lesser-known NPC named Morgan Lattimore. Morgan Lattimore was a human knight who was called to fight in the Second War when the orcs were invading to the north, and left his home of Darkshire where he had a wife and three children. He spent many years fighting the Second War, and even participated in the Third War, before finally coming back to his home and finding that it was nowhere near what he last remembered. Most of the force was corrupted with undead and other dark forces, and there was a whole bunch of destroyed homes and farms everywhere. When he finally found some people, he asked them where his family was, and a priest mentioned to him that he should probably check the massive gravestones, because that's the most likely place he would find them. Morgan was adamant that they were still alive, so he spent all of his time looking into all the houses along the entire zone, and as he was getting ready to start looking in other places, because he thought maybe they had fled somewhere else, curiosity got the best of him, so he decided to search the gravestones anyway. After walking through the massive amounts of graves for hours, he finally came to one lone gravestone that had his wife's name on it, with the tag, Beloved Wife and Mother. Morgan Lattimore went a little bit insane after finding this, and started hacking away at the gravestone. When some attendants came over to try to calm him down, he slashed out at them, and killed them all, and when he finally got back to his senses, he was absolutely horrified at what he had done. He had fought with the Silver Hand and had promised to protect the innocents, and he had just killed a couple of them in his grief so he turned the sword on himself and took his own life. When the people of Darkshire found the scene, they buried Morgan in an unmarked grave away from all the other gravestones. And since he had done something so abhorrent to what he held in life, Morgan raised from the dead a couple of days later as an undead, and has the distinction of being one of the few undead in the game who are still able to use the Holy Light, and his name was changed to Mord Landon. What he didn't know was that one of his daughters was still alive and had joined the Night's Watch. So adventurers helped put Morgan Lattimore to rest, since as an undead, he would wander around and kill people indiscriminately. And since his daughter forgave him for what he did, he was finally able to pass on in peace. Now, this NPC is pretty well known to some Alliance characters, because it's an elite undead that wanders his own and has a pretty large aggro radius and an erratic pathing. And it's this NPC 
which ended my very first Iron Man challenge because I had actually gone AFK right next to one of his passing spots. Located off the coast of the Dread Wastes in Pandaria, at this location on the map, is a hidden rare elite clam known as Gokluck. When approaching this NPC, it actually is located in its own little subzone called Gokluck Shadows, which grants you an ability to breathe underwater and move faster while walking on the seafloor. Back in Mr. Pandaria, this NPC had quite a lot of health for a rare NPC, and took a while to kill, but if doing it at max level it shouldn't take very much time at all. Once you manage to kill the NPC, a group of Spriggans will steal the pearl from the clam and you'll receive a quest, which will simply send you to a nearby village in order to talk to some Spriggans, who will hand you a pearl which grants you a toy item called Gawklock Shell. This toy item is actually quite popular, since it strips your characters of all their clothes and has them dance in an open clam shell. So you may have seen someone using this toy before, even if you've never actually known the location of it, or maybe just never bothered to look for it since there's so many toys in the game, even I didn't obtain this toy until research in this point of the video, and I actually played through the entirety of Mr. Pandaria expansion. And now, some information from the earliest versions of the game. Despite being one of the most popular classes in the game, the Hunter was the last class added to the beta of Vanilla WoW, and barely made it into the game. It's unlikely they ever would have cut the Hunter, since they had yet to have a true Ranger class in the game yet, which is a staple of fantasy RPGs. But they came real close to not including it at all, and really had to rush things out towards the end. Hunters used to have a very complicated method of learning how to track with an ability called Glimpse Instincts, that they eventually removed because Hunters already had too many things to micromanage with their pet, and they just gave Hunters the ability to track things by just toggling a button from the spellbook, which made the tracking feature a lot less intuitive, but a lot more useful. This late addition could be why hunters didn't get their focus system until Cataclysm, and instead only their pet used the unique focus resource. So, if they had more time to spend working on hunters, we probably wouldn't have had to suffer through mana using hunters for the first three expansions. And now, for a piece of World of Warcraft history. In one of the earliest patches of Vanilla WoW, the spirit healer was changed to no longer cause your character to lose experience when you use them in order to resurrect rather than running back to your corpse, and instead was chained so that all of your equipment was broken, equipped and in your inventory, 100% durability loss, as well as resurrection sickness equal to the number of minutes equal to your level. So if you were level 60, you would incur a 60 minute duration resurrection sickness. So Resonant as Spirit Healer was ridiculously bad, but at least it no longer reduced your experience after patch 1.1. However, the Spirit Healer was still incredibly bad, so in patch 1.1.1, they changed the Spirit Healer to be more in line with how it works today. Instead of destroying all of your equipment, it instead only made you incur a 25% durability loss, and the length of resurrection sickness was capped at 10 minutes, so you wouldn't get it for an hour at max level. This is still kind of how it works today. Also, before the game went live, the meeting stones outside of instances and dungeons which allow you to summon party members were actually tied to your character as a spirit healer resurrection point. So in alpha clients, you would go to these stones in order to bind your character to them, and then when you died, you would go there instead of wherever the designated spirit healer in the zone was. The stones were then reused later on as kind of a way to queue for a dungeon, before way later being turned into the teleportation stones they are today. Located in the city of Telar in TBC Nagran, there is an NPC named Warden Moy BFF Jill. His name is a reference to an old commercial about a cell phone plan, in which a mother is trying to ask her daughter why the phone bill is so high, and she responds by saying that she was talking to her best friend Jill in SM in shorthand out loud. Who are you texting 50 times a day? I became my BFF Jill. Now originally, his name was a little bit more noticeable as a reference to SMS shorthand, as before patch 2.3, his name was actually Warden Eilol. And because of the font in game, it made his name look exactly like Warden LOLOL, since the I at the beginning of his name looks exactly like a lowercase l when it's capitalized. And for some reason, people didn't like this character having a joke name. So, they changed it to another joke name, which wasn't as obvious a reference as Warden LOLOL. And boy, BFF Jill still doesn't seem like a regular name, but I guess they thought it was better than LOL. And in today's episode of Lore Reader Tales, where we go over the history of minor characters throughout Warcraft, we will be talking about Mogor the Ogre. Mogor was a two-headed ogre who led the Laughing Skull Clan during Warcraft 2. A little history about two-headed ogres. 
The two-headed variant is very rare, and are usually the only ones capable of casting spells. In Warlords of Draenor, we see the past version of Mogor, and he only has one head, but also has a mage's staff attached to his back, indicating that he may have had some affinity for magic. During the Second War in Warcraft 2, Gul'dan was able to use some of the elven rune stones to turn a whole bunch of his ogres into two-headed ogres, which was a huge boost to his fighting potential, as all ogres were physically stronger than pretty much all other races already, and this also gave them the ability to use magic on top of that. So, think of two-headed ogres as pure battle mages, who don't really have a weakness. Although, one of the downsides of having two heads was that it also gave them two personalities, and they would often bicker or fight with each other. Although Mogor was one of the lone exceptions as his two heads seemed to share the same personality and were incredibly intelligent. After he was turned into a two-headed ogre, he somehow made his way back to Draenor and became the leader of the Laughing Skull Clan, who was originally left behind because they weren't trustworthy. Sometime after the Horde lost the Second War, Ner'zhul was going around collecting artifacts so that he could open up a whole bunch of portals in Draenor, so that they could conquer a whole bunch of other worlds besides Azeroth. Doing all of this is what eventually blew the planet up and created the Outlands we have today. Although Mogor didn't want this to happen, and actually decided to side with the Alliance. And in exchange for the Alliance helping him take control of the Blade Edge Mountain, he would give them a powerful artifact known as the Book of Medivh. And he actually kept his word. He was able to secure that powerful book and was able to dodge and outsmart Ner'zhul's assassins along the way. And the Alliance was able to eventually use the Book of Medivh to close the portal. And that plot thread wasn't touched again until the Burning Crusade. Then, in the Burning Crusade, Mogor makes a return to Nagran, running a Ring of Blood type battle arena, and is also incredibly stupid like all other ogres. If you do the quest, you can eventually fight him after you defeat all of his champions, and then you just kill him and that's it. The incredibly intelligent leader of the Laughing Skull clan was relegated to a bloodthirsty brute. So they just completely retconned his character. Mogor is also the ogre depicted in the Hearthstone card Ogre Magi, which is part of the base set, and even has his own Hearthstone card named after him, which unfortunately takes after his Burning Crusade counterpart, and has a whole bunch of his dumb ogre dialogues. Moga Dessa? No. Moga Destroy- oh, wait. No, Moga Kill! Moga Charge! And that's basically the end of Mogor's story. He started off as an intelligent, capable leader, and then they decided to just turn him into one of many dumb ogres that you faced. Sorry. Uh-oh. And now for a Warcraft mini fact. Did you know, out of all of the pet classes, hunters are the only ones that actually have to resurrect their pet? For the Warlock, if one of their demons die, they simply just resummon it. For Death Knights, same thing. If the Ghoul dies, they just summon another one. Mages also just resummon their Frost Elemental if they have that chosen, and pretty much all the other temporary pets just stop existing once they go away. Although Hunters don't have the option to just resummon their pet if it dies, they actually have a resurrection spell they can use to bring it back. And since it counts as a real resurrection, other players can also resurrect a Hunter's pet. Or if you want, you can use a Battle Res in order to bring a Hunter's pet back to life. Although, that would be a huge waste of a Battle Res, seeing as the resurrection ability that Hunters can use can also be used in combat. Now, it's a wonder why only Hunters have to bring their pet back to life, whereas demons basically just go back to the Twisted Nether when they die, and they just resummon the exact same one back. Same case for the Frost Elementals, and I'm not really sure how the ghouls work with Death Knights, I assume they just have an endless supply of corpse dust that they use to create brand new undeads every time they have to make a new one. It makes sense that the people who just simply summon a creature don't have to worry about dealing with a dead body, but it seems to be one of the few fantasy elements left to the hunter class and their pet. And now, for something you can obtain in WoW. Located in Stormheim, there is a rare NPC called the Stormwind Matriarch, which has a pretty short respawn timer, and when you kill it, drops a pet called the Stormborn Whelpling. Now, what's unique about this pet is the fact that it has the Arcane Storm Mana Surge combo, which is an incredibly powerful combo that allows you to defeat a whole bunch of pets in PvE pet battles, and is one of the easiest ways to obtain a pet who has this combo, who also has decently high attack. Basically, if you take a whole group of pets who only have Arcane Storm and Mana Surge, you have a good chance of beating pretty much any pet you come across. And what makes it even easier to get 
is the fact that the NPC you kill in order to obtain it, the Stormwind Matriarch, drops the pet every time you kill it. Or at least nearly every time you kill it. It's one of the few rare mobs who drops a pet, which drops it more than once after the first time you kill it. So you could just infinitely farm the Stormborn Whelpling if you wanted to, which also coincidentally is why it's very cheap to buy on the auction house. And now onto the hidden side of WoW, where we'll be looking over the time loss proto Drake in the Grand. Located near the corpse of Kairos, the bronze dragon who brought Garrosh to Draenor, is the corpse of the long famous time loss proto Drake, which was one of the very first creatures in game that could drop a mount, and was on an incredibly long respawn timer, so very few people actually managed to get one, even to this day. And the dead body of the Proto Drake in the Grand is actually the exact same NPC that you can find in Northrend. As if if you hover over it with an add on which shows you what mounts drop from items and stuff, it will show you that the NPC should have the Timelines Proto Drake mount on it if you were able to loot its corpse. Now, as to why the corpse of the exact same mount from Northrend is located in Warlords of Draenor, about three expansions away, can be explained by a couple of little Easter eggs and nods around the area. For one, there's a lot of time-lost guards surrounding the area, so it makes sense that the time-lost proto-drake would be included in the area as well, if they were going to add an easter egg that shared the same name. There's also the corpse of Kairos nearby, who is a bronze dragon, and one can surmise by the color of the time-lost proto-drake that it's pretty similar to a bronze dragon. And also, one other little thing, if one was farming the time-lost proto-drake in Northrend, Occasionally, they would find out the Time Lost Proto Drake just straight up disappears at the end of its spawn cycle. You could find the NPC and then run after it to try to kill it for the mount, only for it to disappear as soon as you got to it. So the real reference of this NPC in Draenor could be the fact that when that would happen where he would disappear from people trying to tag it, it actually just slipped into another time dimension, and then eventually found its way all the way over to Draenor in a place full of time lost magic. First, let's go over the dangerous raid boss on the Dark Moon Island. Off the coast of the Dark Moon Island, there's a cave which has a suspicious number of skeletons in front of it. Exploring the cave, you don't really find much except for some mushrooms and normal cave decor. The skeletons seem to only be in the entrance. Occasionally, a world boss will spawn at the entrance called the Dark Moon Rabbit, and it just looks like a normal rabbit at first glance. Occasionally, it'll move around and cast the Dimensional Hop ability, which probably explains how it got there in the first place. Engaging this rabbit definitely requires a raid group though, as it's incredibly difficult to try to solo as it's always considered a boss at whatever current expansion it is, and is probably the smallest boss in the game. If you do manage to kill it, there's a chance that it will drop the Dark Moon Rabbit pet, which has three different breeds available to it and only one of them is good. So if you manage to get the SS breed, you can sell that for quite a bit on the auction house. And the pet version of it has a slightly different model, where it basically looks the same, but it has a whole bunch of blood on its mouth. The Dark Moon Rabbit is an obvious reference to this scene from the Monty Python, where a group of knights try to fight a lone rabbit who ends up killing half the group before they run away in fear. And in the end, they end up killing it with a holy hand grenade. One of the abilities the Dark Moon Rabbit has as a pet is called Huge Sharp Teeth, which is what one of the characters in the movie uses to describe how terrifying the killer rabbit is. And the ability was completely unique and only belonged to the Dark Moon Rabbit when it first came out, before they gave the ability to a couple of other pets in later expansions as well. And in today's episode of Lore Reader Tales, we're going to go over a small section of history from a very prominent and important character from WoW lore, namely Zol'jin and Uniting the Forest Trolls. You see, Zol'jin in troll lore is a very well-respected character, to the point where most trolls look up to this one troll who only had a prominent role during the Second War, and horde troll characters in game would even use his name as a battle cry. And he was the first troll to be added to Heroes of the Storm, before even more notable characters like Vol'jin. And why was that? Well, there's this one little excerpt from the Warcraft novel called Tides of Darkness, which details the story of the Second War, a period of history which is incredibly underrepresented in the game and hardly ever talked about. That does a good job of kind of highlighting why Zol'jin is so well respected by pretty much all trolls of every tribe, including Vol'jin himself. 
The Horde had promised them vengeance, and Zul'jin believed them. The orc leader, Doomhammer, had honor about him. The honor of a strong leader secure in his own power. He would not play Zul'jin false, and he had vowed to help them restore the Amani Empire. Already, Zul'jin had started the task. He was the first forest troll since those terrible wars to reunite the tribes. One by one, he had challenged the other tribe leaders and defeated them, whether at combat or at racing or some other task, and all had bowed before him, pledging themselves and their tribes to his rule. The forest trolls were a single people once more, and with the Horde's help, they would wipe the world clean of humans and elves alike, and rule the forest once more. The orcs showed no interest in trees, and Zul'jin suspected they would occupy the valleys and plains of the world. Let them. All he wanted was the woods. But first, they had to take them from the elves, and that would be a pleasure. For some context, the leader of the Horde during the Second War, Doomhammer, managed to convince Zul'jin to join the Horde under the promise that he would allow them to have Silvermoon. And Zul'jin agreed, and then promptly went about and united all of the forest trolls in what basically amounted to a montage. He went up to all the other troll leaders of the various tribes and challenged their leaders to whatever they thought they were good at, and he would just beat them. The trolls all respected whoever was the strongest, and Zul'jin was so confident that he was the strongest that he just let the other chieftains pick whichever contest of strength they wanted to do because he knew he would win them all. And he did. Zul'jin was kind of one of the best trolls out of all of them, and it's so sad this little piece of information is so not well known. Whenever I see other YouTubers make lore videos that happen to cover Zul'jin, I'm always kind of disappointed they don't mention this fact, because it's kind of an important event that really sells the strength of Zul'jin, and how he came to be the leader of the trolls during the Second War, because they were not united at all before he forced them all under his leadership. And an incredibly short amount of time too. He did all this in a span of less than a month, and they don't really talk about this in game or in any other wikis that have lore on Zul'jin. In fact, the only nod I see to this little fact, surprising enough, is in the scrapped Warcraft point-and-click adventure game Lord of the Clans, where Zul'jin appears as a flamboyant shopkeeper, and has this little dialogue when you ask him about himself. Tell me about yourself. Well, surely you have heard of the notorious Zul'jin? Well... It's true. I am Zul'jin, once the fiercest troll ever to flay an elf. It was I who single-handedly united the trolls and the orcs to wreak havoc and destruction upon the Alliance during the war. But alas, we withered in defeat. So, you wanna buy a garden gnome? And therein concludes this little segment from a major lore character. Zul'jin has a lot more story to him, which is covered in more detail by a few other YouTubers, although all of them leave out this little part because it's only mentioned in this one book and only kind of as a footnote in like one sentence. Which is a shame because it's kind of a really important detail. Next, we have the Death Metal Knight of the Dark Moon Fair. Located in the cave next to the Blighthead Metal fans in the Dark Moon Fair, an NPC named Death Metal Knight will spawn during the performance of the Blight Boar Band, who performs once an hour on the half hour in order to interrupt their performance. He has his own little unique soundtrack that plays while you fight him, as well as a lot of other things in the room moving around in tandem to the little performance, as it's basically a mini raid boss. There's some achievements associated to the mini boss, and he even drops a couple of transmog items, and a toy called the Blight Boar Microphone, which when you use turns you into one of the members of the band and has you sing it into the microphone during its duration. All of this here is basically just a simple homage to death metal genre of music as it makes a lot of sense that the things crashing the party is a death knight, since death metal is very edgy and death related. And one of the achievements you can get is called Mosh Pit, another thing associated to concerts in general, although probably more associated to heavy metal concerts. And to end this off, we'll be going over the unknown WoW, looking at secret or hidden places throughout the game. And in this video, we'll be going over the hidden Scarlet Crusade transmog vendor. This is an NPC located in the Darkmoon Fair right next to the petting zoo. If you try to talk to her on your character normally, she won't actually do anything other than maybe give you some rude dialogue. If you want to unlock what she has, you need to be wearing the Tabard of the Scarlet Crusade, which has a 1% chance to drop from Armsmaster Harlan in the Scarlet Halls. If you are wearing the Tabard and then talk to her, 
she'll sell you a crop top tabard of the Scarlet Crusade for 25,000 gold. If you're a male wearer, she also offers an item called Ensemble Chain of the Scarlet Crusade for 10,000 gold. And if you're a plate wearer, she'll offer you Ensemble Scale of the Scarlet Crusade for 10,000 gold. Both of which give you a whole bunch of transmog options for Scarlet Crusade gear. Unfortunately, there are no extra rewards for cloth or leather wearers, which are the only two armor classes I have which own the tabard, so I have to go and farm it on a mail and plate wearer if I want to buy all the transmogs. Located in the Undercity, there's an NPC that walks around who used to offer quests before the Cataclysm, where he would just send you to a couple of different zones. Now, this character is dressed kind of like a butler, so it could be reasonable to expect that his name is a reference to Balthazar from Romeo and Juliet. You see, in the Undercity, the four bankers in the middle of the city have the last name of Montagu, which was the family name of Romeo in the famous Shakespearean play Romeo and Juliet. In the play, there was a butler named Balthazar, who was Romeo's personal manservant and his trusted friend, and was the person who informed Romeo of Juliet's death, which would kind of make sense why he's an undead in Undercity, along with all the other Montagues, as Romeo did not meet a happy end in that play. Although there could be other references in the Undercity that I'm missing. The Undercity is probably the city with the most amount of NPC references out of all of the major cities. So we'll probably be exploring more of Undercity as the series continues. And now, let's go over to the Lore Reader Tales. In today's segment, we'll be going over the story of Timolin the Accursed. Timolin was a human mage who was commissioned by the Scarlet Crusade to create weapons. As a mage, he was very devoted to defeating the undead, and had the idea of using their powers against them, something which was heavily frowned upon in the Scarlet Crusade where they're all crazy light users. So he went out and made a visit to Dire Maul and had a talk with Prince Tortheldrin about a way to maybe create a weapon that could channel their dark powers against them, and also to talk about fishing because apparently they were both big fans of Nat Pagel. Eventually, Timolin was able to get a really good handle on necromancy, and even created a dark crystal which was supposed to be a counterpart to the Ashbringer. Although he got found out by Aesilian, one of the high-ranking members of the Crusade, and then he was sent to be disposed of quietly by feeding him to a giant slime to get rid of any traces of his body. While he was being eaten alive by the slime, he was able to do two things. The first was create a phylactery in order to hold his soul, and the second was to hurl the Dark Crystal into a river so that someone could find it someday, maybe. Then, during the third Burning Legion invasion, the last wielder of the Ashbringer is able to talk to Timolin after finding his phylactery, and due to his help and some light fishing, is able to create a nice alternative skin for the Ashbringer after a lengthy quest chain. Now, the interesting thing about Timolin is he was part of a scrapped questline in Vanilla WoW, which should have maybe given the players the Ashbringer. Because in Vanilla WoW, the Ashbringer was data mined to be an obtainable legendary item for players, which was later changed to Thunder Fury in the game files using the exact same item ID number. And then they just converted the Ashbringer into the Corrupted Ashbringer, which was simply a drop from a boss at Naxxramas. Before patch 1.7, players were able to loot an item called Timbaland's Phylactery, which sometimes dropped from large vile slimes in the Western Plaguelands, which was a quest item that was bind on pickup, but didn't actually do anything. It was theorized that it was going to be involved with the Blackwing Lair Raid, as well as a whole bunch of other clues in the game, and then they eventually abandoned the idea for Thunder Fury, which is why Timbaland's phylactery never actually did anything. You see, in the Alteric Valley, it was possible to loot an item called Nat Piggle's Guide to Extreme Angolin, which only had the last page that read, and so that's where you'll find the legendary sword of the Scarlet High Lord, Ashbringer. Ain't it amazing what you run into in an ordinary day of fishing? Then later on in Dire Maul, you could find a trash item called a thoroughly red copy of Nat Pingle's Guide to Extreme Anglin, which seems to indicate that the Ashbringer was related to Dire Maul in some way, which came out right before Blackwing Lair. There was also the Shendalar Zealots that would state that Prince Tortheldrin knew the location of the Ashbringer because he read the book so many times by Nat Pingle, and that if someone were to defeat Nefarian, he might loosen his lips and then the Ashbringer could definitely be found. And yes, they did mention the Ashbringer by name, so there were some pretty convincing clues in the game. And of course, none of this happened in Vanilla WoW. Killing Nefarian did not yield anything if you went back to the Prince with his head. Not until Legion anyway, where he was involved in a quest chain to unlock the hidden skin, 
which played a heavy homage to all of the rumors. It would start out with getting both of the books, where you could then turn them into an NPC in the Paladin Order Hall, where she would then give you a complete copy of Nat Pangle's Guide to Extreme Angolin that would start the quest chain. It would require you to get the head of Nefarian and then bring it to the prince. He would then remark that someone else had already come to him many years ago with the completed book as well, also inquiring about the weapon. But since they did not have proof of Nefarian's demise, he didn't tell them anything. Although, he'll then tell the location of the two other NPCs depending on if you're Horde or Alliance. These two NPCs used to have dialogues of Vanillawau that led to more speculation about the Ashbringer, as they both talked about how a great human wizard was commissioned by the Scarlet Crusade to fashion weapons for them, and that he was killed by the Crusade while he was working on a remarkable weapon. They will then, through a series of steps, point you to the large vile slimes that might have Timolin and his phylactery, which is just a rare mob that you have to kill that drops the phylactery. Timolin will then come out and tell you to fish up the Shard of Darkness from the river. Afterwards, you go do a couple more easy quests and you get the artifact appearance. It was a very neat way for Blizzard to turn a whole bunch of speculations into canon, and solve a long-held mystery of who Timolin was. And now, for something you can obtain in-game. We have a secret little item from the Orgrimmar Horrific Visions. While running the Orgrimmar version of the Horrific Vision, if you enter the Barbershop, which is located right between the Valley of Spirits and the Valley of Wisdom, there will be a little mini-event where a goblin will jump out and cut all your hair off. The goblin will then just run off saying they don't want to do hair anymore, and then if you look over on the table, there will be a clickable box, which will then give you a toy item called Coif Curl's Close Shave Kit, which when used allows you to simulate the effects of just cutting off all of your hair. Now, it's not really recommended to grab this toy if you're trying to 5-mask the place or something, because it does cause you to lose a little bit of time, but it is located in a spot that you run past every time you try to complete all the objectives anyway so it's very easy to get in pretty much any other run. And to end off this video, we'll be going over the Unknown WoW, looking at a secret or hidden place throughout the game. This time, we have the Secret Airy. Located in an isolated mountain region, Pandaria, there is a subzone right above the Veiled Stairs called the Secret Airy, which I guess isn't so secret if it's literally called secret on the map. Now, the Secret Airy doesn't have any quests, vendors, achievements, pets, or any really any notable lore associated to it. It's just a tiny little village filled with falcon trainers, which can be tamed by hunters. And most of them don't even have NPC dialogue if you try to talk to them. All of them except for Hawkmaster Liu, who has dialogues that change depending on whether or not you've quested in the Town Long Steps and met his brother. If you speak to him on a character who hasn't, he'll just say, nice to meet you. I've been watching you. If you have done the quest, his dialogue will change to that of, Word reaches me you served with my brother in Town Long Steps. How is the young fellow? Did he ever tell you how he lost his eye? His brother is unique in that he has custom dialogues rather than the normal male Pandaren default voice, which Hawkmaster Liu shares, surprisingly enough. His brother, Hawkmaster Nurong, is a main NPC in quest giver you interact with, and even shows up in the Mistweaver artifact weapon scenario as the ranged DPS member of your party that you're supposed to keep alive. So, his brother shows up a handful of times in-game, but Hawkmaster Liu is just kind of there. And that's great. The entire place was definitely just added to be a secret location you could find if you decided to go out and explore the world. And World of Warcraft has a lot of places like these, but very few of them are an entire village that is also given its own name on the map. It's also quite difficult to get to it if you don't have a flying mount, as you have to go through a whole bunch of winding, narrow bridges in order to climb the mountain in order to get to the little village. And during the first patch of Mists of Pandaria, they added more named NPCs to the village in the form of the family with their pets inside this hut here. They didn't actually add any quests or a reason to come to this village or talk to these NPCs, it's just more flavor added to a secret location for no reason. It could be that they maybe planned for something to happen here and just abandoned it. Who knows, they could still use it in the future. But for now, it's just a secret little hidden place in the unknown side of WoW. Count Ungula is a Netheray NPC who was much larger than all the other Netherays in the area, and it holds the distinction of being one of the few NPCs in the game that has quotation marks in its name. And if you tame this pet as a hunter, you're not actually allowed to put those quotation marks in its name if you try to rename it back to Count Ungula. 
If you kill this NPC, it will drop a quest item called Ungula's Mandibles, which will then give you some more information about the NPC from a quest cover. Essentially, this nether raid developed a taste for living flesh and started devouring other creatures, and could even be found fighting bog lords in the area. And it's even said that he was a legend by the Spore Lynx, though the quest giver is very confused about the mandibles you give to her, and didn't actually think the nether ray existed, though she had heard about it. Now, this nether ray is pretty obvious reference to Count Dracula, a vampire from the 1897 gothic horror novel, Dracula, who is considered the model for modern vampires in works of fiction. So Count Ungula could be considered vampiric in nature, since it started eating other living creatures, and since it had a much bigger jawbone than normal, as a mandible is another word for the lower jaw. Although I'm not sure what Ungula is a reference to, and is most likely just its unique name. Now let's head over to the Lore Reader Tales, where we'll be going over the lore of some of the more unknown figures and minor characters from WoW's story. And today's story is about Brigitte Abendis. Abendis is one of the founding members of the Scarlet Crusade, and was even present when the Ashbringer was created in Old Hillsbred, as she helped to purify the crystal which became the core of the Ashbringer. When her father died in the Battle for Hearthglen, she was promoted to High General of the Scarlet Crusade after his death. In Wrath of the Lich King, during the Death Knight starting zone, players will run into Brigitte Bendis a handful of times, but never fight her. They just kind of spy on her leading the crusade, and are able to read through her journal. In her journal, she'll detail how she's been hearing whispers her whole life, and thinks that they come from the light, which makes her a very prolific light user and justifies her high spot in the crusade. As the Scarlet Crusade has always been an interesting piece of lore to me, since they are kind of the poster child for how the light in Warcraft is not always used by good people. The Scarlet Crusade are kind of crazy and fanatical, and kill normal, non-undead people all the time for either thinking they might be undead in disguise, or thinking they're not devoted enough to the light. The Death Knights never actually encounter her during the starting zone, and she eventually picks up and leaves and heads for Northrend in order to take the fight against the undead directly in the Lich King. And when she moves all of her men to Northrend, she renames them to the Scarlet Onslaught. And basically, all of the Scarlet Onslaught members you meet in Northrend are working for Brigitte de Bendis. Although during some questing in the Dragonblight, you'll be tasked with stealing her diary, which continues the journal from the Death Knight starting zone, where it goes on to say that due to the constant setbacks the Crusade face, she stopped hearing the light call to her as often, and basically had to rely on Admiral Baron Westwind, a former leader of the Scarlet Crusade who went missing in Northrend years prior during a failed campaign, and had miraculously found his way back to their camp. Although this ended up being a dreadlord in disguise, as you find out later on, the Scarlet Crusade has historically been ran by dreadlords, as they're kind of responsible for the crazy turn the Scarlet Crusade took in the first place. During one of the Horde quests in Dragonblight, players will be told to go and kill Brigitte Bendis and cut off her head. That way she can't be resurrected. And that's kind of where her story ends, just the objective of a quest chain in one of the leveling zones in Northrend. And she's not even the final part of that quest chain, as it's not finished until you fight Melganis in Northrend later on. Although, notable thing about Brigitte is that there was a popular Warcraft 3 custom campaign called Chasing the Dawn where you get to play as Brigitte Bendis in a Scarlet Crusade theme adventure, which takes place after the Frozen Throne and goes all the way up to Wrath of the Lich King. And now for this next segment, let's go over a useful NPC. Located in the Tearsgar Sound, we have an NPC which might have been overlooked by a lot of players when leveling, or maybe just Horde players. If you're in the level ranges of 110 to 120, and head over to this cave located right here on the map, there is an NPC named Totes, who drops a free 28 slot bag if you kill him, which is an excellent mob to go on new characters so you don't have to waste a whole bunch of money on one of your bag slots, as generally, new players need to buy a lot of bags to both fill up their four extra bag slots that they carry around with them everywhere, and the multiple that are required in order to fill up your bank. Although, just a little warning, Horde players have a much harder time grabbing this one before 120, as all of the mobs in the area will be level 120, 
and only scale down if you're Alliance. And the bag drop is called Goat's Tote, which makes this whole little sequence an obvious reference to the slang term, totes my goat, which according to Urban Dictionary is just an awkward way to say totally when trying to act cool. And also, tote can be another word for a type of bag. So a goat dropping the tote is just Blizzard having fun with their naming conventions and references, which they do all the time as you'll probably find out as I make more of these videos. And to end off this episode of the Unknown Side of WoW, we'll be looking at secret or hidden places throughout the game. Starting off with the hidden shipwreck in the Twisting Nether. Off the coast of the Nether Storm, there's a floating rock that has a shipwreck on it near a destroyed Alliance base. It's pretty obvious to assume that this was probably docked at a past port before the planet got destroyed by Ner'zhul in Warcraft 2. But unfortunately, whoever was on the boat probably got stranded a hundred feet away from the city. So, unless they had a way to fly, there wasn't really a way for them to get back to shore. There isn't very much lore or any quest associated to this place, and you have to fly out quite a bit in order to actually get to the boat. So, most of the information I have is based on conjecture from context clues. There is nothing inside the boat, but there is an anchor hanging off the side of the giant floating rock, with a couple of other floating rocks flying by since it's located right above the Twisty Nether. Since there's no corpse or skeletons nearby, all of the previous occupants probably found a way to fly to the nearby city. Maybe hitched a ride on one of the giant floating rocks nearby. Or the more grim interpretation, where they probably just fell into the nether. In WoW's earliest alpha, it was possible to kill AFK players by placing a campfire under their feet, which would slowly kill them due to fire damage. So they then changed it so player created fire could do no damage. Early plans for quests included having cross-continental journey quests at around level 40, since they thought people would want to explore with their new mounts and go to far off places, since back in Vanilla WoW you got your first mount at level 40. But that ended up being a terrible idea, as all that travel time was just downtime, so they cut them to smaller areas, and only left a few massive journey quests in the game like the Call of Water quest for Shaman's Water Totems, for example. The Dwarven Airfield was made to just have something neat to look at while on a flight path. Apparently, Blizzard put a lot of things like this in the game for the sole purpose of just adding flavor to flight paths, since flight paths were a new thing to MMOs at the time, leaving long time speculation about why the airfield was up in a hidden area, and if Blizzard maybe scrapped it because they ran out of time to finish it, to rest. Turns out, it was just there for funsies, because someone thought it might look neat. When thinking of what to do for the vanilla cinematic, Chris Metzen really wanted to do a feature showing the titans creating the world, which was shot down to instead focus on the various races and classes of the game. The first expansion was going to be the South Seas, with pirates and stuff, because that's also when the Pirates of the Caribbean movies came out for the first time and were super popular. The main reason they went to Outlands instead was because they needed another world tap, because they literally couldn't add more zones to the world map, until later on when they got server upgrades. And we didn't actually get the South Seas expansion until 2018, with the Battle for Azeroth. Player housing was on the table since pretty much the beginning of WoW's development, all the way until launch and probably for some time after. But some of the reasons they decided not to have it in vanilla WoW was because they thought it was too much time and effort for something that wasn't really important, and because they thought it was a dead-end system, and they couldn't find a way to make it fun. Whatever that means. But there is also confirmation that the unused portal in Stormwind, from pre cata WoW, was indeed supposed to take you to your player housing. There were three additional planned races for Vanilla WoW, with Naga, Goblins, and Demons being cut from the game. Naga because there was too many problems with them when it came to armor, as pants and boots wouldn't work with their snake-like tails, and sitting them on mounts was a challenge. Demons were supposed to be shapeshifters, but that would require too much work to implement, so it was easier to just cut them out of the game. And goblins were cut because they wanted the starting zone to be amazing and have all kinds of machines and gizmos, 
but they wouldn't be able to reuse all that they had planned. So it would be too much work to have all of those things created for just one zone. So they were put on hold until Cataclysm instead. Ogres were also considered for a playable race for a short time, but no one could think of a good model for female ogres. So instead of solving that problem, it was just dropped. Plus, the Horde already had Torin as a big race, and they didn't want to give them two of them, as ogres have historically been part of the Horde. Alteric Valley was the first battleground Blizzard worked on, but it wasn't ready in time for launch, so it was pushed back into a later patch and released alongside Warsan Gulch. Achievements were planned to be part of Vanilla WoW, but were put on hold alongside PvP, hero classes, multi-classes, guild raid content, and player housing. As PvP wasn't balanced for WoW's launch, it was considered put on hold, along with any kind of reward systems for PvP, which weren't added until later patches. Hero classes were tried with Death Knights and quickly abandoned for being too overpowered. Multi-classes never happened, alongside guild raids and player housing. When putting fishing into the game, they were nervous that hackers could use it to disrupt the economy, as it was the only activity in the game which gave rewards that could be performed without risk. That's why they also added the little mini-game of clicking the bobber when you caught something, in order to make it harder for hackers to automate. Deadmines was one of the first playable dungeons, and the devs liked it enough to use it as a benchmark for how long other dungeons should be, and that high-level dungeons should be longer than it. Blizzard made sure their high-level dungeons were the biggest. That's why in future versions of the game, they cut those old high-level dungeons into parts when putting them into the LFG tool, as they were too big. After the launch of the game, players liked the small, quick dungeons the best, like the different wings of the Scarlet Monastery. And that's why Blizzard went with the quicker, smaller dungeons as the game progressed, instead of continuing with the large, complex, exploratory dungeons that they used to have. When it came to raids, they were told to make them even bigger than the already big high-level dungeons. So after working on Karazhan, one of the first raids worked on despite not being released until the Burning Crusade, they made it too big and had to cut back on it a lot. And that's probably why the Karazhan crypts were never made use of. The book doesn't specify the crypts by name, but it does say they had to completely cut the wine cellars and the undead catacombs part of Karazhan. Late in WoW's development, the talent trees were added as a fun way to gain power as you leveled up. Before, they had a system that allowed you to spend points into various stats, but no matter what they did to make fun, alternative stats, people would always just spend all of their points into the best ones. So warriors would only put points into strength, and mages only into intellect, which ended up not being very fun. So they were scrapped, and the talent trees were added instead. And that's probably why so many specs were useless in Vanilla WoW. They were more or less leveling up rewards, not really balanced around endgame content, and didn't receive major overhauls until almost halfway through Vanilla when they decided to address one class at a time each patch. The Plaguelands and Silithus were the last two zones worked on that made it into the game, which might explain why Silithus was empty at launch. The last zone being worked on before Vanilla WoW launched was the Emerald Dream, which was eventually just scrapped as they weren't happy with how it turned out. They wanted it to be this dreamlike place where anything could happen, but it ended up just looking kind of goofy and really green, so they abandoned the idea as it was too hard to realize. The Emerald Dream was never actually added as a zone at all, despite its major lore relevance, but it did make it into the game in other ways, as part of it can be entered in the Emerald Nightmare and the Druid Order Hall. The death effects of the world going all gray and spooky were added after the dev team saw the Lord of the Rings movie and liked how the effect was used in the movie. Vehicles were planned to be a feature in vanilla PvP, but they couldn't figure out a way to make it work. Vehicle combat didn't make it into the game until Wrath, when it was used for three battlegrounds, and then never used in a battleground afterwards, since people didn't actually like vehicle combat very much. The Horde snuff was worked on last, so it didn't receive anywhere near as much polish as the Alliance zones, and even had less content in some areas. 
On screen, you can see a copy I made of one of the earliest maps of Azeroth made, because the image in the book was really low quality and hard to see, while still in the planning stages of WoW before anything else was made. The first biggest thing that stands out is the giant continent of Ulduar below a quarter-sized Kalimdor. Ulduar was eventually turned into a raid in Northrend during Wrath of the Lich King, and is located at this point on the map. But it seems like Blizzard might have had some much bigger plans for it. Kalimdor was also about one-fourth the size in this version than it was in the final map, but then again, Ulduar was down there taking up all its space, so that makes sense. Najjatar, the Naga homeworld, was in the middle of the map instead of the Maelstrom, which was oddly off to the side in between the Undermine and Tomb of Sargeras. The Undermine is the name of the underground city below the Goblin starting zone of Kazan. And finally, Kulturas was a much smaller island nation in the bay between Azeroth and Lordaeron, as Kulturas has always been an important island in lore even though we didn't actually go there until very recently in-game. And of course, the Eastern Kingdoms was known as Azeroth before it was changed to the name of the whole planet, but everyone already knew that. The Molten Core Raid was created really late in development as kind of an afterthought. One day, they asked the dungeon designer if he could make a quick raid, as simple as possible, because they needed it ASAP, and players, sadly, didn't really care about how it would look. They just needed a big cave. So Molten Core was created in one week, the fastest of any dungeon or raid in the game, and players universally loved it and its design. In fact, Molten Core was also the smallest dungeon file, one-fourth the size of the second smallest dungeon, despite being a raid. When testing Molten Core with a raid of devs, they couldn't get past the trash without wiping multiple times. It's not that the trash was overtuned or anything, it's just everyone was really bad. So Molten Core was the first and last raid tested in-house by developers. Also, as a side note, while they were testing Molten Core, they used player-created DPS meter add-ons to measure their combat numbers, rather than make one of their own. When Blizzard was deciding on an MMO to make, they debated on whether or not to make it a fantasy one or sci-fi. They eventually decided on fantasy because it was more relatable. Sci-fi is full of gadgets and weapons that the average person has probably never heard of, while fantasy has swords and magic, very simple, familiar concepts even children know about. Also, you can be more in your face with sword combat than firearms and lasers. So since they decided on fantasy, they just picked the story of Warcraft to incorporate into since they already had the two Warcraft games and Warcraft 3 in late development. Player housing was on the table since the very beginning. The devs were playing the new Animal Crossing game at the time and liked its day and night cycle, and how you had to wait for your fruit to grow and mail to arrive, which made them think about how they could incorporate this with player housing. Eventually though, the only part of that to make it into the game was the real-time day and night cycle. There was even a marker for the day-night cycle on the mini-map where the calendar is at today since Vanilla WoW didn't have an in-game calendar. After creating the procedurally generated clouds, the team got to work on procedurally generated water, because they had plans for players to be able to play Naga as a playable race. And if they were going to have an aquatic race, they needed good water effects. Eventually though, they found out procedurally generated water took up too much space and wasn't worth it, as they really pushed hard for WoW to be workable on low-end computers which contributed heavily to its massive success. And later on, when working on armor, they dropped the Naga for good, once they found out how difficult it would be to get armor to work for the snake-like race. Ghouls were the dev team's favorite test monsters, because it was the first one to have all of its animations programmed and fully animated. So when they first added spells to the game, ghouls were used to test them out, and they even had ghouls cast Blizzard on aggroed players as kind of a joke for a bit. Some of the first ever dungeons made in an unfinished state were the Deadmines, Oldemon, Karazhan, and Tolbarad. Deadmines and Oldemon did make it into vanilla, but Karazhan wasn't added to the game until the Burning Crusade, and Tolbarad wasn't added until Cataclysm. These four initial dungeons were eventually scrapped and remade, 
when they moved over to a new dungeon editor, but it goes to show how early some of the later additions to WoW were being planned. The first working name for Undercity was Necropolis. Remember, early brainstorming of WoW was done before Warcraft 3 was finished. Also, the internal team called the Forsaken the Scourge for the longest time, despite Chris Metzen telling them the difference and why they should be called Forsaken and not Scourge. The Scourge was the minion still controlled by the Lich King and his forces, and the Forsaken were former Scourge members who broke free and worked under Sylvanas. Which to the dev team was basically the same thing, and again, this was because Warcraft 3 wasn't out yet so they hadn't played through Sylvanas' campaign yet to find out what the big deal was. Which I thought was just kind of funny. Even later on in the development cycle, most dev team members still called them the Scourge because they thought it might be fun to play as an evil race, and tried to even convince Kritz Metzen of this, to no success. Or to major success, depending on if you're an Alliance main or not. Early plans for classes included two classes not in the game, called Assassins and Rune Masters. Assassins were eventually just turned into rogues, and Rune Masters were supposed to be like enchanters who wrote runes on their bodies to give them different physical powers, and were even considered when making the first hero class alongside Death Knights or Necromancers. Eventually, though, a lot of the features of the Rune Master were given to the Death Knight and Monk. And in place of Rune Masters, they put in Druids, who were actually not on the original list of classes to be added. The Dark Portal didn't have a static location, despite its major lore relevance, so it was constantly moving locations in WoW development, at one point being next to Teldrassil, and another moment being located underwater in Ajara because they thought it would be cool to have it submerged in water, before finally being settled down in the Blasted Lands. And just a note, this piece of trivia actually solves a lot of long-held speculation about the Dark Portal in Alpha and Beta clients. You see, there are models of the Dark Portal in lots of random places in the world on the Alpha clients as well, and people always speculated that they were just used as placeholders for raids, dungeons, or battleground entrances, with the one off the coast of Ajara drawing the most amounts of speculation, as there was never anything added to that zone. But there was a scrapped battleground for the zone, so people just assumed it was for that, or a planned Naga raid. But it turns out, nope. The Dark Portals were literally placed there because that's where Blizzard thought they might want the Dark Portal to be for a short time. Leaving a long time mystery finally solved. Sometimes it's the simplest explanations that turn out to be the true ones. WoW's original design idea with quests was just to have enough to send you to other parts of the zone to explore it fully, until eventually you'd just grind mobs until you were high enough level to leave to the next zone. Most early MMO games required lots of mob grinding, so WoW wasn't going to be any different. But in testing, players were going into other zones too early after finishing all their quests and were dying to the high level mobs. So Blizzard added in more quests to the zone than normal and thus, accidentally created engaging solo content, which was a big part of WoW's early success. So, in an effort to solve a navigation problem of people leaving zones too early, Blizzard by accident created its main selling point against other MMOs at the time, being able to quest to max level, instead of requiring a mob grind. Although, there was still mob grinding in vanilla WoW I might want to point out, it's just, if you were smart about your leveling path, you didn't really need to. It took a day and a half on average to create an attack animation for one race and gender. So, for example, after making all 60 attack animations for an orc male, they'd then move on to all 60 animations for an orc female. Which means it took an incredibly long time to add all of the animations to the game. Northshire Abbey was the first piece of detailed architecture added to the game, outside of the default house models. In fact, all of the first buildings and zones were Alliance ones. They pretty much had Stormwind done and finished before working on Kalimdor, but that was mainly because they wanted to have a working piece to show off at conventions, so it made more sense to have a few zones close together done. So they worked on the first four human zones first. 
While discussing basic game concepts like PvP, spell structure, and item properties, they also had a thing called life quests planned, which were supposed to be character campaigns, probably similar to the Order Hall campaigns of Legion. What a life quest could have been is all up for speculation, but I'd assume it would be similar to what class quests were like, but for racial abilities for your character, or even things needed to maybe unlock player housing. When the game Anarchy Online came out, a lot of the dev team loved the procedurally created dungeons, and wanted to have them in WoW too. Thankfully, they decided against this idea ultimately for a few reasons. One being it was too much work and might overload people's PCs, and dungeons were some of the hardest things to program. And two, because they thought handcrafted dungeons would feel better, which I think was a good call. Goblins were another race planned for Vanilla WoW at around the same time they started working on the trolls and gnomes, but they held off on making them because the bandwidth for all the machines and gizmos was too high, and they wanted to make the goblin starting zone amazing. The reason most dungeons had a whole bunch of trash mobs and traveling in front of them before you could get to the instance was because it was meant for people who were looking for a group to kill those mobs while they waited for a party to form. That way, they had something to do and could get a bit of mob grinding done while waiting, as this was common practice in EverQuest. That's why if you try to run to the entrance of Wailing Caverns, there's a little maze and tunnel system full of mobs in front of it. 